including education, infrastructure, and jobs. Third, we will consider H.R. 7027 and H.R. 7327, bills to make child care more accessible and affordable. Child care capacity uh, was well below our nation's needs even before COVID-19, but this pandemic has uh, brought many more child care providers to the brink, reduced capacity and forced closures. Essential workers who are making tremendous sacrifices right now cannot wait for us to do something. Uh, and more workers cannot return to their jobs in the future, and our economy cannot fully reopen unless families are able to access safe, affordable child care. We will hear from uh, the committees first on these measures uh, before hearing uh, amendment testimony on these bills. But first, uh, let me turn to our distinguished ranking member, Mr. Cole, uh, for any comments that he wishes to make. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, the biggest item on our agenda today is H.R. 6395, the National Defense Authorization Act for fiscal year 2021. The NDAA is one of the single most important pieces of legislation Congress must produce each year. It provides funding for our military, redirects our resources to our most pressing defense needs, and ensures that the security of the United States remains paramount. I want to direct special commendation to Chairman Adam Smith and to Ranking Member Max Thornberry to achieve the truly bipartisan package in this year's NDAA. Uh, I think my good friend Ranking Member Thornberry said it best when he said that this is not the beginning of the Congress. This is particularly necessary when we are considering bills like these two. One bill appropriates over $50 billion without any spending offset, and the other appropriates $11 billion and make significant changes to the tax code, again, without including spending offsets. Uh, when we're spending this kind of money and making such significant changes to our tax policy, the least we can do is spend time in committee actually considering these bills and allowing members an opportunity to make real changes. We owe the American people that much. With that, uh, Mr. Chairman, I look forward to our hearing today, and I yield back to you. Uh, I thank the ranking member for his comments and uh, uh, appreciate uh, all that he contributes to the committee. Uh, I would now like to call up our next panel uh, to testify on a Senate amendment to H.R. 1957, the Great American Outdoors Act. Chairman Grijalva and ranking member Bishop, and ranking member Bishop we are delighted that you are here. Without objection, uh, any written material you submit to, let me uh, Make sure that other than the witnesses, everybody should be muted. Yeah. Okay. Um, we're delighted that you're here. Without objection, any written materials you submit to rules documents at mail.house.gov before the conclusion of the hearing will be entered into the record. Um, so at this point, let me recognize the gentleman from Arizona, Chairman Grahal. Thank you. Uh Chairman McGovern and Ranking Member Cole and members of the Rules Committee, and thank you for the opportunity to uh, appear before you today in support of a rule for the Senate Amendment HR, uh, Senate Amendment to HR. Well, that was the fastest opening statement that I've heard. Um, so I, uh, the great American, I, I, I don't know, we I lost the his willingness to take up this important piece of legislation and other occurrence in this Congress. At last Mr. Chapter, Mr. identical and legislation Sorry. sponsored by uh, Joe Cunningham. Yes. Mr. Grijalva, please, Mr. Grijalva, please pause. I did. Okay, thank you. All right, I think we're back. Okay, try it again. Start over? Yeah. Well, you can, you can, you, you can skip the niceties and just get to the meat of the uh, of the statement. Okay, All this right. bill passed the Senate by a bipartisan vote of seventy three to twenty five, and an unfortunate rare occurrence is one of those un unfortunately a rare occurrence in this Congress. At last check, the identical House companion legislation sponsored by Joe Cunningham had two hundred twenty six bipartisan co sponsors, including every Democrat on this committee. Therefore, I humbly ask that this committee construct a rule that allows consideration of the Senate passed bill without amendment to ensure that we send this important piece of legislation to the president's desk to receive his signature. I would, I would suggest to my uh, colleagues that given the extensive process on this proposal in both the House and the Senate over many years and, and the administration's public support, 
uh, further opportunities to amend this legislation are not necessary. The Great American Outdoors Act combines two proposals that have already been taken up and passed by the Natural Resources Committee, full and permanent funding for the Land and Water Conservation Fund and Restore Our Parks and Public Lands Act sponsored by Ranking Member Bishop. Both proposals received significant bipartisan support across the House, each receiving co-sponsorships by the majority of members. Combined, these bills will deliver a major and lasting win for conservation in the United States. By establishing a fund to collect up to $1.9 billion annually for five years, H.R. 1957 will ensure that we provide a needed injection of capital to support aging infrastructure in our national parks and in our public lands. For too long, public lands and national parks in particular have suffered from significant uh, funding shortfalls. We need to reinvest in these treasured places while making sure that we provide sustainable funding going forward. Full and permanent funding for LWCF is a goal that I have been working for my entire tenure in this body, along with many, many members. Since 1965, LWCF has provided funding to protect important places and to ensure access to outdoor recreation opportunities for all Americans. Unfortunately, Congress has rarely met the full promise of this program, only twice providing it with fu fully, fully authorized funding levels. The money has been flowing into the fund, but more than half of it has been diverted by previous Congresses for other uses. H.R. 1957 would ensure that LWCF will receive its full $900 million every year so that these dollars can be directed to projects on the ground. During a time of increasing climate uncertainty, and as we continue to lose our natural resources across the United States at the rate of a football field every 30 seconds, investing in land and water conservation is a priority uh, that the administration, I, and I can agree on. The administration has called for swift action on the measures, so I hope we, we will see a bipartisan vote to move this bill forward. To be clear, this legislation requires that Congress still decides where these dollars go and includes reporting requirements that ensure accountability. The legislation is a commitment to American values. It is a commitment to protecting uh, those most important places and ensuring they are accessible to all. Uh, it's past time to get this bill signed into law, and I hope we can work together to do so. And I thank you, and I look forward to answering any questions, uh, Mr. Chairman, that you and the committee might have. I yield back. Uh, thank you very much, and I now yield to Ranking Member Bishop. Thank you, and I want Ralph to know that that was the best opening statement to the entire until they got the same chair. So continue that process going forward, Ralph. But this is not about the land and water conservation plan. Last year, we permanently. All right. One more time. This is not about the land and water conservation plan because we permanently mandated and authorized that last year. This is simply two different bills that are being cobbled together. The first one was the old HR 2020 1225, which had 330 co sponsors. And that was to deal with the backlog maintenance on public lands, which is now approaching $20 billion. The second one, though, is dealing with basically Senate 1801, which is about mandatory spending to buy more land, which would mandatory put it up to $900 million, basically a billion dollars a year to buy more property to add to the maintenance backlog. Now, those are the two portions of this particular bill that's coming to us. Now, for those of you who usually sit on that side, if you really do truly think that after spending trillions of dollars on coronavirus, probably justifiably, that the right policy decision is then to have mandatory spending for a billion dollars a year from now through eternity to buy more land, and that's the appropriate policy decision, you're in the wrong party. And to the rest of them who usually sit over here, the rules that you established before we ever started was that if you're going to have a bill, there would be some kind of offset that was necessary for that particular bill. A new program, you would find a way to pay for it, whatever you want to call it, pay go, whatever it was. This is the, in fact, 
in fact, uh, 1225 was held up for a long time because we needed to find a PAYGO system to offset that. CBO has said that this program, this bill, will cost $17 billion. There is no offset. The Senate doesn't need to find an offset, but you, at least traditionally, according to your rules and in the, the spirit of the law, have always said you would find an offset. To send this bill, the Senate version, to the floor for final passage without finding that offset is a violation of the process that you thought you wanted to do or said you wanted to do. And that's something that if, if you feel good, if, if mandatory spending is the right thing to do to buy more land, uh, then I guess you can break the concept and break the process that you've always had here. But if there is a better way of doing something, like allowing the legislature or Congress to work its will year after year in the appropriations process, then perhaps we should look at this. Now, the other problem is, and I have been told that this bill, if passed, would create 100,000 new jobs and would help solve the maintenance backlog on our public lands, not just parks, but BLM lands and Forest Service lands as well. We have been told that for coronavirus, our parks have been inundated with visitors who are coming there. Not quite true. Most of the people who are going are actually going to state and local parks and local areas that also need money, but that is already in the status quo. This bill doesn't change that. That revenue, that revenue access still will stay there. What does change though, is what may happen to the federal funding for both of these programs. All of these programs are based on energy production royalty coming into the government. That's why there's a CBO score to it. The, the park portion, the maintenance portion, was to say, after you take over what our obligations are, if there is excess royalties above and beyond our obligations, the first billion of that excess royalties goes to pay for the maintenance backlog. Problem is, this year, you have an 85% reduction in what's coming on in energy royalties. In the Gulf, there is 200 million barrels a day less now than there was before. So to be able to come up with that excess royalties is problematic. There was a time back in the last recession in which indeed we did not get a billion dollars in excess royalties that could pay for the backlog. And if you don't have that excess, this law as well as everything else says you don't have money to pay for the backlog, the maintenance, which is why we're selling this thing. Now you compounded it. Because remember, the second part is that mandatory billion dollars a year to buy more land. That now has to take precedence over the maintenance backlog. So if indeed you now have a lowering in, in royalties coming in, you now have another billion dollars that takes precedence. The idea that you might be able to find that excess royalties to solve the problems of maintaining, maintaining our public lands is questionable, if at best. But what is not questionable is you put in front of that a billion dollars a year to buy more land to increase the maintenance backlog that the federal government has to have. It's almost like a drug addict and you're giving you free stuff here. What we are dealing with today is, is a bill that actually will create more debt, but doesn't have the economic benefit that it is supposed to have had. Third thing I want you to be careful about is there was a conforming amendment put in the Senate. In the good old days, you would have called it an earmark. It came from the Senate, not the White House, as has been suggested. But what that does is siphon billions of dollars from Eastern states in money that could go to recreation opportunities. The 100th Meridian, the law said 15% of that Forest Service property you buy up can take place west of that 100th Meridian. The other 85% has to come east of it. It was put in there specifically in the 1960s to guarantee, because most of the land is in the West, to guarantee there would be money for Eastern states to have money to produce their local needs for recreational opportunity. In an earlier iteration I tried to do before we, we actually uh, uh, permanently mandated, uh, permanently authorized LWCF, I wanted specific percentage to have to go to urban recreational needs. That's what that 85% was supposed to do. That was taken off in this conforming amendment so that more money could be spent in the West than in the East. You add up what that will mean is for those states, and those of you who represent states that are basically east of Denver, you will lose over the next decade approximately $1.19 billion. That comes up to $32 million a state if you add it out that will be siphoned from you. So in Mr. McGovern's state, for example, you have 3 billion. 3 million acres of private forest land in your state. 
you have a quarter of a million acres of state and local forest land, you have zero forest service, federal forest service land. In Colorado, you got 14 million acres of federal forest. My state, you got 8 million acres of it. Others, you have zero. That is a disparity. So if you're going to go home and tout yourself as being a great environmentalist and having helped your citizens, you have to be prepared to tout them also why you are willing to take $32 million away from what could have been used for their recreation purposes so that you could have this conforming amendment that happens to be in there now. I have two amendments and I'm not going to play around with this because even though you don't want to amend this bill, you can if you would like to. There are ways of doing it. But there are two simple ones I'll tell you. The first one is to just re take that conforming amendment out so you don't have the money siphoned off from the eastern states, what could have been and should have been their portion of it. And the second one simply says that if indeed you come to that situation in which you are not creating enough excess revenues to actually fund the maintenance backlog that is our obligation on public lands, you suspend the buying of new land and put that money into the maintenance. That's what we should be doing. That's the right thing. That's the intention of it. But the way this bill is written, it's not going to happen. This is the not so great uh, American Outdoors Act because it has some real fatal flaws that should be and could be fixed, could easily be fixed and ought to be fixed. But also it comes back to that bottom line is is mandatory spending to buy more land is that the appropriate role for congress is that the kinds of legislation that you really want to have as a legacy uh, i said at one time if, if you actually vote for this you should have a line in your next political flyer saying i give lip service to fiscal responsibility unless i can buy special interest votes for something are you done okay uh, thank you very much to both of you, and um, I, I think this is a great bill, and um, I'm eager to get it passed and get the president to sign it. Uh, and uh, it's, it's I, I, and I, again, I, it passed the Senate, and if we begin to amend this bill, the reality is it goes back to the Senate, and we will probably, uh, we don't have any guarantee that they'll even take it up uh, before the end of the year. So I think it is important if you care about the Land and Water Conservation Fund, which I do, uh, if you care about the environment, which I do, um, and uh, a lot of my constituents do, uh, we, we get this bill uh, passed and get it on the president's desk to, so he can affix his signature to it. Uh, Mr. Cole. Sorry, Mr. Chairman, I took a chance, uh, minute to get unmuted. I uh, really don't have any questions for either of uh, our, our distinguished chairman and ranking member, other than just to note that this uh, uh, maybe Mr. Bishop's last appearance up here, and he's a, an alum of this, a distinguished alum of this very committee, and uh, always enjoy having him here. The, I think he made some very important points long term about uh, the fiscal uh, challenges, and I hope we can deal with that going forward in another way. But I reluctantly uh, come to the conclusion that if we're ever going to get this thing done and authorized, this is probably the vehicle to actually do it in. It doesn't mean that Mr. Bishop isn't raising important points because I agree with him particularly about uh, the automatic acquisition of land. I think that's an excellent point and something we ought to work on going forward. But uh, it's tough to get much done in uh, in Congress these days when you have an opportunity this close uh, to an election to actually get something through. I think uh, in this case, it probably needs to be taken. But with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Uh, thank you. Um, I, I don't see Mr. Hastings here. Is uh, Ms. Ms. Torres, um, Mr. Perlmutter. Um, thanks, and I appreciate the testimony, and uh, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Woodall. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I rarely find myself to the right of, of Rob Bishop, but I find myself there today. Uh, Mr. Bishop, I thought I understood you to say that while it's uh, outrageous that we would be creating new mandatory spending in a time where every dollar needs to be looked at uh, every single year, that you would be amenable to the president signing this bill if we still created the mandatory spending uh, uh, pot, but said in those years where our energy revenues fell short, that money went mandatorily to maintenance needs instead of land purchasing needs. Did I understand that uh, uh, middle ground that you were, were uh, asserting properly? Uh, halfway, that's because you have the mass over your face. Uh, 
So the, the bottom line. Uh, here, back here, here. The, the bottom line is. It's on mute, Rob. You may still be muted, uh, Rob. No, I'm my, my screen tells me you've been silenced. There, okay. I'm, I'm now unmuted. Uh, look, having mandatory spending for anything that, that goes above and beyond what the Appropriations Committee is supposed to do and has always done and done fairly on this program is a bad policy. But if you're going to pass it anyway, the minimum, the minimum you can do, because it's you're basing this, everyone is pay, saying that this is a great thing because it's going to do the backlog maintenance. And what I'm telling you is when you added that other element to it, you screwed up the backlog maintenance. And at the minimum, if you're going to do it, then at least say, if we don't have the money necessary for the maintenance, don't buy more land until you do. That's the minimum that you should do. Is that a good policy? No. The best policy is to let Congress have control over what Congress should be doing and not have mandatory. You all know that the problems we have in the budget in this country is because of mandatory spending demands. Adding more mandatory spending for something like buying land is is a bad policy. Period. You have to unmute. Th thank you, Mr. Chairman. I always value your your uh, your constructive counsel. I. I have some constructive counsel as, as well. I'm a supporter of the Land and Water Conservation Fund. Uh, I'm a supporter of the maintenance uh, needs. And Chairman Grijalva, I've got to I've got to tell you what Mr. Bishop is saying uh, makes a lot of sense to me. Why in the world, uh, after we've had 330 of our colleagues uh, get on board to to solve our maintenance backlog issues, why in the world, in a year like this one, are we going to allow our maintenance needs to continue to stack up as energy revenues don't cover those additional costs and yet put more money out the door to buy more assets that are going to require more maintenance with dollars that we already don't have. Why, why can't we do uh, what Mr. Bishop is saying? I, I, don't, I, I, I don't know what the downside is of prioritizing the maintenance needs that we all agree on. Uh, when there is a shortfall and then expanding the purchasing uh, uh, opportunities uh, when there's a, a surplus. And if you would uh, unmute for me, Mr. Chairman, I would I would love to, to be educated. Thank you. Uh, you know, uh, these bills rely on existing revenue. And, and as has been stated, uh the, the fluctuation of that uh, of that revenue from gas and oil uh is is, is a constant and, and, and particularly now but uh but the, the fact remains that uh you know i trust that the day comes when future congresses can be trusted to ensure our continued commitment toward protecting these lands waters and parks and, and ensuring that they're uh reliable assets for the american people and in terms of uh of uh, the how the federal dollars are spent uh it's you know the the bill clearly provides appropriators the opportunity to decide which projects are funded and at what level they still run the process they still receive reports on projects then there are clear standards for accountability the, the bill i merely ensures that these dollars will be available to meet the overwhelming need of conservation and the maintenance on the ground so uh, Congress is still involved in this. Decisions are still made by uh, and recommendations by appropriators. I I, I think that uh, you know the issue of uh, eastern states will not be receiving uh, uh, what they should. What they should. Uh, it, that's been a red herring by opponents uh, of, of the Land and Water Conservation Fund for a long time. First of all, this restriction only ever applied to the Forest Service. And land acquisitions are a small percentage of land and water conservation expenditures uh, historically. Secondly, Congress controls the land and water conservation funding, as I said, and bipartisan Congresses have historically voted to ignore uh, restrictions. Eastern states will receive significant benefits from increasing uh, LWCF funds, especially given that the bill will be more than double funding for any given available year. So, uh, I, I think that 
Look, the issue here is potency and, 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 and a committed revenue stream for land and water and, and the initial commitment to, uh, to dealing with our, our backlog. It, and it's not the backlog, in, it, it has been from underfunding and lack of attention to those major uh, uh, needs in our public parks. And uh, uh, this is a step toward, toward correcting that, but I think Congress will still have work to do uh, on its own. Uh, to shore up uh, that and uh, hopefully the uh, transportation bill, uh, moving forward bill will will address some of those needs. So I think you know, there's work ahead, but this is not a doomsday uh, issue that will uh, uh, cripple the ability to, for us to take care of our parks. Oh, and more importantly, uh, it's, it's not robbing Peter to pay Paul. Well, I, I appreciate uh, that, and it, uh, it strikes me that Mr. Bishop may have struck a nerve because that was a that was a, an excellent response to, to his statement. But my question was, what? Why is it that we're? Mr. Bishop passed the mute. There, we're sorting out our issues here in the committee room, Mr. Chair. But without your leadership right here close by, it's it's hard to it's hard to be successful. I, I, uh, I, miss, I miss you too. <laughs> <laughs> the, Mr. Uh, Chairman Grijalva, you said that our, our maintenance backlog was a result of, of underfunding, and I, I recognize that to, to be true. But my question was, it appears that where we are right here, right now, if the president puts his signature on this bill tomorrow, is that I'm not going to get one additional penny for the maintenance backlog but I'm going to get a billion dollars to buy more land to create more of a maintenance backlog. If I'm correct that that's the way this language reads today, my only question is, if we're going to create a mandatory stream of funding, why wouldn't we say, since we all agree the maintenance backlog is important, in those years, where the maintenance backlog is underfunded due to a lack of energy revenues, rather than using a mandatory stream of funding to purchase new maintenance problems, we're going to use that money to solve old maintenance problems. Why, why isn't that the responsible thing to do? I, I think the responsible thing to do is to, is to realize that we have allowed the land and water conservation uh, authorization to lapse twice that the revenue dedicated to it and less less than half of it has has, has gone to the fund itself and that the, the land and water conservation fund has has been uh, uh has been essential and and that includes republican democrats across this country every county in this in this nation of ours has received support from the land and water conservation fund and it is not simply about land acquisition it is also about uh urban parks access to trails uh, and, and bringing communities uh, uh, the kind of outdoor and recreational uh, support that they need. Uh, it is, uh, it, I think it is a priority item. The backlog is a priority item as well. And both of them together, I think, uh, uh, I think the work ahead it, it can be done. Uh, and, and the revenue stream I think is uh, dedicated to the Land and Water Conservation Fund uh, because of the fact that that fund has uh, historically uh, been uh, a fund that the American people have supported. And more importantly, more importantly, amendment discussions about what to add uh, to this particular piece of legislation, as the, as the Chairman McGovern said, uh, sending this, this piece of legislation back to the Senate with amendments from the House, I think uh, dooms its possibility of passage, and the stars have aligned themselves to such a point with, the, with support from the Senate, indication uh, support from the administration, and support from the House, an opportunity that is historic to get to get the Land and Water Conservation Fund permanently reauthorized with the dedicated revenue stream, and begin that initial step to dealing with the backlog as well. And I think that those are the, both of those are winners. Well, you can understand, Mr. Chairman, as a Rules Committee member, it would frustrate me if we're calling Rules Committee meetings for, for bills that uh, are not going to be open to amendment or, uh, or improvement. Uh, I, could, I could stay home if that's where we were going to be. I, I, it, it frustrates me as a Budget Committee member and as a supporter of the Land and Water Conservation Fund that I find myself in this 
predicament. I have the largest, uh, most visited national recreation uh, area in the country, uh, in the Chattahoochee National Recreation Area, uh, in my district. Uh, and we absolutely have land and water conservation uh, needs there as we try to connect trails, and we absolutely have uh, maintenance backlog needs. And this uh, pandemic has focused us on those maintenance backlog needs, and I am, I am, I am disappointed that we are absolutely paying the kind of lip service that my constituents expect us to pay to those maintenance backlogs. But when it comes to spending the money, uh, we're putting the money somewhere else, uh, uh, somewhere else entirely. Uh, thank you. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Well, thank you very much, and I, um, I. Uh... I, I would just say to the gentleman, I, uh, I'm surprised at his frustration because when uh, uh, his party was in the majority, um, the Rules Committee oversaw the most closed rules in the history of our Congress, and uh, the gentleman didn't express any frustration then. But he is right. I mean, the, he, he, if, he, if, he, if the chairman would, would yield, he, he, I, I expressed a lot of frustration uh, uh, then, and uh, Speaker Ryan and Speaker Boehner can speak to the frustrations that I uh, that I expressed, but I was not any more successful then than apparently I am today, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, yeah. I guess it wasn't it wasn't reflected in your votes. But the other thing is, he's the gentleman's right. Uh, he began by saying that he uh, finds himself to the right of Mr. Bishop. Um, I mean, my understanding is that the President Trump will sign this bill, um, and so uh, you know, my view is if the Senate's okay with it, and the House is okay with it, and the President's actually going to sign something. That we might find some common ground on. Uh, that's that's a cause for celebration. Let me now yield to Ms. Torres. I have I have no comments, sir. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mrs. Lesko. This is yeah. There you are. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. I'm, so, I'm, so, I'm, so, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I passed Dr. Yeah. Burgess. I'm sorry, Dr. Burgess. Somehow I have the suspicion that you're not sorry that you skipped Dr. Burgess. Of course I am. <laughs> but uh, let me just say, uh, Rob, if you and I came in together and Mr. Gravel was part of our class, as was Mr. Cole, and it has been an honor to serve with you and your, your quiet scholarship will be missed uh, after you're no longer with us. And certainly your tenure on the Rules Committee was something that... Uh, I was back in my first term on this committee, and I learned a lot from from watching your quiet determination on the, uh, as a senior member of the Rules Committee back in the day. Let me just ask you a question. I, I used to be a student of medical irony, and I've kind of branched out now into legislative irony. Um, so if I understand correctly, we're going to use revenues from fossil fuels to fund things in this bill. Is that correct? But my understanding is the uh, uh, purpose of the Democratic Party is to end the use of fossil fuels by a day certain in this country. So how will that funding occur when that day arrives? I'm sorry, that's a question that's above my, my pay scale to give you an answer to it. All I can tell you is right now, um, LWSF is permanently authorized. So this is not about whether you have the program or not. And at some point, if indeed we get to that point, you're going to have to start from scratch and figure everything else out again. And, and good luck, because I won't be here to help you. Well, I'll take to heart that you've, uh, that you've provided such direct encouragement for uh, the road ahead strikes me as being an, un, a, a, an unusual juxtaposition that we're going to use the dollars from fossil fuels at the same time. We've got a presidential candidate who's running on the Democratic ticket who says he's going to end fossil fuels by a date certain. I, I don't know where you, uh, I don't know where you get go to get those revenues perhaps. And Mr. Woodall won't be on the budget committee any longer, so I don't know if we'll be able to look to the budget committee for those funds. Uh, it just sets up some some interesting conflicts for the future, but I guess that's what keeps us all young. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll yield back. Thank you, uh, Mr. Raskin. See him, Ms. Scanlon. All set. Uh, Mrs. Lesko. 
Um, all right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I see Ms. Stanley, but she's shaking her head, so I'm not sure what's happening. Do you want me to proceed? Yeah, I, I thought she was shaking her head. She had no questions. Oh, gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. okay. Thank you. Right. Thank you, okay. Mr. Chairman. I don't have questions, but Mr. Bishop, I think you did an excellent job in a very clear, concise way of explaining your concerns. And I really do support uh, your amendment to say, hey, if we don't have enough funds, we shouldn't be mandatorily um, purchasing land at the expense of maintaining the land we already have it makes total sense to me. Um, and so I just want to say thank you for your great job of explaining it. And I yield back. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Morelli? I'm fine, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. All right. Ms. Shalala? I'm fine, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Ms. Matsui? No comments. Thank you. All right. Uh, um, uh, I, I thank the, both gentlemen for their testimony. There are no other questions. Um, and so uh, with that, I, uh, you, can, you can go um, or log off. <laughs> um, uh, we will hear from any additional witnesses on this measure uh, after we hear from the first panels on all four bills that we're considering. So at this point, um, I would uh, like to call up our next panel to testify in H.R. 6395. Uh, the William M. M. Thornberry National Defense Authorization Act for fiscal year 2021. We're happy to have Chairman uh, Smith and Ranking Member Thornberry. Uh, we're delighted that you are here. Without objection, uh, any written materials you submit to rules document at mail.house.gov before the conclusion of this hearing will be entered into the record. I now recognize the gentleman from Washington, uh, Mr. Smith. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. You uh, hear me okay? Terrific. Um, so, first of all, I want to, you know, as you mentioned, this, this bill is now named after rank, Ranking Member Thornberry, and I want to recognize his service. He's retiring this year, um, has served as chair and ranking member, and as a member of the committee, I believe, for his entire time in Congress. And I just want, I want to thank Mac for his leadership. And, you know, it sort of leads into uh, my testimony on the bill. This bill is an incredibly important piece of legislation that we always work through regular order and in a bipartisan way. Um, every year that is our attempt and almost every year we, we succeed in that, but it, it takes leadership to do that. Uh, Mr. Thornberry um, has been a terrific leader on both of those issues, working the process legislatively on a whole series of issues, recognizing both the need uh, to work together on this and to ultimately complete the product. So I really, I thank Mac for his leadership, for his service to his district, and for, for what I think is, has been a great partnership between the two of us, both when he was chair and now when he's ranking member. So I very much appreciate that. Um, and this year, I think this um, process has worked very well to date. And to give people an idea, the original bill, the original mark, as we put out, uh, had over 800 different provisions in it. In committee, we had over 650 amendments submitted. Uh, we managed to pass into the bill 475 of those, and as the chairman and the committee are well aware, I believe we just officially hit 750 amendments uh, submitted to the Rules Committee uh, for possible addition to the bill on the floor. So when this is all said and done, we're going to have well north of a thousand individual provisions, which represent the opinions, views, and needs of a lot of different members of Congress and their constituents. So this bill is a collective piece of legislation uh, to try to make sure that we are all serving our constituents. And I think that process, working it in a bipartisan manner and working it through regular order is enormously important that we continue our 59 year streak of passing an NDAA every year. And of course, the overarching reason for that is we wanna make sure that Congress makes its statement on national security policy, on making sure that we are exercising our oversight of the Pentagon, and most importantly, that we are giving the support necessary to the men and women who serve our country and to their families to make sure that whatever it is that we decide from a policy matter, they must do, that they are trained, equipped, and 100% ready to do it. I think that is, is our highest responsibility in this process and a crucial responsibility of Congress. This year's bill, I believe, reflects that. Um, we stick to the budget agreement that was reached by Congress last year on our top line of $741 billion. 
Um, we do have a, a billion dollars within that, which is set aside to help uh, DOD prepare, not just for, for dealing with this pandemic, but for future pandemics as well. Uh, lessons learned uh, from the experience to date have shown us both what DOD has done well and the need to enhance that capability. We, of course, have, have our, our pay raise for the troops, which is enormously important to support them. We continue our work on the, the housing issue that we dealt with last year to try to make sure that the housing for our troops are safe. And I think crucially this year, we also take huge steps at addressing diversity challenges. Um, as we have all you know, started a long overdue national conversation about equity and equality, within DOD, we are striving to improve that as well um, by appointing an inspector general to look at hiring, promotion, and criminal enforcement practices within the military to make sure that they are equitable. Um, we also have created a chief diversity officer uh, to examine those issues as well. And I think significantly, we make investments in the uh, historical black colleges and universities to help support a pipeline between them and jobs within the military, both active duty and civilian. I think these are incredibly important provisions. Um, I also want to highlight uh, something that Mr. Thornberry did a lot of work on, which is the Indo-Pacific Defense uh, Initiative. This is sort of built off of the European Defense Initiative. Um, the idea that we need to build alliances and partnerships uh, to build partner capacity in Asia to make sure that we're meeting our national interests and moving towards peace and stability in, in Asia. Uh, obviously, in a bill that has well over a thousand provisions, I could talk for a very long time, but I will not do that. Um, I just think this bill reflects a reasonable balance of interests. As um, I believe Mr. Cole said in his opening remarks, Mr. Thornberry said it's not the exact bill he would have drawn. Um, but he can support it. And even as the chairman, I will, I will assure Mr. Thornberry, it's not the exact bill I would have drawn either. Um, it is a reflection of, in a bipartisan way, um, a lot of different people's viewpoints, but overall, I think it's a very fine product. And I urge the support of the Rules Committee. Thank you, Thank Mr. You. Chairman. Thank you very much. I'm now happy to uh, uh, yield to the uh, chairman, uh, Ranking Member Thornberry. Welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I think I can agree with everything Chairman Smith just said. Uh, I, I certainly appreciate uh, his graciousness in, in offering the amendment to uh, rename the bill, as well as his kind words, the response of all of our committee. For the record, I voted against that amendment, um, but I, I, I still appreciate it. You know, on, on the Armed Services Committee, uh, and, and perhaps because this is my last term, I, I'm thinking about this, uh, we are incredibly fortunate that we get to work with and for the men and women of the military. We get to work for that common higher purpose, which is the national security of the United States. And by and large, we get to do it together where party affiliation uh, is, is, is not much of an issue. We have differences, but uh, we are in many ways very fortunate. So while I'm very appreciative of the, the bill naming, what I'm most proud of is that this bill was reported out of our committee by a vote of 56 to nothing. Uh, now, like the chairman, I did not win every vote on amendments, and I certainly do not agree with every provision that's in it. But uh, 56 to nothing on a serious, substantive bill that addresses all sorts of things is a tribute to Chairman Smith's leadership, but, but also the contributions of uh, each of our committee members. And if I can just offer, one plea to the Rules Committee, it is don't mess this up. Uh, we have an opportunity, I think, to, to keep this, this strong bipartisan support going forward on the floor. And I, I, I hope, I pray that we can and do. And, and I, I would just add to that, Mr. Chairman, that if you're a soldier uh, on a hill in Afghanistan or a sailor out in the middle of the Pacific or a special operator in Africa, you need to know that the whole government, both parties are behind you supporting you. Uh, it, it is not right uh, to have one party or another uh, uh, divided. It, it, you need to know that the country is behind you. And I would say, 
that if you're an ally or even an adversary of the United States, you need to know that Congress can come together on these matters of national security. For example, in our committee, we had a vote on an amendment related to the withdrawal of troops from Europe uh, and, and, and Germany. And the vote was something like 49 to 7 or so, uh, something along that line. I think that's important for our allies to see and hear. Uh, and, and it's also important for, for Russia to, to see and hear. And there's lot, Chairman mentioned the Indo-Pacific Initiative. There's lots of, of those examples. And, and finally, Mr. Chairman, I would say that uh, it's important for the American people to see that we're going to argue that Congress will argue about a whole variety of things. But when it comes to American national security and supporting our troops, we can come together. So all of that is an extended plea to uh, help us uh, keep this bill within in the center of the field, if you will. Uh, and I would say specifically, uh, the closer we can come to parity and amendments made in order, uh, the better. I brought with me some of the statistics from previous years, and I'm going to uh, skip over last year because I think that was an anomaly. In the year before that, the majority party had 42% of the amendments made in order. The minority party had 57% of the amendments made in order. The year before that, the majority party had 49% of the amendments made in order. The minority party had 51% of the amendments made in order. The year before that, the majority period, uh, party had 57% and the minority party had 42. My point is relative parity in amendments. I would say secondly, no poison pills from either side because uh, both parties can come up with an amendment that make it impossible for the other side to vote for the bill. And if we can keep those at bay, that would uh, would help. And, and I would say, finally, Mr. Chairman, the more y'all can uh, keep controversial, extraneous issues off our bill, then uh, we've got a better chance of, of keeping this bipartisan. I understand that there aren't many legislative vehicles moving these days, that there's a temptation to take all sorts of stuff and, and put it on our bill. Uh, if it's something that is universally agreed upon, then I, I can understand that. But uh, even this sturdy bipartisan uh, piece of legislation can't take a, a number of controversial extraneous issues. We can deal, I'm confident, with things that are in our jurisdiction but, uh, but please don't overload us with, with other stuff. Uh, as Chairman mentioned, there are 750 amendments you have to choose from. Pick some of them. You know, we'll have debates, we'll have votes, but, but try to, if you will, keep uh, uh, that bipartisan support. I, I would just mention I have offered one amendment uh, that has, I think, bipartisan support. Uh, it tries to deal with the use it or lose it phenomena which uh, happens at the Department of Defense. In other words, if you, there are certain kinds of money if you don't use by September 30th, you lose it. And so the incentive is to get it out the door or else you're gonna get less money the next year. So four cabinet departments have some provision that allows them to carry over a portion of that money uh, to the next fiscal year with all the reporting and transparency and, and so forth uh, that, is, um, that, that is needed. Four cabinet departments have it. My suggestion is let's let's give it uh, for O and M money, operations and maintenance money to the Department of Defense. But if you see that as a poison pill, don't make it in order. If you think it helps to pass this bill to take my name off of it, take it off. Call it the Mac Thornberry is mud bill. I don't care. Uh, Fifty six to nothing. The 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 troops. The country and our allies need to see that continue. And so that's my message and my hope, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Well, I want to thank you both, uh, Chairman Smith and Ranking Member Thornberry, for your, uh, your opening remarks. I want, to, I want to thank you for the example that uh, you both set, uh, the collegiality and the, um, and the bipartisanship. It, 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 and uh, it reminds me of the Rules Committee. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> uh, but um, uh, and I, I appreciate your admonition for us to not screw it up. Um, you know, you had 650 amendments uh, that you had to deal with in committee. We have 751 at this particular point. Uh, we have a very, not only a diverse uh, 
uh, we, we have a diverse Congress. Uh, you have a diverse Democratic caucus. You have a diverse Republican conference um, that enc en en encompasses all kinds of ideas. And, uh, and so, um, you know, we also have to pass a rule. Um, so we have to figure out ways to, uh, again, try to fulfill your wishes, but also make sure that there's an opportunity for debate on some issues that might have to be defeated on the House floor. Or maybe they pass on the House floor. We're going to have to figure that out as we as we go forward. Uh, but um, but again, we're going to we're going to do the best we can. And uh, and uh, Mr. Thornberry, I, I just, you know, I just, let me just say, I mean, I'm sure you maybe be before the committee again. But I think on behalf of our committee and uh, I think members of Congress, Democrats and Republicans, we we appreciate your service here in the Congress. And uh, uh, you've been an example for uh, for both sides. And um, and I, um, I just wanted to go on record as uh, letting you know how much we all respect and uh, admire your service here. And um, and uh, I think uh, I want to say to Chairman Smith, uh, you know, we, we hold him in high regard. And I, I think it is fitting that uh, this bill is being named after uh, the ranking member because um, I think he deserves to to be praised for 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 his uh, years of service here. So um, I have no questions, but I'm happy now to turn this over to my ranking member, Mr. Cole. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Let me pick up a little bit where you left off and uh, thank both Chairman Smith and Ranking Member Thornberry for the bipartisan manner in which they put this bill together and the sheer quality of the product that uh, we, we brought before it, uh, they brought before us. Now, when, uh, when Mr. Thornberry was going uh, through all that uh, balanced amendments, I want to just point out that those were always Republican Congresses that made those amendments balanced in that way. Uh, and so this will be a special challenge for my Democratic friends to follow that admonition. And uh, I hope they succeed. I'm very supportive of that. I also uh, want to note, uh, just for informational purposes, Mr. Chairman, that uh, when Mr. Thornberry was speaking to our conference about this bill, he said that he was prepared to vote against it, even when his own name was on it, if it didn't stay right. And I, I took that as his effort to try and make sure that we didn't bring forward amendments that uh, undercut the very purposes that he laid out. And uh, so uh, we uh, pledge in the amendment process, Mr. Chairman, to work with you. Uh, I do understand some things need to be disposed of on the floor. We might have strong opinions. Our opinions might even be aligned with one another on occasion, but uh, the House does deserve an opportunity in some occasions to uh, have this debate in front of the full chamber. So uh, we're going to work with you on that. And and uh, try to come to a, a good uh, rules product that, that ushers this on the floor in the appropriate way without, uh, you know, without muzzling a legitimate debate that's just part of the House of Representatives. Um, having said those things, I do have a couple of questions, and these are more for both the chairman and the ranking member just to uh, educate us a little bit on their thought process. I tend to look at the authorizations bill through the lens of a defense appropriator and uh, always use these opportunities. I actually believe we will pass this bill in a bipartisan way and it will be signed by the president. Uh, it won't mean nearly as much as it should. We don't do something similar with the defense appropriations bill later down. I think that's gonna be a bigger challenge, quite frankly, because I think uh, some of the excellent work in this bill by both parties is gonna be thwarted if we don't get that bill done in a timely fashion. I often hear the statistic that uh, for every month we're in a CR, it costs the Defense Department $1.7 billion. Uh, so as we if we push this off till after the election, as we may well, and then push it off after the calendar year, as we may well, we will literally cost the men and women that we've asked to defend ourselves uh, billions of dollars. But one of the tougher parts of this bill, but I think particularly in this time frame, and this has happened uh, during the time frame that uh, uh, both the uh, uh, Chairman uh, Smith and Ranking Member Thornberry have sort of been moving back and forth as Chairman and Ranking Member. The toughest balance, I think, has been uh, normal procurement, that is incremental, uh, you know, uh, acquisitions and modernization. Uh, and uh, they can be at odds with one another. Modernization is usually a pretty expensive uh, proposition, uh, but we know we need new weapon systems. Uh, new ways of going around. So I just would ask them both to tell me what the tension was like uh, and what kind of uh, balances you struck because we need things right now for men and women in the field, but we also know we need to be preparing new weapons for them 
and to counter adversaries who certainly are investing in modernization their own forces. So are there any things in here that we should be aware of where there's tension between acquisition and modernization? And uh, Mr. Uh, Chairman Smith, I'd direct that to you first and then to my, my friend, Mr. Thornberry, as well. So, well, well, thank you, Mr. Cole, and I appreciate your comments and Mr. Thornberry's comments about the overall process. Um, and certainly we, we strive to make it bipartisan. I, I will point out one of the issues we have, Democrats tend to offer more amendments. Um, I know certainly that was the case in committee. Ironically, even though we're in the majority, I think, you know, over almost two thirds of the amendments that were offered were coming from Democrats. So we, we, I don't know, we, we tend to be more, more legislative. I don't know. Um, so we will try to strike that balance, but um, we get a higher quantity. I don't know what the count was on the rules committee. As far as modernization, um, you know, versus uh, legacy programs, we actually had a special panel um, that uh, Seth Moulton and uh, Jim Banks uh, co uh, ran to, to look at that question. I think one of the most important things we need to do to prepare for the future is to invest in new technologies. I mean, AI is going to be the big one that's going to have a huge impact on you know what what our defense capabilities are, how we can deter our adversaries and, and protect ourselves. Um, and so we're going to need to make investments in that. Figure out how to make that that work. You know, cyber obviously, you know, the the most sophisticated weapon system in the world can literally be shut down by somebody sitting in their basement with a computer if you aren't very careful. So I think it's very important that we focus on that technology. Now, you correctly point out the tension, which is, okay, we do that. And it's a zero sum game. There's only so much money. Where do you take that money from? And at this point, I, I really want to praise uh, Secretary Esper um, and the Pentagon right now. They've gone into this, this sort of, I forget what they call it, bottom up review. Basically, you know, what, what do we really need to be spending money on? And they've identified savings in a large number of existing programs. And for the most part, we've been able to maintain that savings within our bill. There's obviously pushback from members who think, oh, you shouldn't cut that program or the other. I think it's enormously important that we sort of step out of our parochial or political lane and look at where do we really need to spend the money? Um, how do we truly prepare ourselves to meet the challenges of today, not the challenges of 30 or 40 years ago? That transition is, is something that we're going through and, and struggling with because there's a finite amount of money. Um, I think we need to really, really look at where we need to spend the money and to focus on those technological improvements. Just you know, one final example, command and control. Um, the basic systems that you know, enable us to communicate with the satellites, communicate through GPS, to operate in everything. Those command and control systems are enormously important. Uh, to, to, to invest in that technology to protect the systems. And, you know, another piece of this struggle that we have, of course, is that China makes a lot of that equipment. Um, and that is a vulnerability. We need to ramp up our ability to produce that type of equipment. We have a debate this year over circuit boards. Um, in the past, we've dealt with other aspects of telecommunications equipment. How do we make sure that we're making enough of those crucial technological components to make our systems work so that we are not dependent upon adversaries? Um, and there are a number of provisions in the bill that, that prioritize that effort. Mr. Thornberry? There. Um, I, I, th I think the tension you mentioned, uh, Mr. Cole, is reflective of the tension in the security environment in which we have to operate. Because we all see, especially the Russians and the Chinese, pushing out on some of these advanced technologies very rapidly. And, and in some cases, we're behind. Uh, and at the same time, as I think you and the chairman mentioned, we've got to deal with the world as it is. Uh, we can't just put a pause on things and go work on new technologies. We've got to safeguard the American people today. And, and so there is an inherent tension in being ready today and preparing for the future. I, I might note that uh, one of the major emphasis we've worked on in, in previous years was making sure that we are ready today and ready in a safe manner. We've talked before when when Chairman and I have been before this committee about increasing airline uh, uh, aircraft accidents and other sorts of of issues related to readiness that uh, where we were not keeping up uh, the the quality of our training of our equipment of our weapons uh, the the way we should and 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 
I think the bottom line for us, and I suspect for all members, is if we're going to send men and women out on a mission, we want to make sure they've got the best equipment, the best training, the best support that our, our nation can possibly provide. Now, as, as the chairman said, I, I think the, the uh, Pentagon's budget request reflected in our committee's mark uh, does have more money for research and development, especially in some of these key technological areas than we have had before. And I think that's good and appropriate. We need to try things. We need to experiment. We need to learn from failure. Uh, but we need to push uh, that experimentation and, and that research and, and development of things. So I, I, I think all of that is, is, uh, is a positive. But the, one other thing I would say, is, and, and the chairman's right, bottom-up review as well as what our committees have done over the years has been trying to increase efficiency, squeeze out money where we can. But speed also matters. One of the factors of current life, uh, the uh, current security environment, is technology is changing faster than it ever has. So we cannot be content with the traditional five-year budget plans. We'll put it in the in the in the palm, and we'll get to it in a few years. That sort of pace is not going to meet our security needs in the future. That's where some of this reform, I think, is so important. Uh, yes, it's about getting better use of the dollars, but it's also about speeding it all up so that the best technology can get it in the hands of the warfighters faster. I'm not saying we solved all, uh, all of it uh, at all, but I do think there are some promising um, pushes, efforts in this bill uh, to, to help meet that, deal with that tension that you described. Thank you. Another question I have, and the Chairman Smith touched on this to some degree in his remarks, uh, but uh, you, we all are dealing in a budgetary sense with coronavirus. That's something that when this bill was put together last year, none of us had any idea would be coming, would hit the scale. Clearly, the military's had to adjust and adapt. That always takes money. Uh, so there's had to be a little bit of robbing Peter to pay Paul to take care of coronavirus. I know, uh, Mr. Chairman, you mentioned you have some things built in to this budget going forward that hopefully help us in that regard. I want to ask you about that, but I also want to uh, just ask both of you as well. I hope that uh, um, there, there's very likely to be a coronavirus um, fifth supplemental, if you will, before this is over. I hope that both of you are working together and with your counterparts in the Senate to put together a defense package for that supplemental. I mean, uh, supplementals are to deal with emergency situations. And the coronavirus is an emergency situation. I want to make sure that we don't end up sapping some of the, the dollars that I know you need for modernization and for operations and for training under coronavirus. So is there going to be any effort to get a defense portion? It would probably be pretty modest. I mean, we all know where most of the money, the supplemental like that would go. It wouldn't necessarily wouldn't be the military. But it is an opportunity to take care of some of the expenses that the military has had to deal with to this point out of its normal budget. Is that uh, on your radar scope at all, Mr. Chairman? Yes, it is. And I want to clarify that the, the money that's in our bill, the billion dollars, is sort of two separate things. One is dealing short term with, and in DOD's case, it's you know certainly we have to take more efforts to protect the workforce, uh, protect the industrial base. And then that's really the big piece of it is what's happening um, with our contractors out there, large and small. What do we need to do to keep them afloat? I mean, we, we've learned a lot from this virus and, and, and other issues that you know, domestic U.S. production is important. Being dependent upon you know, foreign countries for certain key items is a problem. And obviously, if the coronavirus drives the economy down, knocks a lot of businesses out, I um, mean, we lose that industrial base. That just exacerbates the problem that we walked into. We want to make sure that we protect that. What's what's in our bill is more focused on specifically preparing for pandemic response. Um, and this is something you know the DoD actually proved to be a lot better at this than than FEMA or HHS uh, to you know which has created a significant problem in the country. And the, the big example is the the, the strategic stockpile. Um, the strategic stockpile from HHS was like all over the map. Some of the stuff has expired. They hadn't replaced it. They weren't ready. DOD's strategic stockpile, which was put in place 
uh, originally to protect DOD interests, um, it was was very um, efficient and well kept. So much so that we started taking out of the DOD stockpile to deal with some of the domestic concerns. And we also have the Defense Production Act and the use of that to ramp up production to deal with those sorts of items. So we put that money in there to try to enhance DOD's ability to be prepared to be helpful in that regard. That's what's in the bill. The separate piece is what you're talking about and the issues that I led with, talking about industrial base, additional costs to DOD. We're certainly looking at it. I will say that in one of the previous packages, and I think it was the, the CARES package, but I'm not sure, there was $10 billion put in there for that purpose. And, and DOD has not yet spent, you know, I think, even half of that $10 billion. So you know, we've heard discussions of potential need. Obviously, it's logical to assume that there might be need. Um, but we're going to need to see the numbers on that of exactly what they need as we have that, that conversation going forward um, to, to see where the money needs to go. But we are talking about it. Uh, good. Ms. Farm, very poor response. I'm going to be very parochial here and just put for your consideration. Um, my district has Tinker Air Force Base, and it was the largest air depot in the world. 16,000 plus civilian defense workers, multiple lines of aircraft that they do the basic maintenance on on a routine basis. I can tell you from talking with the commanders there and uh, the civilian supervisors as well, obviously their efficiency is down from where it's been just because of some of the measures they've had to take. Uh, and I suspect there'll be the need in a lot of our arsenals and depots uh, to uh, provide extra measures to, to make sure those industrial workforces, and that's what they are, uh, you know, that are working quite often in close proximity, uh, have an extra measure of protection so they can keep doing their job, which is pretty vital to our national defense. I would hope as you two think about this, that you think about those, and, I, and you mentioned them, so I know you're doing it, Mr. Chairman, think about those civilian workforces because they are absolutely critical uh, to providing the warfighter to what he needs in a timely, he and she needs in a timely basis. Mr. Thornberry? You have to you have to turn on your uh, mic. Yeah. Takes a minute sometimes. Okay, I'm sorry, sorry, Mr. Chairman. I kept hitting it, but it did didn't seem to to function. I, I I think one of the lessons of the past few months is whenever our country has an emergency, we turn to DOD to help with it. And uh, certainly DOD has incurred direct costs in setting up hospitals and all the different things they have done, uh, but indirect costs too. And, and that's what uh, one of the things the chairman and, and Mr. Cole both referenced. Uh, so you, you have uh, delays in getting workers where they can work on things and delays mean increased costs. We had one hearing with uh, the Undersecretary for Acquisition and Sustainment where she talked about that some. So I think there's no question that there, uh, as a result of COVID, are additional costs which are not reflected uh, in, in this bill. But my view, and I, I don't want to speak for the chairman, but my view was we have a two-year budget deal Let's stick to those numbers for our bill and let's do everything we can to get it enacted under that two uh, within that two year budget deal number. And then as there are additional COVID uh, uh, legislation that's being considered, then the DOD needs to quantify what those costs are, bring them forward uh, and, and, and perhaps they can be included in that. But, uh, but in the meantime, our bill sticks to the two-year budget agreement, uh, even though, as Chairman said, he has a billion dollars for uh, in uh, the ear set aside for these sorts of expenses, especially for being ready in the future. Last point I'd make is one of my main concerns for national security is that adversaries are watching what COVID has done to our country and uh, thinking of devious ways that they can take advantage of that sort of situation. So preparedness for biological sorts of attacks, especially when it's hard to know if it's natural or if it's intentional, et cetera, I think that has to be a key focus going forward. Well, I just uh, want to add to that point that I think you're wise to stick within the two-year deal. Uh, we did not do that in every bill on appropriations, I can tell you. 
uh, and uh, that, that's going to cause considerable problems in getting anything done with the Senate and with the president. I'm a big believer in a standalone supplemental, and I just want to make sure there's probably one more of these coming. I hope both of you are working with your counterparts to make sure that the expenses that are that are abnormal, that are coronavirus related, find their way into that supplemental bill so you're not uh, put in the position of, again, robbing Peter to pay Paul within the defense of the budget itself. Last thing I have is actually for you, uh, Mr. Thornberry, and uh, I don't think there's anybody in this Congress I admire more than you as a member. Uh, and I think uh, your leadership uh, on uh, the House Armed Services Committee uh, has been exceptional all the way through your entire career. You're really a member's member and certainly a half member's member. And I want to commend both of you, by the way, on the superb staff that you have. We interact because of the nature of my district uh, and because I sit on defense approach extensively with your each of your teams. They are unbelievably responsive uh, and knowledgeable and helpful when we've got questions, suggestions, uh, concerns, whatever. So just thank you for maintaining the kind of staff that you do. Um, you've done defense a long time, Mac, and uh, uh, you think deeply about it. And just last throwaway question, if you're looking ahead in the next five or six years, what do you see as the three, four biggest challenges that we ought to be thinking about when you're not here uh, and to raise them uh, for the, the next defense um, uh, bill that uh, defense authorization bill that comes before it. There. Uh, well, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Cole, and I fully endorse what you said about our staff. We are incredibly privileged to have terrific professionals uh, to work with every every day. Um, as, I, as I think about the future, uh, things that concern me the most, I, I've already mentioned one of them, and that is biological warfare. Uh, shortly after 9-11, I participated in a, as an observer in a uh, tabletop exercise at the National Defense University. It involved uh, terrorists intentionally spreading an animal disease across the country. But what happened to try to contain it was bringing much of the country to a standstill. And I think I have thought about that so much in recent days. Uh, it, it, is a tr it is a real challenge to figure out, is it natural? Is it intentional? Uh, I worry that a lot of uh, bad folks are going to school today. And so I think biological preparedness, I would put a very high emphasis on. The chairman mentioned uh, another one, and that's artificial intelligence. Uh, it will be a part of everything we do in defense, uh, a part of everything, you know, much of what we do in the country. Uh, and, and the challenge is, this is what happened with cyber. The technology moved out much faster than the policies and, and the ethics and, and all of the, the, the surrounding uh, uh, discussion about what's the appropriate way to use it. I think that's where we may be with artificial intelligence. And, and I think it's not just the Armed Services Committee, but the Congress as a whole needs to have further conversations, discussions, reflection on uh, the way and the speed with which technology is changing because it will it will infiltrate everything. Uh, last point I'd made, I'd mention is, um, back to my theme, uh, bipartisanship. Uh, I, that has a strength all, all its own. And as we look at what Russians, Chinese, Iranians, others are trying to do to divide our country, uh, you know, stories this morning about Russians trying to steal uh, coronavirus uh, information, the, the, using disinformation, propaganda, whatever you want to call it. Uh, we're going to have to defend ourselves in a number of domains that we're not used to defending ourselves. And one of the strongest ways that we can do that is to bend over backwards, to stick together when it comes to national security, to not allow adversaries or other agendas to divide us. And, and so that would be the other thing that is as powerful, if not more powerful than any weapon system, uh, uh, trying to maintain the uh, bipartisan sort of approach to supporting our military and to American national security. 
Well, thank you very much for those very thoughtful comments. And thank you much more importantly, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Ranking Member, for setting the example in the bill. You've done it through the process all the way through. You brought us an excellent work product. Uh, again, as I said earlier, I, I uh, pledge to work with my chairman and on this committee to make sure we give you the kind of rule. And it's an appropriate debate, but uh, allows us to keep the bipartisan coalition that you've created uh, in, in this process between the two of you together so that we can uh, pass this extraordinarily important piece of legislation and get it uh, to the president in, in a timely fashion. I want you to have uh, worked your magic in conference uh, with the other side and uh, of the rotunda uh, and uh, and gotten them to behave up to your high standards there. And knowing, uh, knowing Senator Inhofe and Senator Reid, I think you have a pretty good chance of uh, being able to, to do that. So uh, again, job well done. And with that, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you very much. Mr. Torres. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Um, Chair. The, the National Defense Authorization Act is much more than an investment in our defense. It's also how we project our power, our values around the world. We've learned this the hard way in the past. In 2018, Guatemala's Minister of the Interior ordered U.S. provided J-8 Jeeps with armed agents and turret mounted guns to target and intimidate the International Commission Against Impunity in Guatemala, also known as CSIG. For those who aren't familiar, CSIG was a UN entity tasked with rooting out corruption and bolstering the rule of law. Those corrupt officials recognized CSIG as a threat that it was to their illegitimate power. And they used our military aid to terrorize the organization and anyone who, co who cooperated with it. If you think that's brazen, just wait because this story gets much worse. Our Jeeps weren't just sent to torment CSIG. They wound up at our own embassy with the turrets on American-made Jeeps being used to intimidate our own diplomats. It was as clear a sign as any that well-intentioned military aid provided to intercept the drug cartels at the border with Mexico was falling into the hands and driven to the city to intimidate UN personnel and US citizens working at our US embassy. That is why I'm offering an amendment requiring the Secretary of Defense to report to Congress that prior to any vehicle transfer by DOD to government entities in Guatemala has been certified for a credible commitment, credible commitment. The amendment also requires future contracts to include a clawback provision in case this equipment is used in ways that were not intended or falls in the wrong hands, such as the drug cartels. Having spent the first five years in my life in Guatemala. And having seen firsthand how corrosive the corruption there is for the people who are just trying to get by, I know how cautious we must be with our aid that we give to them. I'm also offering provisions that streamline our supply chain to increase PPE production, encourage collaboration between the DOD and manufacturing USA Institutes require congressional notification for certain firearm exports and encourage renaming military bases with the names of female soldiers that have served with valor that uh, are also so important and have had an important impact in our military. These provisions are vital and I am proud to offer them and I look forward to supporting this package and Mr. Chairman, I have no questions. I will yield back. Thank you very much, Mr. Woodall. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm uh, reminded of uh, of everything I had to say last year when it was not a 56 to two, uh, 56 to zero uh, vote. It was uh, only two folks who crossed the aisle. And I remember seeing the pained expressions on both the chairman's face and the ranking member's face as they had to uh, have that uh, conversation. Now, of course, by the time it came back out of conference, they'd uh, massaged it into a, a bill that passed uh, on a voice vote. 
uh, on the floor of the House, which is what uh, what uh, good leaders uh, do. I worry all the time, uh, Mr. Chairman, that we will get in. You know, good habits are hard to keep. Bad habits are easy to get into. And a 59 year uh, legacy of uh, of doing the nation's business in a bipartisan uh, way is a is a is a tremendous burden to have on uh, on your shoulders. So, uh, having uh, uh, having already been praised by everyone for uh, uh, for your partnership, uh, I will uh, not just vocalize my praise but express it uh, by not uh, belaboring uh, these points uh, any uh, longer. Uh, thank you both for your leadership, uh, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Um, uh, Mr. Perlmutter. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and to uh, Mr. Smith and uh, Mr. Thornberry, thank you both for your service. Thank you for your ability to work together so well. And um, Mac, I applaud the fact this is going to be named after you. Uh, I think that you and uh, Adam uh, bring a calming influence uh, to these kinds of what could be very difficult um, subjects and uh, issues, and that's part of leadership, and I thank you both for that. I think we have uh, two gentlemen leading our committee uh, that have that same kind of um, influence on people, Mr. McGovern and, and Mr. Cole. So I wanted to start with that, and I also want to thank both of you uh, for working with our office on a couple of uh, environmental and health uh, amendments that uh, we brought forth, uh, one involving uh, the civilian nuclear workers. Uh, Colorado, we have Rocky Flats, where we used to build the uh, plutonium triggers uh, for the nuclear bombs, and it's left a legacy, uh, both environmental as well as health, and uh, there is an ombudsman program that uh, we're going to offer up as an amendment to extend that ombudsman program because uh, the health and the environmental issues uh, of uh, plutonium last a long time. Well, we also have a PFAS um, amendment that we're going to offer. Uh, again, a legacy issue. Uh, you deal with national security, military kinds of issues as you two do, and, and this budget deals with uh, there are environmental and health uh, consequences to these things. And so we're going to bring both of those forward. I appreciate the, the bipartisan nature uh, of this bill. And I think uh, these two amendments, uh, we've worked with your offices, and hopefully we can get them made in order. And uh, with that, Mr. Chair, I will yield back. Uh, Mr. Bur Dr. Burgess. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I actually have no questions. I just want to thank my friend for his years of service and the wise counsel and guidance that he's always provided me. During, we've had these uh, rules committee meetings on the NDAA in the past, and they're all coming into absolute clarity now that we're here poised on, poised on the uh, penultimate NDAA for Mr. Thornberry. Uh, just appreciate everything he's brought to the discussion over the years. Now you yield back. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Scanlon. Yes, and thank you. I got kicked off by dual hearings earlier. Okay. Um, I just want to thank the, the chairman and ranking member. I, I know they have one of the toughest jobs in Congress, and we appreciate all their efforts. So I yield back. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Lesko. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to say that I'm pleased with uh, many of the measures in this bill. I have Luke Air Force Base in my congressional district. I noticed that we're authorizing 79 F-35s, Luke Air Force Base trains F-35 pilots. Um, I'd also, uh, the bill permits the transfer of land at Camp Navajo in Arizona from the U.S. Army to the State of Arizona Department of Emergency Management and Military Affairs for training. Uh, which the Nash Arizona National Guard has been requesting for many years. It also, in Fort Huachuca, Yuma Proving Grounds and Yuma Marine Corps Base uh, received military construction funds on projects they have been asking for for a long time. So I'm pleased that those are in the bill and I yield back. 
Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Morelli. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I, I want to just uh, just a few comments. Uh, uh, first, to uh, thank the uh, chairman of the committee for uh, his extraordinary work. I, I remain impressed by uh, uh, all the great work that he's done and to the ranking member. Uh, thank you for your uh, service, not only the committee, but thank you for your service to the Congress and to the country. Uh, and I very much appreciate the two of you being here together, talking about bipartisan efforts, which are clearly critical to us moving forward in what seems like a more deeply polarized country and at times Congress. So I'm grateful to uh, to both of you. Uh, just two things, I, and you may wish to comment, um, but uh, I, I just, you know, they're top of mind to me. Um, <clears throat> one is the the uh, comments you made earlier, Mr. Chairman, about supply chain, and I do uh, worry not only from an economic security standpoint for the United States, but uh, but uh, as importantly a national security perspective. Supply chain on um, things that uh, are industrial, some that are um, you know that relate to intellectual property, that relate to um, semiconductors, et cetera, and, and not only the supply chain in terms of goods, services necessary to make those products here in the United States because they have national security implications, but also I, I'm concerned, and maybe you could just comment briefly, uh, either or both of you, about the workforce. Uh, you know, we continue to hear about in advanced manufacturing and other uh, types of industries that we, we struggle to have trained workers. I know back home, uh, when I'm visiting either people that are in the defense space uh, here in Rochester, New York, or those that are just in traditional um, domestic uh, product manufacture, that workforce development and uh, trained workforce are critical. I've spoken a little bit to uh, DOD officials um, because we have an optics and photonics cluster here that's part of the manufacturing sector that some of the funding came out of DOD and DOE, but uh, they continue to talk about uh, workforce training. So, number one, if you could just maybe comment a little bit uh, on that as it relates to uh, the bill before the House or before the committee. And secondly, just, you know, you know, my constituents and all of ours woke up this morning to see um, that uh, there was a Bitcoin uh, a scam that netted, um, I don't know, just a couple of hundred thousand dollars for hackers. But there was comments made, I saw in, in the press, that related to whether or not some of this may have been Russian sponsored um, and Russian government sponsored uh, sort of reminders uh, again about uh, you know election security. But it, it does occur to me that this is clearly a national defense issue as well. And just maybe if you could comment, I know that you touched on a little bit earlier, Mr. Chairman, about cybersecurity and the balance they have to strike between existing uh, threats and challenges and how much more you can invest in cybersecurity. But could you just uh, maybe illuminate each of those points a little more in terms of what you see in the bill before us uh, that helps to address uh, these concerns and to that would allay any concerns that that uh, Americans would have about both of these issues. Sure. On the cybersecurity point, there's actually quite a bit in the bill. Look, I mean, the, the, the key here is to have a, you know, a robust system and to have that, you got to hire really smart people. So your two questions are actually very much connected. You know, the development of the proper workforce is also incredibly crucial within within cyber. And there have been a variety of different working groups that have sort of, sort of focused on this this question. Uh, Bob Work and Eric Schmidt are part of one that made a number of recommendations to us about how we can improve the quality of the workforce on cyber and on technology and leading into AI, frankly. Um, and then Chairman Langevin, he's the chairman of the Emerging Threats Subcommittee and uh, ranking member Stefanik, who's um, you know, the, well, the ranking member in that subcommittee, have put together an, uh, the Cyber Solarium um, study, which made a whole series of recommendations of ways to improve this, which are included in the bill. I admit I'm not an expert on the details of that. I don't know if Mr. Thornberry would know more about that. I'll yield him in a moment. But there's a huge effort to answer precisely that cyber question, to put us in the best possible position. Now, I will again say, that you know, one of the other key aspects of it is the equipment itself. Is having you know domestic U.S. manufacturers who are going to be able to ensure our telecommunication, ensure the security of our systems. This is why the whole Huawei ZTE thing matters. 
You know, we, we are worried if adversaries are able to get inside of our most, you know, or of any of our systems for that matter, um, that they will be able to manipulate that to their advantage. And the only way to prevent that is to have trusted partners making this. Um, and there's one little side issue, which I'll slide in here, which we're, we're trying to take care of in, in the bill this year having to do with beneficial ownership within corporations, um, the ability basically of people to hide who truly runs the corporation. Th this happened um, in California. There was a Boeing was building a satellite and they hired a subcontractor uh, to help them do that. Well, the, the, it was a shell and it was really owned by, uh, it was a sovereign Chinese company. And China basically did this work and then just stole the information that they got through that company because we didn't see it coming. Uh, so basically there is a lot more that we need to do to protect ourselves from people who would take advantages of the weaknesses in our system. And I think this bill reflects a pretty decent effort to move to move in that direction. Uh, on the workforce question, you know, there's a lot more that we can do. First of all, focusing on you know, our existing domestic population. I am deeply concerned on education policy that we are stuck 30, 40 years ago. Um, and look, I have a political science degree from Fordham University, and that's great. It served me well. I've gotten to where I need, need to go, and that's fine. We need to make a much bigger investment in developing skills, um, whether you're talking about you know, welders, technology, there's all manner of different skills that are necessary to have that domestic manufacturing base. And we've placed this entire emphasis on pouring all manner of different money into getting people into four-year colleges where we don't have the same resources going towards getting people into apprenticeships. And we've looked for different ways to support that, um, working with businesses and unions alike to encourage people starting, frankly, in middle school to look at careers in these areas. And, and the truth is you can get trained to do those types of jobs for a, in a lot less time, for a lot less money, and wind up getting paid a lot more money when you take the job. But we have not shifted the way we do education and workforce development in this country in any sort of comprehensive way to address that. We need to do that. And the last thing I would say, I mean, I'm told that there are certain subjects that we shouldn't bring up um, within the defense bill um, because they make things more difficult. And one of them certainly is immigration. So I only do that briefly. But look, one of the great strengths of our country for a couple hundred years is bringing in people from outside. You know, people want to come here. Immigrants want to come here, you know, learn skills and go to work. And that renews us. Now, I, I do not you know, support you know, just throwing open the borders and bringing anyone who comes in. But having a smart immigration policy that recognizes that we need that support you know, for a variety of different reasons. I'm focused on one very narrow part of the immigration debate here, and that is workforce. That is, you know, bringing in the talent that we need to do the jobs that need to get done while also training our domestic population. And that has huge implications for what you just talked about. And those are some policies that I think we can shift throughout Congress um, to better meet our national security needs. Well, and, and perhaps, uh, first of all, uh, you know, we understand uh, how talented you are having gone to a great New York school like Fordham. So I appreciate the New York connection. But I, and I think uh, Secretary Shalala and I uh, perhaps could even follow up with you. We both serve on the Education and Labor Committee. And I think some of your comments are uh, particularly on, on, on the money. And we should follow up to see how we can be helpful in, uh, in addressing those concerns, because I, I agree with you wholeheartedly. And I don't know if Mr. Thornberry wanted to comment as well. Well, j just briefly, uh, because I agree with what y'all are saying about workforce, uh, it, it's essential. We take several steps in this bill to try to wean ourselves off of buying things from China, whether it's pharmaceuticals, telecommunications, uh, uh, a variety of things. But you got to if we're going to make those things here, then you have to have the workforce available. And, and we hear from virtually all our defense uh, uh, suppliers that getting qualified workers is one of the biggest challenges that they face. So, and 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 I completely agree with the chairman. Uh, that includes a responsible uh, element of immigration, as far as uh, people who want to come here to contribute to the country. A lot of times we educate folks here, 
and then we tell them they can't stay. They've got to leave rather than, uh, you know, use their PhD in chemistry or whatever for for the greater good. The other thing I just wanted to emphasize on your Bitcoin cyber point, uh, emphasize what the chairman said. We've got great leaders, uh, Chairman Benjamin and Ms. Stefanik. Uh, Mike Gallagher, Congressman Gallagher and Senator King have co-sponsored, have co-chaired a, a, another commission. And a lot of the recommendations from both of these commissions are in this bill. So we're playing catch up. But but the thing I just want to put on the table, we've all in Congress got to deal with this issue of what do we expect DOD to do to defend our country in cyberspace? Because there in the past, we've had uh, a, a some air tactics used saying, oh no, uh, DOD is going to read my emails to grandma or whatever. Uh, when you've got sophisticated actors uh, and trying to disrupt our country, we need to be clear as a policy matter, not just as a technical matter, who doing what and support them when they do it. And that's been a challenge in the well, Mr. Chairman, thank you, uh, both Chairman Smith and uh, the ranking member for their comments, for their service, for the great work here. And I appreciate you giving me the time and I yield back. Ms. Shalala. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I strongly support this bill. I think that Chairman Smith and ranking member uh, Thornberry are patriots um, and they've put together a, a really a a solid bill for all of us and 56 to nothing is just unbelievable. I, I There's a small program for small business uh, industrial based uh, resilience uh, that's really important to my district and I wanted to thank you for putting it in. I have a small business called Symmetry Printing and Marketing and they answered the call to manufacture PPE and other medical supplies for frontline workers and they will participate in this uh, uh, in this program, as will other small businesses um, that have really been devastated. Um, I, I hate to continue the question uh, the question on uh, workforce, but I did want to ask to what extent, because it's been a debate within the military for a long time, because the military basically contracts out for electricians and plumbers, but it could in fact train some of those skilled workers, which it already does in certain areas. Um, is that appropriate for a peacetime army in the future on the military taking on more of the responsibility for skill training in, in those specific areas? I mean, Peter. off, off the top, I, I would say it's probably not the ideal approach. And I think we I mean, and uh, you know, with your background, you obviously understand this. Um, I think our education and workforce development system as a country um, is important. And there's people who have that skill set. Now, what does happen a lot, I mean, a, a great program in, in my area, bigger shipyard, worked directly with South Seattle Community College and said, you know, look, um, we're building ships here. Here's what we need. And they identified two or three specific skill sets went into the community college and, you know, where it, where it was able to help them financially and set up a program specifically designed to meet that. I personally think that's the better way to do it than a DOD top-down approach. It's not really within DOD skill set um, to develop that type of manufacturing base industrial skill set. I think we, we have other entities, um, our colleges and universities. Um, technical colleges who I think are better suited to, to meet that meet that need, they need to coordinate with our with DoD and the, and the Secretary of the Navy, um, Secretary Spencer at the time, was involved in that program that I just talked about. So I think it's important they work together. I would prefer the educators to take the lead on that. Yeah, the military does though, for instance, for their airplanes train mechanics, and the country really has a shortage of of mechanics for our airlines. Um, and they they literally recruit everybody that's coming out. So there is there are some specific skills, mechanics in particular on both ships, as well as um, the airplanes that the military does do training for, in which those people are very attractive when they leave. 
Um, I yield back, Mr. Chairman. I don't want to uh, take these gentlemen's time. They've done enormous work for all of us. I'm proud to support the bill. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Matsui. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I first of all want to compliment um, Chairman Smith and also Ranking Member Thornberry for your fine work on this. Um, to have a 56 and nothing vote, I think is really incredible with all the amendments and, and challenges you had to deal with that um, I think is fabulous. And uh, Mr. Thornberry, we're going to miss you. I've seen you in the elevator a lot. We talk a lot. And uh, you've been somebody that, um, that has uh, been very pleasant to deal with. And I Wish you well as you go forward. Um, this has been a fine bill. I look at it 56 to nothing. It's a product of extensive bipartisan negotiation that we know about and will ensure Congress meets its constitutional obligation in a timely manner for the 60th consecutive year. Uh, this NDA provides $732 billion of discretionary spending to maintain resident readiness, transform capabilities, and invest in new technologies that will help advance national security. I filed an amendment with Representatives McCall, Eshu, Stefani, Stevens, Joyce, and Katko to help reinforce U.S. technological leadership. As the global economy becomes more interconnected, it's essential that the U.S. maintains the ability to produce the hardware that our high-tech economy depends upon. Semiconductors are fundamental components of our phones, medical devices, and the future of quantum computing. And this, this NDA, uh, has been really fabulous and incorporating a lot of the aspects of our life that we really need in order to ensure that we are um, as protected as possible. And it takes steps also to directly address the threat of COVID-19 by creating the Pandemic Preparedness and Resilience National Security Fund and improving infectious disease modeling capabilities. We'll improve the department's ability to respond to public health pretty fits. Um, this has been a, um, as I look through the bill, as I try to look through the bill, it's been a remarkable accomplishment. I thank you very much, and uh, it's a good bill. I look forward to supporting uh, it. Thank you so much. I yield back. Uh, thank you very much, Ms. Matsui. Does any other member of the committee wish to ask a question? Hearing uh, from nobody, I would like to thank our witnesses for their testimony, and uh, you can log out and have a good day. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I was remiss up front in not thanking you and the Rules Committee. You've had to process all 751 of those amendments, and you've done an outstanding job of that, and I, I appreciate it. Thank you. Well, thank you. We, we ought to thank our staff, too, because they are the ones who <laughs> do the hard work uh, to try to make us look good. So I appreciate that. But thank you so much, and we'll talk to you soon. Thanks, sir. All right. Uh, we are. So we will uh, we will now hear from uh, uh, we will hear from any additional witnesses on this measure after we hear from the first panels on all four bills that we're considering today. So um, I would now like to call our next panel to testify on HR seventy twenty seven, the Child Care is Essential Act, and HR seventy three twenty seven, the Child Care for Economic Recovery Act. Um, Chairwoman uh, Nita Lowy and Ranking uh, uh, Member Cole, uh, as well as Representative DeLauro and Representative Wenstrup um, uh, and Representative Sanchez. Uh, we're delighted that you're all here. Without objection, any written materials you submit to the to rules documents at mail.house.gov before the conclusion of this hearing will be entered into the record. Uh, I now recognize the distinguished gentleman from, the, from New York, the uh, Chair of the Appropriations Committee, Chairwoman Lowy. Well, thank you very, very much, Mr. Chairman. I'm delighted to be here. And I'm very proud to present H.R. 7327, the Child Care for Economic Recovery Act. Our country was already in short supply of affordable quality child care before the pandemic. Now, more than half of child care programs have closed due to COVID-19. Our bill responds to the heightened urgency of the child care crisis by providing critical relief to working families, child care providers, and essential workers. In addition, it includes long overdue funding for child care infrastructure 
and offers incentives for employers to provide child care assistance. Child care facilities significantly impact the quality of care, and we know quality child care makes all the difference. The bill includes $10 billion in infrastructure grants to states to make long overdue facility repairs, as well as quickly adapt spaces for social distancing and other safety protocols to mitigate the risk of coronavirus transmission. To support our heroes, we have included $850 million in social services block grant funding to reimburse depending care obtained by essential workers who have cared for our communities throughout the pandemic. In addition, for the first time in more than a decade, this bill would increase guaranteed child care funding to states and by lifting funding from $2.9 billion to $10 billion a year for the next five years, more hardworking families will be able to find affordable quality care. Congress took an important step by providing $3.5 billion for child care and development block grants, as well as $750 million for Head Start in the CARES Act. The House Passed Heroes Act would build on that with an additional $7 billion for CDBG, and we must do more to respond to the scale of need. That's why this bill is so necessary to hardworking families nationwide. The Child Care for Economic Recovery Act supports work, reduces disparities in child care accessibility and the education opportunity gap and gives our communities needed stability in this time of unprecedented challenges. What's good for our babies is good for our budget. And if parents don't have the basic assurance that their child is safe, when they're out of the home, they simply cannot return to their jobs. Our economic recovery depends on the full recovery of the childcare sector. So I thank you, Mr. Chairman, and my friends on the committee, and I yield back. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, I'm now happy to yield to my colleague, uh, who's also on the Appropriations Committee, uh, Mr. Cole. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and uh, I'm going to respond to both these bills, if that's all right in my testimony. Uh, sure. yep. And as, uh, as my good friend knows, I'm here as a much more distinguished member, uh, Ms. Granger, that would normally be here, but she just was unable to make it. Uh, I'd be remiss not to start by adding, it's wonderful to see my chairman, uh, Chairman Lowy. I spent much of the last two weeks with her and my subcommittee chairman, Ms. Laurel. so uh, just uh, their delight to uh, interact with, although on this we have a different opinion. Mr. Chairman, I oppose the bills brought uh, before the committee today. It's not that I oppose the programs for child care for working families or the need uh, for changes to child care programs in response to the coronavirus pandemic. Indeed, my good friend, the chairman, makes a very good point, and she uh, uh, stresses how important this is in terms of getting the entire economy up, and she's absolutely right. Uh, when she points out that uh, nobody's going back to work if their children cannot go to a safe environment and be looked after adequately. That's why I was very happy to support uh, the CARES Act and the provisions that uh, the chair uh, actually mentioned. And I would suggest we're going to deal with this topic, as indeed I think we must. Uh, it's probably better done in the context of a coronavirus standalone emergency bill that I hope takes shape uh, later this month and uh, and uh, that we can bring the floor and vote on in a bipartisan manner. But looking at these specific bills, this is my friend Ms. Lloyd's bill, as uh, she said, appropriates $10 billion for child care infrastructure construction and renovation and also increases funding for the mandatory Social Security block grants program, as well as uh, making numerous changes in the tax code. 
Similarly, the bill introduced by my friend, Ms. Delora, provides $50 billion for new unauthorized child care stabilization funds. Uh, these may be good ideas, as I said, but the Appropriations Committee has had no hearings on these issues, has not marked up any bills touching on these matters. This is just another example of majority leadership rushing something to the floor without broad member buy-in and education. All of these ideas should be considered within the context of a broader supplement funding bill, one that's developed in concert with the other body in the administration. Our people deserve a package that has bipartisan support and can be enacted into law. I fear that the passage of these two bills, uh, the piecemeal appropriation over $60 billion in new programs, is not going to take us uh, in that direction. And in particular, the, uh, the measures that, delay, that relate to the, the tax code, Mr. Chairman, really aren't particularly the prerogative of our committee at all, and more appropriately, that should be addressed by by ways and means, not to say they may not be good ideas, but they too, again, have not gone through the committee process. So to bring something of this size, $60 billion, and major changes in the tax code that uh, impact tens of billions of dollars more, much as $100 billion, I think uh, without a single hearing and without all the appropriate uh, committees of jurisdiction looking at it, it's just premature at the, at the minimum. Uh, so we may be able to get these bills through the Rules Committee, I suspect, and perhaps even across the floor. But I think until we sit down and have a serious negotiation with the United States Senate and administration, probably in the context of a standalone coronavirus bill, they're not likely to go anywhere. So for that reason, Mr. Chairman, I oppose both measures and I yield back. Uh, thank you very much. And I want to yield to Representative DeLauro. Okay, here I am. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, it's an honor to speak to you today alongside my colleagues on such a vital issue for our children, for working people, our communities, and so many small businesses, and that is child care. I want to thank you, Chairman McGovern, for this opportunity to testify about my $50 billion bill for child care. I want to acknowledge my colleagues, the ranking uh, uh, member uh, uh, Cole of the subcommittee on Labor HHS, um, uh, and and uh, all of his efforts as we put together that bill. And uh, also to say um, that uh, we have spent a lot of time along with uh, uh, Chairwoman Nita Lowy these last uh, a week or two weeks uh, uh, with regard to appropriations. But I wanna uh, acknowledge uh, Chairwoman Nita Lowy and Congresswoman Catherine Clark. Their bill is also a standalone emergency bill. In addition to increases in mandatory funding it includes my Child Care Flex Spending Act, um, which increases the amount employees may exclude from their gross income for employer-provided dependent care assistance. Crucially, in my view, it provides a $10 billion for child care infrastructure, which is another critical component, which I am proud to support. Let me quote the Washington Post from July 4th, uh, titled, Lack of Child Care Slowing Recovery. Working parents swamped at home, productivity slump pinned on school center closures. The child care crunch triggered by the pandemic has rapidly become a crisis for many workers and companies that is hindering the economic recovery, disproportionately harming women and threatening to leave deep scars for years to come, end quote. As chair of the Labor, Health and Human Services and Education Appropriations Subcommittee, my committee has been central to our response to this pandemic and has provided much needed funding to deal with the crisis, providing $3.5 billion for child care in the CARES Act and $7 billion in the House passed HEROES Act. But to be frank, $7 billion and $3.5 billion is not enough to save the child care sector. It could take at least $9.6 billion per month, according to the National Women's Law Center, to keep current child care providers in business. This is a crisis. More than half of the child care programs could close if we do not act quickly. 40%, 47% of them are closed in my district uh, in Connecticut. If we cannot make families feel that their kids are going to be safe and secure, in their childcare setting, we are not going to get this economy back on track. 
Affordable child care was a significant and a severe issue before the pandemic. It will be after the pandemic is over. So this is not about going back to normal. We cannot afford to do that either. We need to ensure we have high quality, affordable providers to see families through the pandemic and afterwards. I introduced the Child Care is Essential Act with Congressman Bobby Scott, Senator Patty Murray. It creates $50 billion in child care stabilization fund within, within the existing child care and development block grant program. The bill will provide grant funding to child care providers to stabilize the sector and support pr providers so they can be safely reopening and running. The bill has 110 co-sponsors. Um, when the deadline passed with the bill being marked up today, there's an additional 12 more members and I'm so grateful for their voices in the fight to save childcare. The new child care stabilization fund would provide grant funding for child care providers, stabilize the child care sector, support providers to safely reopen and operate. The grants would uh, help child care providers uh, and working families buy. It ensures the grants adequately support providers operating expenses, expenses and funding gets to them quickly. Require providers to continue to pay their staff. Tuition and co-payment relief for working families. Health and safety through compliance with public health guidance. Prioritize providers that serve underserved populations, ensuring that the grants are awarded equitably across child care settings and conducting oversight through robust reporting requirements. Uh, one second. And we did this because we believed we had to do this to keep our economy afloat. We have provided $58 billion to the airlines. We have provided billions of dollars to businesses because we need them to stay in business for the economy to thrive. But I will tell you what we didn't need, and that's in the CARES bill, hedge fund managers, real estate developers got $170 billion tax break, completely unrelated to the pandemic. We didn't need that. But what we do need to do is to save the child care industry. No, that is no less critical than any of these other agency. A matter of security for women and families. Um, it is cited, by the way, the lack of child care as a reason why women are still highly reflected uh, in the unemployment roles. It is also a matter of addressing racial disparities, which the virus has exposed. Center for American Progress published a report about the state of child care, especially for African-Americans, highlighted what so many of us already know, but has been exacerbated because of COVID-19. As communities of color have less resources to pay for child care during economic recovery, and these families that require child care to perform their jobs on the front lines, and they are on the front lines. They are the essential workers. And in some of these communities, we've identified what are called child care deserts. Further, the report found particularly providers in communities of color may struggle to access small business loans like those through the PPP because of systemic discrimination in banking pra practices, the wealth gap, and higher debt. We need to do much more in this historic moment for women, for families, for small businesses, for communities of, of color, for our children. We need to stabilize the child care sector and the $50 billion that is included in this bill will only help us to get there. Thank you for your time and I yield back. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Wenstrup. Well, thank you. Thank you, Chairman McGovern and Ranking Member Cole. Um, you know, millions of Americans want to return to work. And in order to do so, they have to be able to rely on child care providers to keep their children safe and healthy throughout the day. This, to me, is a bipartisan issue. And Republicans agree that access to child care is essential to making America's recovery stronger. And, and we want to move in that direction as well as I'd like to find ways to provide incentives for uh, Americans to go into the profession of child care. Leader McCarthy's made it clear his support for prioritizing child care in the COVID relief package and more than four Republican members, myself included, have echoed that support in a letter this week. In the past, Republicans 
Democrats have consistently worked together to provide additional support for child care. As a member of the Worker Family Support Subcommittee, I've introduced a bipartisan bill with Mike Kelly and Cindy Axney that would allow parents more flexibility their dependent care. Mr. Wentzer, why don't you, why don't you hold, hold for one second. As we so begin you... to emerge from the COVID-19 public health emergency. It's important to give families the financial tools they need to weather this storm. And one way to do this is by giving Hey, Mr. Winstrup, I wanted you to suspend for one second because we're having a tough time connecting to you. You're going in and out. So I don't know whether there's a... Um, yeah. I think you're frozen now, so... Um, Yes. Okay. All right. So you may want to turn your video off and then back on. You may want to turn your video off and then on again, I'm told. That may help. I don't know. I'm seeing you, just so you know. Yeah, I see, we see you, but we, we're not hearing you consistently. We're not seeing you. Uh, you you're, you're freezing up. So, um, okay. Let me try, try this. Let me try to turn it back on and see what, what happens. I, I did. Am I still frozen? Yeah. Well, I don't see you, but I can hear you. I can hear you better. <laughs> well, why don't we just cont continue with that? Yeah, good. Because you're coming through much clearer now. So thank you. Okay. okay. It looks like I have a strong connection, so I'm not sure. Is it better now? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Well, I'll, I'll continue then. Um, as a member of the Worker Family Support Subcommittee, I've been introduced to a bipartisan bill with Mike Kelly and Cindy Axney that would allow parents more flexibility to use their dependent care flexible spending accounts. As we begin to emerge from the COVID-19 public health emergency, it's important to give families the financial tools they need to weather this storm. And one way to do this is by giving families flexibility to use their own child care dollars. In the last five years, Congress has worked on a bipartisan basis to double funding for the Child Care and Development Block Grant and included $3.5 billion in much-needed support to providers and essential workers in the CARES Act. But the bill here today, um, unfortunately, Democrats have skipped the order in any semblance of meaningful bipartisan discussion. Uh, which uh, we don't we don't often do, is my experience on ways and means. But they've quickly patched together sort of a greatest hits of various child care proposals with no effort to collaborate or engage with Republicans. And that's the frustration. Because this bill contains six child care provisions with a cost of more than 100 billion. These provisions, however, have not been through regular order in the committee of jurisdiction, and this package has not been the subject of a single committee hearing, let alone a committee mark. The bill expands the CARES Act employee retention tax credit to cover wages paid to domestic workers performing services in their employer's private homes. Presumably, Democrats wanted this expansion to cover nannies and other caretakers in the home, but it also provides a benefit for wages paid to domestic workers, including butlers, maids, gardeners, and doing it on a retroactive basis. The child and dependent care tax credit provides parents with a tax benefit for paying providers to care for their child, but it doesn't provide and ex explicitly prevents parents and spouses any credit or other benefit for homemakers who provide the same care. The new credit for fixed operating expenses of child care facilities seems arbitrary. The federal government is not picking up the fixed operating expenses of any other industry. So why child care facilities? The bill has no safeguards on the refundability of the child and dependent care tax credit. This expansion and refundability is estimated to cost nearly $100 billion for 10 years, including outlays or direct payments to taxpayers of nearly $40 billion. Finally, the bill includes an increase in child care entitlement funds to states from $2.9 billion to $10 billion 
for the next four years an additional 10 billion in mandatory dollars for child care stabilization grants. Now we know multiple states, in multiple states, the additional child care funding provided to the CARES Act still has not made its way down to child care providers at ground level. And if we're going to provide additional dollars to support child care, we should make sure that they're targeted and tailored to meet the emergent needs and accessible to providers and families that need help now. There's an important role for Congress to play in alleviating the stress on our families and child care clearly is a priority and a smart investment for all of us. But if we're serious about helping families, I think we need to be reaching across the aisle. Republicans on Ways and Means Committee have demonstrated our commitment to improving the high quality care in the past, and we would have welcomed the chance to have an informed, engaged discussion. With that, I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ms. Sanchez. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member Cole and members of the committee. Families need access to affordable, high quality childcare if we want our recovery to succeed. Parents need childcare that they can count on to be open, affordable, and safe before they can return to work. And that is simply not the situation they are facing right now. As a working mom, I know this firsthand. The Child Care for Economic Recovery Act is a key part of making a return to work possible for parents and safe for children. Bold federal investments and tax incentives for working families and their employers are needed to make safe, affordable care both a priority and a reality. Our legislation addresses immediate hurdles that essential workers face in accessing child care, including the ability of child care providers to weather this crisis. But it's also about maintaining access to high quality child care well into the future. For our economy to come back, parents and employers need certainty about child care tomorrow, not just about child care today. I would like to highlight a few examples of how this legislation modifies the tax code and the Social Security Act to shore up and stabilize the child care industry. By doing so, it addresses the child care crisis that existed before the pandemic even started and has only gotten worse since the pandemic. First of all, we make the Child Independent Care Tax Credit fully refundable and significantly more generous. This change will make the credit available to low-income families for the first time. It will also transform this credit into a meaningful subsidy for middle-class families who need childcare assistance now more than ever. We double the amount that workers can put into dependent care flexible spending accounts. We also allow families the flexibility to carry forward any unused amounts through the end of next year. This is going to help workers whose childcare spending has been disrupted by the pandemic. For families that need more immediate help with childcare costs than we can provide through the tax code, we triple funding for the childcare entitlement to states. This program provides guaranteed annual funding to support direct subsidies to families that need help paying for childcare. It also helps fund improvements in child care quality for all families. We created a 30% refundable payroll tax credit for employers who are doing right by their employees by paying for child care expenses. And we recognize that child care comes in many forms. That's why we include a provision that would allow employers of domestic workers to claim the employee retention tax credit for wages paid to workers unable to work during the pandemic. Child care and dependent care is particularly challenging for our essential workers. Our nation's health care workers, child care workers, emergency response workers, sanitation and transportation workers put themselves in harm's way on a daily basis for the good of their communities. We would provide direct funding to states to make sure these workers can find and pay for care for their loved ones. We also recognize that childcare providers have difficulty meeting their fixed costs as they have had to close or reduce their hours. So we create a 50% refundable payroll tax credit for certain fixed expenses of childcare facilities impacted by the pandemic. This would cover costs for things like rent, mortgages, and utility bills. And finally, I'm excited to say that we also include a targeted investment in infrastructure grants to fund important, important improvements and upgrades to child care facilities. Many of these facilities have been in desperate need of renovation for years and are now facing the huge cost 
of making changes in order to comply with new public health and safety rules. And just uh, in, in closing, I want to just remind my colleagues that we've had ha we have had child care hearings uh, during the pandemic in the Ways and Means Committee on June 23rd. We had a hearing on the Tax Cut and Jobs Act and how it neglected to improve child care and dependent care credit. And that hearing was on March 27th of 2019. We have had a committee markup where we marked up versions of the very improvements we made to the credit and the FSA contribution limits when we marked up HR 3300 on June 20th, 2019. We also marked up an increase on the child care entitlement to states at that same time on that day, even though that that was uh, pre-pandemic levels then. So we have had quite a bit of discussion. We have had hearings and we have had markups on all of these important issues. And for that reason, I urge my colleagues to support these measures and I yield back. I thank you all. I thank all uh, the members of the panel for your testimony. Um, and uh, let, let, me, let me just say, I, I support these uh, these bills. Um, we're in the middle of a pandemic. Uh, uh, if that's not an emergency, I don't know what is. I mean, these are being, you know, these are emergency measures. Uh, I mean, child care is essential. Uh, if we're going to get if people to go back to work, child care is essential and important and vital. Uh, so, um, you know, I strongly support both these measures and look forward to uh, voting for them on the House floor. Um, um, I, uh, Mr. Cole, do you have any questions you want to ask yourself? <laughs> no, I, uh, I I thought I was exceptionally persuasive, Mr. You Chairman. are, as, yeah. as you always are. Well, uh, uh, let me just do make the point one more time, though. I, look, I, I agree with all of my colleagues up here. This is an important topic. Uh, we're not going to get the economy back to where we want it to go without significant investments here. Uh, so, and we did some of that in the... Uh, uh, in the uh, CARES Act, and I'm certainly open to doing some more, but I think the appropriate place for it is elsewhere. That is a standalone supplemental as a portion of that. Uh, and I do think it's a bad precedent to bring bills, with all due respect to my good friend from California and uh, my classmate from California. It just, uh, you know, we ought to have a hearing on the bills. And uh, it, there's other people with good ideas. So to bring something straight to the Rules Committee with no hearing, in any of the committees of jurisdiction, I think, you know, something I know the majority, uh, at least at the beginning, they don't want to do, and I think genuinely does not want to do. Uh, and uh, I think, but moving them this way makes it less likely, and more likely to get to a result. So for that, uh, I'll continue to post both, both bills, but I'm very open to the idea of doing something together when that opportunity presents itself, probably in the next coronavirus supplemental. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Right, Ms. Torres. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, and, you know, I'm in California still. Good morning to everyone. Um, before I get started, I want to um, address Chairwoman Lowy um, as she's testifying before us today. I, once again, I want to take a moment to say how wonderful it has been serving under your leadership on the Appropriations Committee and on SFOBS. Uh, we've been fortunate to have your leadership, and I'm so grateful for your testimony here today as well. Uh, like so many of you, I've been honored to experience the joys of parenthood. Uh, my husband and I raised three incredible sons. They're grown men now, um, and we couldn't be more prouder of all of them. But let me tell you, raising a family when both parents have to work to pay the bills is extremely difficult. As a 911 dispatcher, I was fortunate to be able to work um, the graveyard shift um, just so I could be there for my sons during the day uh, to feed them breakfast, uh, to take them to school, and uh, to volunteer in their classrooms. Um, most days, I was completely exhausted. Um, I may have I may have been coming straight from home, uh, straight from work from after listening to very, very difficult and even tragic um, events unfolding in my ears. But no matter what my personal struggle, um, I was there uh, for my family. Countless of Americans now uh, know uh, these kinds of sacrifices firsthand. Um, I was lucky enough to uh, be able to change um, my hours and, and not work the same hours as my husband. The challenge is that 
my husband and I overcame balancing childcare needs. Um, the costs are nothing like the challenges that families are facing today in the midst of COVID-19. 4.5 million childcare slots slots are at risk of disappearing forever right now as a result of coronavirus. Um, Two thirds of all daycare um, centers have closed their doors, leaving families already struggling to get by in the midst of a pandemic with very few options to care for their children. Our lives literally depend on essential workers uh, to stock our shelves and keep our um, society stitched together but only one in five of those workers have been able to continue using childcare. At some point, childcare providers are among the hardest hit sectors in our uh, in the economic downturn with reduced enrollment and steep drop, drops in revenue. This must change. And I am glad that the bills uh, we are discussing today will do just that. The Child Care for in- Economic Recovery Act will help struggling families by among other things, many making the child care and dependent tax credit refundable, allowing many low and mid income families to access the credit uh, for for the very first time. And the child care is a, uh, the child care is essential act uh, will establish a 50 billion child care stabilization fund uh, to help ensure providers get through the downturn. Our ability to rebuild when coronavirus is finally behind us depends on our workers being able to find good childcare. The world has changed from coronavirus and we need to keep up and adjust. Ensuring safe childcare options is critical to economic recovery. And these bills will help us do exactly that. I'm proud to support them, Mr. Chairman, and I yield back. Thank you very much. Happy to yield to Mr. Woodall so we can grill Mr. Cole. So, yeah, I thank you, Mr. Chairman. If I thought Mr. Cole had any uh, input in drafting this legislation, I would absolutely grill him about the uh, the details of that. Uh, I, I know that uh, HR 7327 was referred to three committees, and I appreciate the Appropriations Committee and the Ways and Means Committee being represented. Uh, The third committee it was referred to was the Budget Committee on which I sit. Uh, We have not had any conversations about what uh, is uh, defined as uh, as emergency spending. And and as uh, we talk about another uh, COVID supplemental, of course, uh, there's emergency spending that needs to happen. But um, because I'm just seeing some of this language for the first time, let me ask, uh, and I suppose, Ms. Sanchez, it would be in, in, uh, in your uh, jurisdiction. When I'm thinking about the refundable portion of the of the child dependent care tax credit uh, changing, what it, what is the expiration date on that language? Um, to the best of my knowledge, there's not. I don't know. I don't know what the expiration date is. Yeah, I, I, I ask that because from a budget committee perspective, that kind of differentiates what's an emergency and what's just making uh, permanent law changes under the auspices of of an emergency. I, I know Ways and Means has a lot uh, that it is uh, that it is working on, and you can only spend each dollar once. I have no doubt that the Child Independent Care Tax Credit is an important use of those dollars. To make permanent law, though, under the under the the guise of an emergency is is a concern to me. Well, if, I'm, at, if I if please. I could if I could, I would just respond that there was um, there was a an emergency need for childcare prior to the pandemic that went unaddressed, and the pandemic has only accelerated that. Uh, it is a permanent change, but uh, it's because there is an ongoing childcare emergency that has been highlighted by coronavirus, but needs a permanent fix, and so therefore it's a permanent change. Well, I, I, the gentlelady makes uh, makes my point precisely. We talked earlier uh, on a. a uh, natural resources uh, bill about uh, maintenance needs that uh, were emergency needs that had been going on for decade upon upon decade. Uh, there are many needs that we that we have. The the new majority, in its wisdom, uh, said we are only going to move legislation in the absence of hearings and markups uh, if it is uh, emergency as defined under the Balanced Budget and Emergency Deficit Control Act, and and that has a unique 
uh, definition of emergency as opposed to, to to simply those priorities that I know we we can all identify. I, I'll give you an Under, example. Understood, but it, child care right now is an emergency, uh, it, and and it needs to be addressed now. If your you know hesitation is that it's a permanent change, you know that's something that we can discuss after the emergency has has bypassed us. Um, if you want a sunset, if you find a a time when childcare is no longer an emergency, then then we can find a way to claw that back. But there is currently a childcare emergency, and I would just say, you know, with all due respect, if you don't have children under eighteen and you're not having to deal with this as a working parent, which I am, and I know most of my constituents are dealing with this issue, it is an emergency and it needs to be addressed. And to say, well, because you know, it, we're going to quibble over the word of what an emergency is, that therefore it's it's unworthy of our attention, I, I just think is out of out of step with reality, the reality for most American families. Well, I, I appreciate the gentle lady's uh, passion. Um, I would tell you if she sat on the budget committee instead of the Ways and Means Committee, she would view these, these issues uh, differently. And if she is concerned about addressing an emergency, uh, then as we did with the with the uh, Paycheck Protection Act, as we did with unemployment, as we did with everything that's an emergency. We did it for a finite period of time, hoping that the emergency would resolve itself. If the emergency does not resolve itself, as it has not, we extend those programs for a finite period of time to suggest that you have a policy priority that's been a priority of yours for years, and that this is the time to make it uh, to make it permanent law. I, I don't. I don't. Uh, uh, question your motives. I, I just I just recognize that is not committee. what the Serving emergency the deficit committee. control act was intended to. Uh, Serving to, on the budget to committee, uh, I'm sure that you voted for tax cuts for the wealthiest Americans when they really didn't have a tax emergency. That didn't seem to be a, you know, that still seemed to be a big priority of yours. And those tax cuts were permanent. They didn't solve any emergency, and yet you're saying that child care just isn't a priority because it's not an emergency. And I, 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 fundamentally, I, I think again that you are out of step with the reality of most most American families. Well, we we, we, we don't know each other. Uh, we don't know each other well, and so I I, I will I will uh, I will overlook those those inferences. Um, my school district uh, back home uh, is opening up on August fifteenth. Uh, right. In fact, the two districts uh, that I represent are both uh, opening up. And they are two of the only districts that are opening up in Metro Atlanta. Everyone else is staying closed. Uh, now, I'd like to have some hearings on what we can do to help school districts open up because I know they provide not just vital education, not just vital socialization, but also a vital assistant to working parents uh, who need their children to be in a safe and productive uh, environment. Uh, what you are doing in these bills, I am not uh, employers re and reclaiming my time, Ms. Sanchez, reclaiming they, my time. Unless they know still that they reclaiming my time, uh, continuing uh, to reclaim my time. Can I ask everybody to suspend? Um, somebody is we're tra transcribing this as well, so I just want to make sure that we don't speak over each other. So, uh, Mr. Woodall, you have the time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The, uh, there's a, a provision that allows for a domestic worker uh, tax credit that I don't understand and I'm hoping someone can uh, explain to me. It's uh, section 407A and it expands uh, the definition of a, of, a, of, uh, of a section 2301 of the CARES Act that provided a, an employee retention uh, credit. It says, um, in the case of an employer with one or more employees who perform domestic service in a private home of such employer, uh, they now qualify for the tax credit. It, it, could someone explain to me what the what the practical impact of that is? It, it sounds like everybody who employs uh, a uh, a domestic worker in their home is now going to be receiving a government subsidy uh, for up to half the salary of that uh, of that worker. And I just want to make sure that I understand. Again, I don't see expiration dates on this, so this seems like a, uh, uh, well, there is an expiration date in the CARES Act, but not in this uh, in this one specifically. I want to make sure that, that uh, uh, because as Ms. Sanchez just pointed out, uh, the public is very hostile towards uh, well, if you want to let me going to, the, that question, to the very, very wealthy, like and so I want to make sure that the folks who are uh, it, it, 
who are going to benefit from these uh, provisions are in fact the working families that we've discussed earlier and, and not the uber wealthy. Ms. Sanchez? But allow me to, to address that. Um, happy to recognize it's a that. provision that is meant to help domestic workers who have been impacted by COVID-19. It is, that's, it's a provision that would allow the employers of domestic workers to claim the employee retention tax credit for wages paid to the workers who are unable to work to the pandemic. It helps domestic workers. Um, and it's if they're paying for those domestic workers while the domestic workers cannot work. It only applies if employers pay them not to work for safety reasons, much in the way that the PPP program for small businesses allowed employers to borrow money so that they could keep employees on their payroll and continue to pay them even though, for example, a restaurant was closed down and somebody couldn't work because of stay-at-home orders. So it's a similar provision. It only applies to domestic workers who, for safety reasons, cannot come into work, but whose uh, family, employing families continue to keep them on payroll. The, I thank the gentlelady. That, that's actually my, my question. It, it only adds domestic worker to the definitions that were already laid out in the CARES Act for this uh, this 50% uh, credit. These are for folks that there is uh, there's you can, you either qualify for for the paycheck protection uh, program or you qualify for the for the 50% uh, retention uh, credit, uh, but uh, cannot uh, qualify for for both. Is that is that the correct understanding? It only applies if there is a stay-at-home order barring their work. If that's helpful. They, they, I am very uh, uh, cautiously optimistic about uh, getting our schools back uh, in session. I hear from the same parents that each and every one of you uh, hear from uh, who are trying to balance their, their, uh, their parenting needs and their employment uh, needs. Uh, we sent out a, a, uh, an option to say parents can either send their kids back to school or they can can go to school at home. About 60% of our families uh, chose to send their kids back to, uh, back to school. And I have no doubt that uh, their need to, to be at work and have their children uh, in, a, in a safe and productive environment is a, is a major uh, factor there. Um, these bills that we are deeming an emergency uh, today deal primarily with the younger uh, uh, children and needs outside of the school setting. I very much hope, because I know schools are struggling all across the district with these, all across the country with these decisions, that we will be back uh, with uh, language uh, that helps uh, those communities that are that are trying to do this uh, again in the way that parents have come to, to know and trust uh, over over many many years. With that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Perlmutter. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chair. I thought about wading in and protecting and defending my friend, Ms. Sanchez, from the withering cross-examination of Mr. Woodall, but I think she acquitted herself very well and doesn't need any help. So I just will the want gentleman to thank... yield? Will the gentleman yield for 30 seconds? Gentleman will yield for 30 seconds, yes. Thank you. I just want to re-emphasize in that last question that I was asked that domestic workers can't get PPP. They're not eligible for PPP. Um, and that's why this provision was included. And just once again, in response to the question about whether or not this is an emergency or not, I'm just going to say this very bluntly. You know, if we want our economy to be health, healthy again, employers and workers need to know that they will have child care for the long term if they are going back to work. And many of them will choose not to go back to work if that child care piece is not in place. So it absolutely is an emergency to get our economy going that we put these pieces of child care in place. Thank you, Mr. Perlmutter, for your indulgence. Thank you. And I want to thank uh, our appropriations uh, chairs and speakers uh, for their testimony. With that, I yield back to the chair. Thank you very much, Dr. Burgess. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I have no additional questions. Thank you. Um, uh, okay, Ms. Scan uh, yes. Ms. Ms. Scanlon, okay. <laughs> okay, I, I just want to thank our chairs for their work on this. It's, it's so important and, and certainly it's something we're hearing about every day from, from our constituents, people very concerned about 
um, how to address the needs of their children and then the child care workers as well being concerned about how to move forward. So I just want to thank them for the work and I yield back. Thank you, Ms. Lesko. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This is a really important issue and it should be addressed. Uh, child care is very vital uh, for working parents. And uh, the, the, the thing is, is I share the same concerns that Mr. Cole does, and it would have been more appropriate to go through a regular committee markup so that everybody's ideas could be discussed in an open uh, hearing on the specific bills. Uh, and I also uh, agree with Mr. Woodall that opening schools is related to this issue. Uh, here in Arizona, we're going through, the school districts are going through this decision now, and I've been encouraging uh, the school district elected school board members to give parents the option to send their children to in-person schooling. Uh, and just as Mr. Woodell said, uh, that person of his students uh, chose to go in person, we have done polling in my congressional districts which is the same, about 66% of the parents want to send their children in person. And um, so I think that's really a key part of it. Uh, but because it's a great issue, I wanna get involved in it, but can't, can't support this bill because it didn't go through regular committee uh, markup. And with that, I yield back. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Shalala. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank uh, Chairwoman Nita Lowy and uh, uh, Chairwoman uh, Rosie DeLora and Representative Sanchez uh, for their presentations. This, these are very important bills. We can't go back to work. A half million kids um, in Florida are affected uh, by these bills. And I don't I don't know whether we're recognizing that childcare centers are not going to be able to open up in my community if they have to take the same number of children that they've taken before for safety reasons. Um, they're going to have almost twice the cost that they've had before. Um, and uh, therefore the bills are absolutely critical. I do want to ask a question um, though to particularly Chairwoman uh, Delora and uh, Representative Sanchez, it, it seems to me that this pandemic, which is going to go on for a while, may change the course of childcare. We may be talking about more home-based childcare than institutional childcare. And I don't know whether these bills, because I haven't actually read the bills, I've read the summaries of the bills and the major portions, actually uh, speak to that. And of course, I come from a heavily Hispanic area that has always um, had a large number of children that are kept at a relative's home for the other members of the family. Uh, I'd be happy to respond to my colleagues. Thank you all very, very much. Uh, with regard to the essential uh, child care bill, which is an emergency bill, uh, and it is $50 billion. And in fact, what we do is to ensure that the grants are awarded uh, across various child care centers. Understanding uh, that home-based child care uh, is, is critically important. Uh, I think you are right about where we go with regard to child care. I think one thing is very, very clear, and this is certainly not, um, uh, not something that we have made up uh, uh, here. 11% of the U.S. workforce take care of young kids on their own, unlikely to return full time until schools and daycares fully reopen. The fact of the matter is, is that schools are only going to reopen when their families believe that these children are going to be in safe quarters. They may say, yes, I want to send my kid back. And then when they get there, there's no PPE, there's no plexiglass, there's no uh, uh, social distancing, none of those things, no parent, no parent is going to send their child into an unsafe place. We make accommodations for all kinds of settings in this emergency bill. It's $50 billion for this emergency, right? I just have one more thing to say is, you know, um, if you didn't vote for the HEROES bill, then you didn't vote to remove 
170 billion dollars in a tax credit that goes to 43,000 people, 1.6 million dollars, never went through any committee. In addition to which, uh, it goes back to 2018, 2019, and no one ever talked about a coronavirus there. If we do not provide childcare and help this industry in all of its settings, we are not going to get uh, our economy back in place. Parents, your, your instinct, protect your kids. That is fundamental. And if you cannot protect your kids, it's too bad. You know, they're not coming back. Thank could you. I, could I add um, also to that question about um, child care in the home? The child and dependent care credit allows expenses for home-based child care. So there, there, there are provisions for people who have home-based child care. And for those that want their children to go back to a child care facility, you know, it's simply going to be more expensive for child care facilities because it's going to require different infrastructure and more staff. And this also helps with those improvements. Um, and it, Rosa nailed nailed it on the head. And Ms. Lesko said, parents, you know, you pull parents, of course they want their kids to go back to school, that they want their kids to go back to school and child care if it's safe. And we cannot have that safety if we don't have infrastructure improvements. And this bill allows for that. So um, they're very important pieces of legislation. And I appreciate your interest in them. I yield back. Thank you. Thank you very much. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Ms. Matsui. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I want to thank all the uh, witnesses for testifying today. And I especially want to give a shout out to Chairwoman Lowy, who has been a dear friend of mine for many, many years. Um, thank you for your stewardship. It's a, a compassionate stewardship that you've had. I, the, the thing about the Appropriations Committee, it goes from the community all up to the country and to the world. And you've done it all. And thank you so much. Uh, we're going to miss you. Thank you. Well, I don't know if I'm allowed to say thank you to you. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Am I on, uh, can you yeah. hear me, Mr. Chairman? Yes, we can. Okay, I just wanna not only thank Doris Matsui, but thank all of you today who testified. Look, for me, it's very, very clear. Our economy cannot recover until people can safely return to work and people simply cannot return to their jobs if they're unable to find care for their children. And part of finding child, child care today means making sure it is safe for the children and the staff who care for them. So this is one of the many issues, my dear friend Doris, that I've been working on. And I wanna thank all who have testified today uh, for the importance of child care. We have got to take care of our children. That is a top priority. And thank you, my dear friend. It's been such an honor for me to serve with every one of you, even with those with whom I may disagree. <laughs> Tom, Tom Cole and I have, and I must say Tom Cole and I, I know where he is in his heart. We've been working together a very, very long time. So no matter which side of the aisle, this is an important issue. We've got to take care of our children. Thank you again, Doris. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And you know, with that, I think um, Chairwoman Lowy has said it all, and I, I'm not going to say any more. So thank you very much. Thank you. I yield back. Well, thank you very much. And um, you know, and um, you know, let me. I, I want to add to all the praise of uh, Chairwoman Lowy, but I'm not going to go into any detail today because uh, the way this place works, you're going to be back before the Rules Committee at least another thousand times before the year is out. So. Uh, uh, <laughs> So it's always great to see you. Um, and to you, Mr. Chair. <laughs> thank you. Uh, does any other member of the committee wish to ask a question? Hearing none, I, uh, I would like to thank our witnesses for their testimony. Uh, and you are now excused. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank um, you.
So at this time, uh, we will hear from additional members wishing to testify on Senate Amendment to H.R. 1957, H.R. 6395, H.R. 7027, and H.R. 7327. Uh, and so uh, the, the first panel I'm going to call is uh, Mr. Wenstrup, Ms. Titus, Ms. Jackson Lee, uh, Mr. Olson, uh, Mr. Mike Johnson, uh, and Ms. Gonzalez Colon. So I want to thank you for providing testimony today. Any written materials you submit to rules.document.mail.house.gov before the conclusion of this hearing will, without objection, be entered into the record. Uh, now I would like to, uh, uh, so without objection, uh, yeah, uh, before I recognize our first witness, without objection, I'd also like to submit for the record state statements from Mr. Hastings, Ms. Holland, Mr. Ms. Johnson, Mr. Heck, Mr. Pocan, Mr. Sublime, and Mr. Stanton. Uh, so at this point, uh, I would like to recognize the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Wenstrom. Uh, and let me just urge everybody to, to mute, uh, other than the... Uh, person who is testifying because then it all echoes otherwise. So, uh, Mr. Wenstrup, uh, welcome back. <laughs> Thank you. Hopefully, uh, this new technique of using the phone, you can hear me better. You may not see me well, but hopefully you can hear me well. You, you sound good. Okay. Thank you. Chairman McGovern, Ranking Member Cole, members of this committee, thank you for allowing me to testify today on my three amendments, uh, numbered uh, 450, 507, and 403 to the fiscal year 2021 NDAA. My first amendment, number 450, uh, involves the ready reserves, and it seeks to help fix a glaring vulnerability to our combat ready wartime mission requirements. A major shortage in critical specialty military occupational specialties, which is occurring right now within our ready reserves. I'll give you a couple examples. Currently, the Army Reserve has only filled 21% of its general surgeon position and just 7% of its orthopedic surgeon slot. The Army Reserve's Electronic Missile Systems Maintenance Officer is at 0% staff. The Navy Reserve has staffed just 29% of its information system technicians for submarines. The Marine Corps Reserve has only filled 19% of light armored reconnaissance unit leader positions. And this list, of MOSs facing critical shortages can go on and on. But this isn't because of a lack of funding or necessarily a shortage of existing doctors and other special, specialized, specialists in these needed fields. It's because, in part, current law financially disincentivizes service members facing retirement from choosing to transition to the ready reserve. And we can help address these shortages by tapping into the large resource of already trained active duty service members, such as physicians, for example, if we fix these incentives. So right now, when an active duty service member completes their 20 years of service, they're eligible to retire and start receiving their retirement payment, the pension, the pension that they have earned with their 20 years of service. Now, many of them choose to retire rather than join, and rather than join the reserves as well, because in most cases, their pension is more than their reserve pay, and current law prevents them from receiving both. So my men makes a simple change to that statute for these critical specialty MOSs, that we allow highly trained retiring service members who otherwise fit all criteria, who are found by a service secretary to possess a skill that is facing a critical shortage of personnel. It allows them to receive their pension, which anyone can get after their years of service and before they go to the private sector and their reserve pay if they choose to, re to join the reserves. So it's worth noting that under my amendment, such a service member would not be eligible for increased retirement pay due to the additional years of service until the age of 60 and retirement from the reserve, the age at which reservists can receive their pension benefits from retired. So it's not accumulating as they go as a reservist only when they retire. So at the end of the day, my amendment makes a small change to law that will make a big difference in filling shortages in our ready reserve and, and it will serve to strengthen our overall military readiness with well-trained personnel. My amendment is also paid for with two funding streams, which I'm happy to discuss in greater length if members have questions. 
My second amendment, number 507, seeks to help us identify deficiencies in the most critical parts of our military medical supply chain by ensuring we get the most important step right, gathering precise targeted data. The, rep the report created by my amendment is necessary because it will help us pinpoint a very specific issue and gather data that is very focused on understanding a targeted problem. In turn, this data can help inform future decision-making by Congress the administration and manufacturers. In this particular case, we want to look specifically at vulnerabilities within the Joint Deployment Formulary, or JDF. And this is a list of all the drugs, vaccines, and biological products that a service member will need within the first 30 days of a deployment. Now, keep in mind that JDF is just a small subset of all the items needed within the world of military medicine. So of the items listed on the JDF, 310 drugs and vaccines are deemed to be critical. And of those 310, roughly 57 are entirely foreign made. You know, when I served in Iraq as a surgeon, I'd have been really dismayed to know that our critical supplies and pharmaceuticals were made by our adversary. And I know I'm not alone in those sentiments, and I think most people would agree with that. So to begin with fixing this problem, we need to first start with proper data collection, which is all my amendment seeks to accomplish. It requires the Secretary of Defense in consultation with the Secretary of HHS, the FDA commissioner, and heads of other relevant federal agencies to submit a report that identifies the drugs and vaccines on the JDF, the active pharmaceutical ingredients and components of those ingredients in those drugs and vaccines, the country of origin of those ingredients down to the component level. Uh, the manufacturers that are owned in whole or in part by foreign entities. Any barriers to DOD procuring its supply of those drugs and vaccines, including identifying existing US barriers and domestic raw material availability. Any military partners or allies who could help manufacture components or materials. An assessment of how the defense secretary is working to mitigate any shortage of these critical drugs and vaccines, efforts which we are seeing taking place right now. A description of how the defense secretary currently coordinates with other federal agencies. And if any of that information is unobtainable, identifying the barriers to obtaining that information. I think we've all learned uh, through COVID why this is important. So the amendment requires the report to be submitted to the House and Senate Defense Committees, the Energy and Commerce and Senate Health Committees, and any other committees the Defense Secretary deems necessary. It will be a classified report with an unclassified public summary. We can't make good decisions without good data, and this amendment ultimately provides the building blocks upon which we can develop good public policy. And finally, my third amendment, number 403, seeks to improve the report requirements in Section 712 of this NDAA. The existing report looks at all DOD drugs, vaccines, and biological products and critical medical supplies. My amendment expands the report into two areas that I think are important. First, it requires the Defense Secretary to also include an analysis of any existing barriers within our federal regulatory regime to manufacturing these items in the United States and whether the raw materials necessary to make these items can be found in the United States. It does no good if we identify issues in our supply chains but don't know of the regulations within our own government that may prevent us from manufacturing critical supplies here. And it may be for good reasons. For example, uh, some reasons may come up. Some items might require raw materials that don't comply with existing EPA or or DOT regulations, and identifying these barriers, I think, is critical to solving the overall equation. And as second, my amendment requires the Defense Secretary to identify any potential partners that the United States can work with to realign our manufacturing capabilities for drugs, biological products, vaccines, and critical medical supplies. In an ideal world, we manufacture everything here in the United States. Unfortunately, that's not the world we live in today for a myriad of reasons, including in some cases, the lack of resources, domestic raw material availability. Therefore, if we have to buy something from another country, then we should buy it from an ally, not an adversary, especially when it comes to our national defense and our national health defense. The provision of my amendment would help us reduce our reliance on, on, on countries like China 
And again, a lesson we're learning the hard way right now during this pandemic. So as Michael Wessel, Commissioner of the US-China Economic and Security Review Commission, warned in his testimony before the Energy and Commerce Health Subcommittee last October, our ability to meet the needs of our war fighters could be constrained by China in the event of a conflict, or as with China's decision to threaten the supply of rear earth materials to Japan several years ago, China could weaponize its position in the supply chain to our disadvantage and peril. So let's not allow our adversaries to dictate the safety and readiness of our service members and our country. Uh, in conclusion, I just wanna thank you for your attention and I ask that you rule my amendments 450, 507, and 403 in order, and I look forward to answering any of your questions at the appropriate time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Titus. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Cole, members of the committee. I appreciate this opportunity to testify this morning from Las Vegas, where it's been 115 degrees. I want to focus my comments on three amendments, McAdams 29, Horsford 342, and Titus 646. I'm proud to join my colleague, Representative McAdams, and you, Mr. Chairman, as a co-sponsor of Amendment 29, which would prohibit explosive nuclear weapons testing. Yesterday, we marked the 75th anniversary of the Trinity test. That was the first atomic test to occur in the United States. Years of explosive tests in the air and underground followed, which included over 900 blasts just north of Las Vegas, where visitors and residents could take a picnic lunch and watch mushroom clouds rise over the desert. This effort was critical to our winning the Cold War, but afterwards we have come to learn that these explosive tests contributed to cancers and premature deaths of tens of thousands of Americans. They were test site workers, soldiers who did war games during the blast and downwinders as well as our tribal brothers and sisters across the West and even into the Great Plains. Nuclear weapons testing with yield ended in the 1990s. And over the years, the, the, during the last decade, the Department of Energy has instead used sophisticated technology to certify that our nuclear stockpile is safe, reliable, and secure. They do this without conducting explosive tests with yield. And they have admitted that these engineered tests provide much better information than the actual explosions did. Yet the Trump administration is reportedly considering asking Nevadans to put themselves in harm's way once again for an unjustified experiment that makes our country less secure. The resumption of explosive testing in the United States could restart a nuclear arms war with Russia and China. There is simply no technical or geopolitical reason to return to such a policy. So I urge the committee to make Amendment 29 in order for consideration. I next want to speak about Amendment 342, which is offered by myself along with Nevada Representatives Horsford and Lee. This amendment makes critical improvements to language adopted in the Armed Services Committee that significantly alters the management and protection of over 840,000 acres of the Desert National Wildlife Refuge. This is the largest one of the oldest refuges in the lower 48 states. It was set aside for protection in 1936. Years later, certain Air Force operations were authorized through military land withdrawals. Well, the current withdrawal is set to expire next year. During the committee's markup, an amendment was offered and accepted without any knowledge of the, uh, the position of the Nevada delegation. This amendment would end the nearly nine decades long management of these refuge lands and directly threaten the unique flora and fauna of the region, including the longhorn sheep along with cultural resources of tribes that have been in the region for centuries. Amendment 342 represents a path that ensures military readiness, provides for continued management of the refuge by U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and addresses concerns raised by conservationists, sovereign tribal governments, all about the lack of access to and protection of natural and cultural resources. We have worked with the committees of jurisdiction on both the majority and minority sides 
to develop the language before you, and I urge the committee to make it in order. Last, I'd like to speak to Amendment 646, offered by myself and Representative Ami Barra, to strengthen the cooperative threat reduction programs and efforts to prevent, detect, counter, and respond to threats of weapons of mass destruction through terrorist acts. Keeping nuclear, radiological, biological, and chemical weapons out of the hands of terrorists requires global cooperation. We can't do it alone by safeguarding only our materials. This amendment expresses the importance of diplomatic outreach, threat reduction programs, and export controls to accomplish our national security objective of preventing and countering threats of weapons of mass destruction through terrorist acts. The amendment will help us assess the threat landscape and current risk related to weapons of mass destruction and ensure our strategies and programs advance the mission of reducing this threat and be sure that they are complementary across the U.S. government. It's a reporting kind of transparency, informational type of amendment. I thank the Foreign Affairs and Armed Services Committee for working with me on this language. And with that, I hope you will consider this amendment along with the other two. And again, I thank you for giving me this opportunity to testify. Happy to answer any questions. Well, thank you very much. And I now yield to Ms. Jackson Lee. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And thank you to all of the uh, members of the Rules Committee. You're doing tough work. And if I might, I want to make sure that I thank uh, um, uh, the Chairwoman of the uh, Appropriations Committee for enormous leadership and all of the Cardinals and certainly the Chair of the NDAA. These are important moments in our history. Uh, just for the record, uh, let me acknowledge that uh, we're in the epicenter here in Houston, Texas. Recent numbers of 75,000 confirmed numbers and almost 3,000 uh, cases uh, recently in the last 24 hours, uh, and now uh, 717 deaths. Some of the amendments that I'll speak about refers to fighting COVID-19. Uh, but at the same time, I think it is important to recognize the heavy reliance that in COVID-19, uh, that much of our governance and our interactions are cyber related. Uh, my amendment uh, deals uh, with uh, the uh, implementation and recommendation of the Cyberspace Solarium Commission to require the Secretary of Homeland Security to develop a strategy to implement domain-based message authentication, reporting, conformance, DMARC standard across U.S.-based email providers. In a hearing that we just uh, were able to engage in, we spoke specifically about the invasion of the Twitter accounts of some of our well-known uh, leaders. Uh, that may come about or have come about through phishing. Our email system is not secure. I'm delighted to have uh, as co-sponsors Congressman Langevin, Gallagher. Uh, Gallagher was, of course, a co-chair of the Solarium Commission, CATCO, uh, as well as uh, Bishop, Sanford Bishop, uh, Congressman uh, Carson, Joyce, and John. Uh, this, uh, I believe, amendment is crucial for the natural disasters that we may be experiencing in the future. That is Amendment 604. Amendment 673 directs the Secretary of Defense to report to Congress in not less than 180 days the results of its evaluation as to the extent, if any, of the threat to national security posed by domestic terrorist groups and organizations motivated by a belief a system of white supremacy such as the Proud Boys and Boogaloo. I've been studying this for a while and asked for a hearing in the Homeland Security Committee, of which we did in the last 24 hours. My concern is that as a nation moves toward a historic national election, the activity of violence influences like Boogaloo Boys or Proud Boys will increase and lead to attacks becoming more frequent. Uh, sadly, we are aware of the fact of two incidences uh, in California where these groups were responsible for the killing of law enforcement officers. In the midst of peaceful protesters uh, that are responding to the killing of George Floyd, we want America to be a democracy where everybody can be heard. My amendment, and so I ask for support of Amendment 673. 676, a Jackson Lee Amendment, provides for authorization of the increase in uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, which is being uh, provoked in many instances in our veterans by COVID-19. Many of our veterans have secured COVID-19, and so I'd ask for consideration of that amendment, which I've introduced every year because of my commitment uh, to our uh, veterans here in our area and in the nation. Uh, we also have an amendment uh, that deals with 
a work that I did last year on eliminating discrimination for those who have uh, particular challenges that would not eliminate them from the military, uh, but would in fact um, need extra support uh, for those who are in military academies. If you've accepted into a military academy, you should have the best opportunity for succeeding. This amendment particularly focuses on stuttering and provides for screening tests and a list of warfare unrestricted uh, URL positions and occupation specialists uh, that would assist that academy graduate in being able to serve his or her country. 682 was passed last year in NDAA, and I would appreciate it being able to be supported going forward. We made great strides in recognizing that there are some monuments and some uh, various uh, significant uh, evidences of the Confederacy that don't reflect all of America. In fact, the Confederacy were treasonous since they were challenging the unity of our nation. That work has already been done. But my amendment number 683, which has secured the support of Congressman Benny Thompson, who led on the Confederate statute amendment, uh, Congressman Clay, Meeks, uh, McEachin, Vesey, Bishop, Sanford, Carson, and Hayes, directs the Secretary of Defense to report on the number of military bases and installations and facilities that are named after African Americans and directs each secretary responsible for a branch of the military to establish a review process to consider the naming of military installations and covered defense property under the jurisdiction of the secretary after African Americans who served in armed forces with honor, heroism, and distinction. I will not go through the entire list, uh, but I'm very proud to say that is not a short list. Uh, I believe this will not be onerous or burdensome on our defense. I think they would welcome him, such as General Roscoe Robinson, 1951 graduate of West Point. Lieutenant Colonel Charity Edna Williams uh, was appointed to lead the African American Women's Army Corps. Part of the Triple Eight, 1964, Lieutenant Colonel Margaret E. Bailey. And then, of course, the famous Dory Miller Messerman, first class admiral uh, who was in World War II, never received a medal, uh, and got on the battleship during Pearl Harbor and served, saved many, many lives. So I'd ask consideration of amendment number 683. And I'd ask consideration of amendment 687 as a breast cancer survivor. It provides authorization for a $10 million increase in funding for increased collaboration with NIH uh, to combat triple negative breast cancer. Triple negative breast cancer is the most deadly form of breast cancer uh, that uh, particularly um, targets uh, African-American women and Hispanic women uh, mostly, and that would impact women in the United States military. We're very glad that there's a women's clinic that has been designed, and this would fit very nicely there. The last amendment is 697. Uh, and as I started out by indicating to you, uh, the number of cases uh, here in Texas now are 310,000. Uh, last 24 hours, we've had 10,291 new cases, 3,728 deaths. We're asking that the National Guard, the Secretary of Defense, continue to extend the National Guard's participation in COVID-19 testing of civilians by local and state efforts until local and state and federal public health authorities report that testing is no longer needed. I can assure you that we are desperate for testing here, particularly in Hispanic and African-American neighborhoods. I have been able to work with uh, and establish 17 testing sites uh, we will open two more tomorrow on Saturday uh, that will last for a day. We're trying to make sure that we hit almost every neighborhood. That is very important to continue to have the National Guard. They've been excellent, uh, and they have been vital in helping to save lives here in Houston, Texas. I'd ask my colleagues uh, to consider uh, these amendments as very vital to the work that we're doing. Uh, and I continue to thank the leadership and the head of the NDAA committee for their leadership as well. I thank you, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you very much, Mr. Olson. Chairman McGovern, Ranking Member Cole, distinguished committee members, thank you for allowing me to speak very briefly on one amendment, Amendment 440. My amendment deals with a very small amount of radioactive material waste like Abaricium 241. This waste is used in smoke detectors and the oil and gas industry for down hole logging. Because the industry needs a safe way to dispose of these used nuclear waste materials, in 1979, Congress told the National Nuclear Security Administration, the NNSA, within the Department of Energy to collect and bring this waste to a site 
in New Mexico. It's called the Waste Isolation Pilot Plant, the WIPP. It started accepting this waste in 1998. Sadly, the 2005 NDAA allowed only domestic radioactive waste from U.S. mines to be stored in the WIPP. That created a small glitch, a very small portion of Mericium 241 is in our country was mined overseas. This is identical waste material with the same elements, the same half-life of 432.2 years, the same link to bone cancer, used the exact same ways by the same companies here in America. Yet, this waste is left unprotected. In our world of global terror, this can be very, very dangerous. Congress has a duty to provide safety and security to the American people. Sadly, in this instance, we have failed them. According to the DOE, states like Massachusetts, New York, California, Texas, North Carolina, and even New Mexico have small containers of spent nuclear material waiting in their industrial parks for a secure storage solution. My own town of Sugarland, Texas, found out the hard way these facts. A small spill of Mericium 241 occurred less than a mile from my son's high school. It was contained, but the waste still sits as it sat four years ago. It was mined overseas, and that's why it can't be moved. This amendment strengthens our national security. The NNSA says the lack of security means some of these materials may be material used for a dirty bomb. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention state that Americium 241 in powdered form or dust form can cause, as I mentioned, bone cancer. And that's why DOE asked us, Congress, to fix this problem. More importantly, it's an easy, small fix. Bringing this extra material, identical fuel to the WIPP in New Mexico, would add an extra six cubic meters per year to the WIPP. That's 0.001% of their capacity. I understand the concerns of my colleagues from New Mexico that this tight amount of waste sent to the WIPP, but that does not increase their risk for their state. It's already there at must, much more robust levels. But leaving stuff unprotected locations all across America leaves our country at risk. And that's why I, represent Ford Barry from Nebraska and a bipartisan group of sponsors, support Amendment 440. And one final very important fact, this is not a Yucca Mountain issue. Yucca Mountain is for the storage of the massive waste from nuclear power plants. This amendment only addresses small amounts of waste from weapons production. I'll close by thanking Chairman McGovern, Ranking Member Cole, and all the members of the committee and their staff for the hard work and endless battles with technology to allow me and my colleagues to make our work product better. This amendment does just that. And finally, I guarantee Chairman McGovern that my staff has done some strong, serious research. No investor employee or new quarterback of the Tampa Bay Buccaneers benefits from my amendment. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Um, that's good to know. Um, I now yield to uh, Mr. Johnson. Any comments he wishes to make? Thank you, Chairman McGovern and Ranking Member Cole and members of the committee. I I appreciate the opportunity to testify before you today about amendments I filed to this year's NDAA. I, I want to say at the outset that it is so appropriate that the bill has been named for ranking member Thornberry, and I appreciate all the comments that you've all made this morning about that. He, he'll be sorely missed in the Congress, and I will be expeditious as you challenge us at the beginning of the morning, um, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my district is home to two critically important military installations at Sparks Hill Air Force Base in Bossier City, Louisiana, and Fort Polk uh, in Leesville, Louisiana. I'm thankful to the Armed Services Committee for including a number of priorities for these installations in the base text of the bill, 
including a much needed increased authorization for the construction of a new entrance gate at Barksdale. But I'd like to briefly bring up just a couple of amendments that I believe would improve the underlying bill. First, I filed an amendment that would be mutually beneficial for Barksdale and the Air Force as the Department of Defense carries out its 5G testing program that was authorized last year. Barksdale has the necessary infrastructure in place to be an ideal installation for this critical program. For example, the base has access to a wide variety of spectrum bands, fiber and wireless infrastructure, and adequate test range access. My amendment would simply require the secretary to consider Barksdale as a candidate for the 5G testing program. Second, I filed an amendment uh, acknowledging the importance of the work conducted at Barksdale and Fort Polk. Barksdale is home to the Air Force Global Strike Command, including the second bomber wing, which houses three squadrons of B-52 Strata Fortress bombers, the 11th Bomb Squadron, which focuses on training, and the 20th and 96th Bomb Squadrons. These men and women are a critical element of our ability to deter our enemies, obviously, and if necessary, respond rapidly to their aggression. This is the ability that the U.S. has to project force around the world, and that's what makes us the great military power we are. The Fort Polk, uh, Fort Polk Joint Readiness Training Center is one of only two Army readiness training centers in the country, and the activities conducted there guarantee that our soldiers are fully prepared and equipped for battle. I believe it's only appropriate that we acknowledge these installations for their contributions to our national defense in this year's NDAA. I've also offered a number of other amendments, many of which are bipartisan and will not be controversial, and, and they're intended to counter the Chinese and Russian aggression that we've seen uh, uh, so much in recent days and to promote religious liberty and freedom throughout the world. In the interest of time, I'll forego speaking on those individually. Just want to thank the committee for all your hard work, your time and investment on behalf of the American people and for the opportunity to appear before you today. And I yield back. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate it. And, uh, and Ms. Gonzalez-Colón. Can you hear me now? We can hear you. Yep. Thank you, Chairman McGovern, Ranking Member Cole, and all committee members for the opportunity to testify on four of my amendments to H.R. Uh, 6395. My first amendment is going to be Amendment 98 uh, to express the support for the designation of the National Brinkineers Day. The 65th uh, Infantry Regiment, uh, also know as, uh, known as the Brinkineers, uh, began as a military unit of volunteers consisting mostly of soldiers from Puerto Rico. Uh, and they were fighting as the last segregated unit uh, in the nation until 1952. Uh, the Marine served in combat operations during World War II, uh, and they were suffered, they suffered uh, great casualties defending against enemy attacks. Uh, it was during the Korean War that this uh, 55th uh, Infantry Regiment patriotism and courage came uh, to be widely known and admired as the unit played a central role in several important offensive and counter-offensive operations. Uh, the Brinkineers not only fought the enemy on the battlefield, but they also had to overcome uh, negative stereoty stereotypes uh, held by some of their commanders and fellow soldiers. Uh, on April of 2016, uh, Congress awarded the Congressional Gold Medal to the 50, uh, 65th Infantry Regiment in recognition of the Borinkineers, uh, numerous contributions to American history, outstanding military service from uh, World War I, throughout the recent conflicts in Afghanistan and Iraq. Uh, they became the first Hispanic unit uh, and the sole unit from the Korean War to receive uh, this distinction. And they were the last unit also to launch uh, a battalion-sized bayonet attack uh, by the U.S. Army. Um, as a member representing Puerto Rico in Congress, I'm extremely proud of the service and sacrifice of the Borinqueneers, who without ever voting for their commander in chief, just as service members of the island do now, uh, they selflessly gave their service and sometimes the ultimate sacrifice uh, for what our country represents. Uh, so I ask that we continue to honor them uh, with that amendment. Uh, the, the, the next amendment, the Bipartisan Amendment uh, 171, uh, create a five-year pilot program that extends Striker Prime to all eligible uh, beneficiaries uh, in the eastern region of Puerto Rico. Additionally, the amendment requires the DOD uh, to submit a report that reviews relevant data, uh, including cost, beneficiary satisfaction, and the feasibility of extending this program uh, to the two remaining regions 
as defined in, 2000, uh, in the 2019 report published uh, by the Department of Defense that reviewed the treatment of striker prime beneficiaries uh, who reside on the island. Given our territorial status, retirees and their family members are excluded uh, from Tricare Prime in Puerto Rico. According to a report by the Congressional Task Force on Economic Growth, not having access to Tricare Prime is one way uh, in which Puerto Rico is treated differently under several federal programs. Uh, this is a source of great frustration uh, for retired uh, Department of Defense personnel who have provided a great service to our country and courageously defended it in times of war. I have also offered Amendment 695, the second amendment related to Tracker Prime, that requires the Department of Defense to brief Congressional Defense Committee on extending the program uh, to eligible beneficiaries uh, in Puerto Rico and the U.S. territories. This will provide valuable and updated information uh, building on former reports that will keep moving us uh, towards resolving uh, this issue. With these two amendments, we have the opportunity to begin to rectify this wrong to our veterans on the island. Uh, my amendment 726 will increase the authorized funding for the Department of Defense Innovative Readiness Training. Uh, this program uh, by $16.9 million, bringing the total recommended funding for uh, $30 million. This is the same amount the program received in the fiscal year 2020 NDAA, and it's consistent with the recommendation included in both Senate version of this year's uh, NDAA and the House Defense Appropriation Bill. Each year, these programs enhance deployment readiness for more than 5,500 uh, 5, service members by providing hands-on real-world training experience uh, for mission essential tasks, often in remote or underserved areas across the country. Uh, communities on the island are among those that have benefited uh, from this program. Actually, last year, uh, throughout uh, this mission, they uh, call Operation uh, Hope. Uh, more than 800 service members from 80, 82 units provided medical, dental, optometry services to over more than 9,000 patients on the island. Uh, units obtained a valuable, handsome training and experience while helping at the same time uh, thousands of their fellow Americans living on the island. This is just an example of one of the missions across the nation that will help improve our service members' military readiness while sim simultaneously strengthening American communities. And that's the reason we are asking for this amendment. Finally, I just want to express briefly my support for amend Amendment uh, uh, 178, uh, which I co-sponsored with my colleagues of the Bipartisan Congressional Women's Caucus. I'm the vice chair of the Congressional Leader uh, Women's Caucus. This amendment is required uh, the, that each secretary of military de department to develop policies to protect careers of pregnant service women, uh, which at times are negative, negatively affected. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, I, and I yield back. Well, thank you very much. I want to thank all the witnesses for your testimony. And Ms. gonzalez Colon, I should tell you that I'm, I'm, I'm right now in my home city of Wor Worcester, Massachusetts. We have a memorial to the Barrancaneers here, and um, uh, we have a very vibrant uh, Puerto Rican community. And uh, But uh, in any event, uh, thank you uh, for uh, everybody. Um, I have no questions. Mr. Cole? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I too want to thank everybody. I have no questions, but I would ask a unanimous consent to submit for the record statements by uh, Mr. Bergman of Michigan and Mr. Norman of South Carolina in support of the amendment they offered. To the Without objection. Thank you. Um, uh, Mr. Uh, Ms. Ms. Torres. Uh, okay. Uh, Mr. Perlmutter. Yeah, just thank all of the witnesses for their very complete testimony, and I yield back. Right, Mr. Woodall. No questions, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ms. Scanlon. Uh, Mr. Varelli. Dr. Burgess. Uh, oh, Mr. Varelli's right there. Okay. No, no, that's all right. I was uh, simply going to say I'll pass. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. Dr. Burgess. Um, Ms. Lesko. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to say thank you to all of the testifiers, specifically to Mr. Winstrup. I really support your amendments. I think it's very important that we find out um, where these components of our future drugs and vaccines are being made, and we try to get the manufacturing back in the United States. And with that, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I only wanted to add that I support the amendments um, introduced by uh, the representative from Puerto Rico. Um, they have long been discriminated against in our programs, um, and I yield back. Thank you. Ms. Matsui. No questions. All right. uh, does anybody else wish to ask a question that I, that I okay? Uh, does somebody want to be recognized? Okay. Mr. Chairman. Uh, yes. Yeah. Yes, it's Congresswoman Jackson Lee, can you see me? Yeah, I can, yes. Yes, I, I would like, thank you, Mr. Chairman, very much. I just want to make two quick points to the members. Uh, I wanted to indicate on the amendment uh, dealing with the Naval Academy uh, that I actually had a constituent who stuttered uh, and had graduated all the way through the Naval Academy uh, and uh, was not able to fulfill their lifelong dream uh, after they'd gone through the URL, and that is their uh, training for their position because they said you stuttered. And so uh, this is to, to, to save young men and women who want to serve by getting them to be analyzed uh, right during the time that they're in the Naval Academy, which as you know, we invest a lot of dollars for these young men and women who want to serve our country and serve it voluntarily as well. Uh, and so it was passed last time in the NDAA and I just wanted to bring that to your attention. And finally, I have a letter from the uh, Office of Emergency Management in Houston, Texas, that supports the amendment of uh, keeping the National Guard here to provide testing uh, in our areas from Houston to Harris County, in fact, in the state of Texas, really. But we have this letter that I ask unanimous consent to place into the record from Dr. Purse asking for it to be until August 31st, 2020. All right, without objection. Pardon? I ask with, unanimous consent for it to be put in the record. Yeah, without objection. Okay, yes. Thank you. Okay. All right. <laughs> I thank you. I yield back. Thank you for your consideration of my amendments. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, no other questions. Uh, this panel is dismissed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Oh, uh, Ms. Lesko, do you have an amendment that you'd like to testify on? Um, yes, I do, Mr. McGovern. Or okay. Mr. McGovern. Why, why don't we yield to you right now to do that? Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member Cole. First, I would like to testify today on behalf of my colleague from Arizona, Mr. Biggs. Mr. Chairman, I would like to ask unanimous consent to insert into the record two statements for the record from Congressman Biggs. Without objection. Thank you. Mr. Biggs submitted and would like you and uh, members to make in order the following five amendments. First, Mr. Chairman, Amendment number 70 reaffirms our nation's unflinching support for Israel and provides a full endorsement from the U.S. Congress on the importance of the United States-Israel relationship. Um, the second, Mr. Biggs would like you to consider amendment number 79, which prohibits the use of funds for any project or activity related to NATO until the Secretary of Defense certifies to the Congressional Defense Committees that each member country of NATO has spent 2% of the respective GDP on defense expenditures. This NDAA authorizes millions of dollars for NATO projects and activities. It is Mr. Biggs' view that these funds should not be dispersed until member countries significantly invest more towards their own defense. Similarly, Mr. Biggs also urges you to support amendment number 121, which would require the Secretary of Defense to submit a report to Congress on annual defense spending by ally and partner countries. 
The secretary would also be required to report on the activities of each ally and contributing to military or stability operations in which their armed forces participate. Any limitations that each ally places on their use of the armed forces for military or stability operations and any actions undertaken by the United States or other countries to minimize or modify such limitations. This amendment was included in the House passed National Defense Authorization Act for fiscal year 2019 and 2020, and Mr. Big urges, Biggs urges you to support its passage again this year. Mr. Biggs would like you to consider amendment number 199 which deals with the withdrawal of United States Armed Forces from Afghanistan. While I am not a co-sponsor of this amendment, it was important for Mr. Biggs that this amendment be testified on. This amendment would repeal the authorization for use of military force enacted in response to the September 11, 2001 attacks. Direct the Department of Defense to report to Congress a plan for one, the orderly withdrawal of troops from Afghanistan, and two, political reconciliation and elections in Afghanistan independent of U.S. involvement and give members of the United States Armed Forces who deployed in support of the global war on terror a $2,500 bonus. Mr. Biggs, the committee to make this amendment in order. Uh, and lastly, on Mr. Biggs's amendment, Mr. Biggs urges the committee to make an order amendment number 727, which strikes section 901. As you know, section 901 seeks to eliminate the chief management officer position from the Department of Defense. Earlier this year, the Department of Defense reported that under the leadership of the current chief management officer, Lisa Hirschman, the Pentagon successfully identified 5.7 billion to be re reallocated from current support agencies towards new defense priorities like hypersonic weapons and artificial intelligence. If we are going to make reforms to the Pentagon, we must continue to examine its entire administrative apparatus and section 901 of this legislation does not help us achieve that goal. I would also like to take this opportunity, Mr. Chairman, to voice my support for amendment number 663, a bipartisan amendment offered by Representative Larson of Connecticut. This amendment addresses administrative fixes to the Barry Goldwater Scholarship and Excellence in Education Foundation that was congressionally created through the fiscal year 87 NDAA some 33 years ago. Since its creation, the Goldwater Foundation awarded over $70 million in scholarships and supported over 9,000 college students, many of whom currently work and support our top academic, corporate, and defense institutions and laboratories. Goldwater Scholarship Foundation provides scholarships to undergraduates pursuing research careers in STEM fields in honor of Senator Barry Goldwater from my great state of Arizona. I urge the committee to make that amendment in order number 663. Also, I would like to offer my support for amendment number 597, which would create a grant structure and <clears throat> provide important research and development funds to support the development of U.S. semiconductor manufacturing. This amendment would have a positive impact on the ability to expand leading edge logic in the United States, which is a key issue for the Department of Defense. It is imperative that we secure our supply chain, ensure long-term national security and economic competitiveness in this sector. I urge the committee to make this bipartisan amendment in order. Lastly, I would like to support amendment number seven offered by Mr. Bergman, an amendment of which I am a co-sponsor. This amendment is identical to HR 4189, which has over 60 co-sponsors, 
almost evenly split between Republicans and Democrats, and I am a co-sponsor. The amendment itself has 25 Democratic and 29 Republican co-sponsors. And I think that, that sort of bipartisanship should be taken seriously by the committee. The amendment would amend the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act to remove the immunity of foreign states, including foreign officials, employees, or agents with regard to money damages sought by nat national of the United States for personal injury, harm to reputation, or damage to or loss of property resulting from cyber attacks. This was signed into law in 1976, long before the internet. If technology existed back then like it does today, Congress probably would have included some sort of provision in the F F FSIA to address cyber attacks. However, since foreign agents currently enjoy blanket immunity for these types of attacks, or adversaries like North Korea, Iran and China have a free hand to attack Americans. This amendment gives the American people protection from our adversaries, and I urge the committee to make it in order. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. I thank uh, you for your testimony and for um, your advocacy on these amendments. I don't, does anyone on the committee have any questions for Ms. Lesko? Um, Hearing none, I, again, I thank the general lady again. Uh, we now, let me see where's my next panel here. Uh, I now would like to call uh, Mr. Richmond, Mr. Graves, uh, Mr. Smith, Mr. Deutsch, Mr. Gosar, and Mr. Keller. Uh, I want to thank you all for providing testimony today. Any written materials you submit to rules documents at mail.house.gov before the conclusion of this hearing will without objection be entered into the record um and uh we will uh we appreciate uh conciseness uh to the extent possible um and we i will begin with mr richmond we get him i don't know who's i don't know if he's on yet by the way um i see mr i see oh there's mr mr richmond you're on. Yes, and I hope you all can hear me. Yes, we can. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, let me just uh, thank you for affording me the time and thank the members for uh, their attention. What, what I come to talk about today is the Great American Outdoors Act, and I want to put a, <clears throat> a, a real life uh, spin on this so that you understand why it's so uh, personal to me. And, and the amendment is amendment number are 24 and what it does is it lifts the cap that the four gulf states would receive in terms of our oil revenue and so if you're onshore your oil revenue that you receive as a state is 50 percent with no cap and if it's offshore on our shores which affects our state it's the same thing we receive 37.5 percent but we have a cap at 375 million which all the uh gulf states share and so this amendment is bipartisan we have uh congressman thompson from mississippi congresswoman sue from alabama ebj eddie bernice johnson from texas on the democratic side on the republican side we have scalise and grace from louisiana palazzo from mississippi bradley byrne from alabama and pete olson from texas let me let me just say that I understand what we need to do for our national parks. Uh, my question is, do we have to raid uh, the funds for these Gulf states to do it without giving those Gulf states any money? And so why in this time, and, and this is really for my Democratic members, in this time that we're talking about racial equity, in this time when we're talking about economic opportunity for all, especially in places like Louisiana, Alabama, and Mississippi, where our rural uh, brothers and sisters, Republican, Democrat, black or white, are suffering, the question becomes why raid that money without offering any assistance? So let me just give you some quick facts. Louisiana has 4.6 million, Alabama has 4.8 million, Mississippi has 3 million. 
Louisiana is 33% black. Uh, Alabama is 26% black. Mississippi is 38% black. But let me tell you what all of these states have in common. Uh, in terms of USA Today rankings, uh, Louisiana's last, Alabama's second to last, Mississippi is 48, third to last. So if you look at the median incomes in those states, 26,000 for Louisiana and Alabama, 23,000 for Mississippi, they all rank either last, second to last, or third to last in healthcare, education, economy, infrastructure, opportunity, uh, the natural environment uh, there at the bottom. Uh, and in pollution, Louisiana's dead last, Alabama's number 37, and Mississippi's number 33. And economic opportunity, Louisiana's number 50, Alabama's number 45, and uh, Mississippi is number 49. All of those numbers show that these states are struggling. The people who live in these states are struggling. So when we don't afford uh, them the same opportunity to collect uh, their oil and gas uh, revenue, uh, their royalties, then what we're doing is cheating the people in those states and we're sentencing them to continue to be last in education, not to invest in their people. The governors of, of these three states, one Democrat and two Republicans, all sent letters uh, in support of this amendment. Uh, the Coalition to Restore Coastal Louisiana, the Environmental Defense Fund, Lake Pontchartrain, Basin Foundation, National Audubon Society, and the National Wildlife Federation have all uh, supported lifting the cap and giving uh, the Gulf states their fair share. So oh, lifting the cap alone over the life cycle of our uh, scoring process will give Louisiana about $200 million. It would give uh, Mississippi about $65 uh, million. And, and just so you can understand what that money means, Mississippi right now spends $40 million to make sure that their residents can go to community colleges, private colleges, and four-year colleges, public and private, uh, with assistance. So this money uh, is a big, big deal. And I am not diminishing the value of our national parks. All I'm saying is we're going straight into the royalties of Mississippi, Alabama, Texas, and Louisiana to pay for this when we treat all four states different in terms of the revenue that they collect from their royalties. So the oil producing states onshore get 50% with no cap. We get 37% with a $375 million cap shared by those uh, states. So in summary, because I do want to be uh, brief, this amendment, affects the economic opportunity, the economic mobility of everyone in those uh, three states that are teetering at the bottom of everything. So when we're trying to figure out a way to uh, increase broadband so that poor communities won't get left behind and rural communities won't be left behind in these COVID times, uh, we have to do so with our hands tied behind our back because we're getting treated differently. And so I just think that these uh, four states, especially the three states that hover around the bottom, these three states that have the, some of the largest percentages of African Americans around this country in them, in this time of racial equity and trying to make sure that we uh, lift barriers. Uh, this is a barrier that we as Democrats and Republicans should be lifting. And if you look at the coalition of people on this amendment, they come from all walks of life, very liberal, very conservative, uh, moderates and non-moderates, but this is important and this is a matter of, of life and death for a lot of people in uh, these states. So with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back and I thank you for your time and your attention. Thank you very much, Mr. Graves. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, first, I, I wanna thank you and Ranking Member Cole for the opportunity to join you today. And I, I wanna thank my, my colleague, Congressman Richmond for his articulate explanation of the amendment and, and really the justification. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I want to take it a step further. If, if you look at um, the actual text of the bill, um, this bill derives funding and it talks about how it's deriving funding from oil and gas and coal and renewable energy sources from all over the United States. It makes it sound like it's this big, diverse revenue stream. Uh, here's the reality. Under current law, as my, as my colleague just noted, 
50% of the revenues from onshore energy production on, on federal lands goes to the states where that federal land exists. So if a if billion dollars is produced on federal lands, then $500 million of that goes to that state. They can do whatever they want with it. Number two, an additional 40% of the money goes into what's called the reclamation fund for water projects in those states. So, so over 90% of the money right there is already diverted to other things. And water projects, by the way, are, are limited to what is it, the 16, I believe, Western states. So, so in reality, when you, when you start looking at revenue streams, $1.9 billion really comes from, as, as Congressman Richmond mentioned, it comes from the states that produce offshore energy. Mr. Chairman, there's six of those. It's Alaska and California. It's Texas, Louisiana, Mississippi, and Alabama. However, when you add up the offshore energy production in federal waters among Alaska, California, Texas, Alabama, and Mississippi, you have to multiply it times about four to, to get to the amount of production that occurs off our coast. So, so let's talk about what this bill really does. In reality, this bill takes money that is produced off the coast of Louisiana, and it is dedicating it to conservation, land acquisition, and maintenance. I, I support those things. Mr. Mr. Chairman, I was a mountaineering instructor for years and years before I came to Congress. That was my job. I led wilderness courses. I took people out into these very areas that we're talking about protecting. I've spent more nights out in some of these, some of these areas that I've spent indoors in some years. I love these areas and I've, I've committed much of my life to protecting them. But I cannot understand how it is more important to conserve, to invest in those areas and to, to increase our inventory of federal lands when we have a, what is it, a $13 billion backlog in maintenance. If we care about the environment, then let's talk about the environment where these very dollars are derived. We have lost, Mr. Chairman, 2,000 square miles of our coast, some of the most productive ecosystem on the North American continent. Mr. Chairman, that's more than one quarter of your state disappearing. It's, it's more than the entire state of Rhode Island disappearing. So, so we have an environmental crisis. We have a conservation crisis. How in the world does it make any sense to take money derived from our coast to send it to other uh, areas, other projects that don't have the same ecological return on investment, that don't have the same priority as it does in the very area where these dollars are derived? And Mr. Chairman, these very dollars are unsustainable. This bill tries to, in perpetuity, commit funds to the Land and Water Conservation Fund, in perpetuity, mandatory spending. But, but the very area where the dollars are derived is unsustainable, so, which means the revenue stream is unsustainable. You've got to invest in the goose that lays the golden egg in order to sustain the revenue stream. That's all we're asking you to do. And I want to clarify one thing that, that, that my friend, Mr. Richmond said. He compared the onshore production at, at 50% to the, the revenue sharing in Louisiana and, and, and the other Gulf states at 37.5%. However, that 37.5% only applies to new production that was issued after 2006. So to put it in perspective, two years ago, I believe the number was we got 0.04%, no, 0.02%, 0 0.02% was our return. It wasn't 50%, it wasn't 37.5%. It was 0.02% of all the production. Last year, I believe we did go up to 4%, but, but we're actually comparing 4% to 50%. Mr. Chairman, all we're asking is that, is that we be able to invest the dollars back into the sustainability of this area, these communities, this productive ecosystem, to where we don't have to come back and spend <coughs> billions and billions of dollars next time we have a hurricane or disaster that is, that is absolutely uh, inevitable. Uh, so Mr. Chairman, this is clearly a fairness issue. Last thing I wanna make note of is that this is so important to our state that under our constitution, that passed with an extraordinary margin uh, in the public, under our constitution, every penny of these dollars is required to be invested 
in coastal restoration, ecological restoration, and in the resilience of these coastal communities. So it's not out there spending money on largesse or things that aren't priorities. These are things that reduce future federal expenditures. It's on our environment, on our resiliency. And I urge that you take a close look at the bipartisan amendment Congressman Richmond has filed as well as some of the amendments that we filed that we think improves the bill. Thank you. Yield back. Thank you very much, Mr. Smith. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Now, now we can't. <laughs> How's that? Good. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, um, last year, you and the ranking member of the Rules Committee made an order and amendment uh, that Colin Peterson and I offered uh, on Lyme disease. It was to task the IG uh, for DOD to look into Lyme and whether or not uh, Lyme disease was ever weaponized. In other words, were ticks used to, to create it, uh, at least the current form of it. Uh, it passed the House and died in the U.S. Senate. Um, we were told in the conference that the IG did not have the bandwidth. The new amendment tasks the GAO to do that. And why is this important, Mr. Chairman? Uh, for years, books and articles have been written suggesting uh, that there's significant research had been done at U.S. government facilities, including Fort Detrick and Plum Island, to turn ticks and other insects into bioweapons. Last year, another blockbuster book called Bitten, The Secret History of Lyme Disease and Biological Weapons, written by Chris Newby, uh, which includes interviews with Dr. Willie Berkdorfer. He's the researcher, as you know, who was credited with discovering Lyme disease. Turns out Dr. Berkdorfer was a bioweapons specialist. The interviews, combined with access to Dr. Berktover's files, reveals that he and other bioweapons specialists stuffed ticks <laughs> with pathogens to cause severe disability, disease, and death to potential enemies. With Lyme disease now and other tick-borne diseases exploding in the United States, the conservative estimate is 300,000 new cases every year, higher end estimate 427,000 new cases, and, each, and about 10 to 20% of all patients suffering from chronic Lyme, uh, I believe, and, and uh, Colin Powell believes, are the two of us, and many, many others, that Americans have a right to know, is any of this true? What were the parameters of the program, if there was one, who ordered it? And the most important question, can any of this information that might be derived from that study, that audit, help current day researchers find a way to mitigate these diseases? Again, last year, again, and I thank you, you made it in order. We're just asking now, rather than the IG, that it be the GAO uh, that conducts the audit. Thank you very much, Mr. Deutsch. Thank you very much, Chairman. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Chairman McGovern and Ranking Member Cole. Thanks for the opportunity to testify on uh, my proposed amendments to the NDAA. I'm grateful to my colleagues who have joined in supporting uh, the amendments before you today. Amendment number 387, seeks to require the Department of State to create a strategy for addressing the growing transnational threat of white identity terrorism. I'll submit for the record full testimony on that amendment uh, in an attempt to uh, be respectful of everyone's time. Uh, I'm honored to appear before you today also to speak about an issue that's become deeply personal in my uh, 10 years in Congress. Amendment number 529 would add the Robert Levinson hostage recovery and uh, Hostage Recovery and Hostage Taking Accountability Act, legislation which codifies the U.S. government hostage response structure. It aligns interagency hostage policy. It puts in statute the position of the Special Envoy for Hostage Affairs, which has existed since 2015, and it authorizes sanctions against those who engage in hostage taking of Americans. There is no greater national security responsibility than ensuring the safety of Americans. Congress cannot stand by while those who seek to do America harm take innocent men and women hostage while Americans are used as political pawns. This legislation codifies Presidential Policy Directive 30, issued in the wake of the brutal flanks of James Foley and Stephen Sotloff at the hands of ISIS terrorists. It creates the, the, the creation of the Special Envoy ensured that the appropriate focus at the highest levels of government will be given to diplomacy aimed at returning U.S. wrongful detainees and hostages. 
for too long, families of hostages and wrongful detainees did not receive the support and communication they needed from the U.S. government. And too often, U.S. policy was disconnected and disjointed across various agencies. The creation of the Hostage Recovery Fusion Cell and the Hostage Response Group finally ensured that there would be a coordinated response. Former Director of Hostage Recovery Fusion Cell, Rob Sally, said of the creation of the structure, I would say that by formalizing relationships and processes, U.S. victims of kidnapping and hostage taking are being recovered more often and more quickly. I know the pain and frustration these families live with because for 10 years, I have had the honor of representing Bob Levinson and his family. Bob was the longest held American hostage, a 25 year FBI veteran. Bob disappeared from Kish Island, Iran on March 9th, 2007. In the years after his disappearance, the Levinsons received proof of life in the form of photos and a video time and time again. The Levinsons watched as others came home and Bob was left behind. <laughs> When President Obama negotiated the release of five Americans from Iran in 2016, Iran promised again to open a channel dedicated to assisting in Bob's case, but no assistance was ever provided. For 10 years, through three different administrations, the Levinson family struggled to make Bob's return a consistent priority. This remarkable family, Bob's wife of 40 years, Christine, and his seven children learned how to lobby on his behalf they visited Congress, they appealed to the State Department and the White House, they testified in committees, they did interviews, they wrote op-eds. They should not have had to work that hard just to keep Bob from being forgotten. I've watched this incredible family for a decade fight every day to bring their father and husband home. And in March, I sat, I sat and I cried with them when they received the news that a determination was made that Bob was no longer alive. It was heart-wrenching. No family should ever have to go through this. This amendment before you today can ensure that families receive the support that they need, that the U.S. government has a coordinated and coherent hostage policy, that those wrongfully detained are not left out, and sends a message to those around the world that you cannot take Americans with impunity. Mr. Chairman, this bill passed the House Foreign Affairs Committee unanimously. It passed the Senate in June. I'm grateful to all the co-sponsors, to my Florida neighbor, Mr. Hastings, for his support, uh, to my friend, uh, Chris Smith, uh, who's on this panel with me, who's been a great supporter both at the Land Trust Commission and on the Foreign Affairs Committee, and Chairman McGovern, I'm incredibly grateful for the time you've devoted to the Levinsons and other hostage families at the Tom Land Trust Commission. I urge this committee's support, and I thank you very much. Well, well, thank you very much for your testimony and for your kind words. And I also speak for Mr. Smith. We, we were privileged to be on the uh, Lantos Commission, and uh, we appreciate your commitment to human rights as well. Um, I would now like to yield to Mr. Gosar. Thank you, Chairman McGovern. I first like to do my comments in regards to the Great American Outdoor uh, Act, um, following up on the two gentlemen from Louisiana. We have some concerns. I'm particularly uh, disturbed that we would consider a piece of legislation that never had an opportunity for the Senate floor to have passed amendments on. This was done behind closed doors in the Senate, and I think it would be uh, behooving a House leadership that we have the opportunity to make this bill better, that we actually have the ability to amend it. I want to start first with uh, the, the one uh, I proposed would require that the construction done under this act adhere to buy American provisions. This bipartisan amendment is co-sponsored by Democrats Marcy Kaptur, Tim Ryan, Connor Lamb, and Pete Viskolowski, and Republicans Rich Crawford, Louis Gilbert, and myself. It is endorsed by the United Steelworkers Union, the AFL-CIO, American Iron and Steel Institute, a broad coalition of trade associations and unions. The underlying bill includes billions in new spending on infrastructure. Those billions should be spent on products manufactured by American workers. I'm also offering two amendments dealing with the infrastructure challenges facing our Native American reservations, increasing funding for the American, the American Indian education, and expanding the bill to provide for the Indian Health Service. The COVID disaster has proven anything like its very its big impact on the Native American health and the educational facilities, and they desperately need funding funding to bring their dilapidated state into the 21st century. I'm also offering two amendments recommended to the recommended by the National Association of the County Counties ensuring full funding of the payment in lieu of taxes PILT program, and ensuring no net loss in counties that are overwhelmingly federally owned already. 
Finally, I have three amendments which would make the bill more responsible and transparent, including reporting on expenditures, GAO accountability, increasing the state share of funding. Thank you for hearing me on these amendments, and then I'd like to address uh, my concerns to the NDAA. Go ahead. Thank you. The first amendment I'd like to talk about is uh, Amendment 448. This In 2013, the Granite Mountain Interagency Hotshot Crew fought the Yarnell Hill fire. This destructive fire threatened the safety of the town of Yarnell, Arizona, and the surrounding communities. They battled it with difficult circumstances, and the brave men of this fire unit were able to save the town from almost certain destruction. Unfortunately, in their engagement with such a dangerous fire, 19 of the 20 members of the crew perished. The selfless sacrifice and bravery of this crew is the epitome of what the American spirit rising up to meet the challenges threatening the safety of the American people. This commitment to the defense of our community are the qualities that best exemplify those Americans who served our country. This group fought the fire to their death, something that would be reflect very well for the fighting spirit of a naval warship. My amendment honors these first responders who paid the ultimate price for our safety by expressing the sense of Congress that the Secretary of Navy should name a new warship the USS Granite Mountain. Today, the ships of the U.S. Navy are deployed around the world, serving in great power, serving in great power programs, counterterrorism operations, peacekeeping missions, and more. As more brave young men and women enter the U.S. Navy, the name and story behind the Granite Mountain Interagency Hotshot Crew will serve as a solemn reminder of the cause they serve, the safety and security of the American people, and the homeland. The second one. is uh, this is uh, Amendment 545. Uh, the American Institutes of Higher Education, or IHE, are regular targets of foreign nation soft power pro projection. IHE shaped the minds of young Americans set to enter the private and public sphere and contribute to the federal government's research and development. Records from the Department of Education indicate that since 1990, U.S. IHE's reported donations for Qatar, China, Saudi Arabia, and the United Arab Emirates, exceeding $6.6 .6 billion, usually in the form of language and cultural programs. Now, accepting monetary donations from foreign sources is not illegal. However, we must monitor such donations because donors to IHEs, both domestic and foreign, earn influence which can develop biases and intrusion into the curriculum. The Higher Education Act mandates reporting requirements on foreign funding requirements, which are often ignored. For example, recent crackdowns by the Department of Education into the Ivy League schools leads to the reporting, led to the reporting of $6.5 billion in foreign gifts that previously had gone unreported. To correct this issue, my amendment would amend Section 487A of the Higher Education Act of 1965 to require IHEs that participate in school assistance programs to make available on the institution's website the full content, content of agreements between an institution and foreign sources that provides or intends to provide language and cultural teachings and resources and services to the IHE students. Full transparency and reporting foreign gifts by IHEs is crucial for our national security to protect government research and development and to prevent biases driven by a financial sway from permeating the academic development of our citizens and future leaders. Additionally, all students seeking to attend American IHEs, IHEs should be fully aware of its school's donors to gain a complete understanding of the institution in which they pursue their uh, advanced education. Foreign entities should never gain unfair leverage over IHEs, <clears throat> and my amendment fixes this issue through improving that oversight process. The next amendment is Amendment uh, 435. My amendment would develop one or more categor categorical exclusions under the National Environmental Protection Act, or NEPA, of the 1969 for helium development to secure a domestic helium supply. There's an ongoing growing helium supply shortage in the United States and globally. The resulting substance substantial price increases have have having an adverse impact on consumers and critical industries stakeholder communities that rely upon helium notably helium users include aerospace defense industry healthcare industry computer chip hard drive makers and u.s national labs and university research community due to its vital widespread use congress acted in 1925 to establish the national helium reserve currently satisfying 
40% of the U.S. helium demand, but it is running out. The reserve is forecast to be depleted by the end of 2021, if not sooner. Federal action is required to help bring existing untapped domestic helium sources to the market in a timely manner. If t action is not taken, U.S. dependency on other global suppliers of helium, like Russia, Qatar, and Algeria, will undoubtedly become the only option. The impact of these price spikes and uncertain domestic supplies has caused universities and research labs to cut programs in an effort to survive the fiscal burden. The United States should not have to reply on, rely on foreign adversaries for our supply of helium. Congress must develop a solution to help bring new sources of helium online as expeditiously as possible, an effort to avoid trans transitioning from the current helium shortage to a full-blown crisis. If Congress fails to act, aforementioned helium users will be forced to absorb spiking prices turned to unfriendly foreign suppliers, or at worst be forced to shut their doors on helium reliant projects. We can't allow this to happen. We just saw this with the pandemic with the rely, reliance on China. My next amendment is number 560. The presumption of innocence is key. The principle is enshrined in the very founding of our country. In the Uniform Code of the Military Justice, this is the very same principle throughout the conduct of proceedings that are conducted against accused within the military. However, what you will hear from members of the military that have been accused of a crime is that these hearings are far from fair and just. Over the past several years, there's been an observable trend within the military justice system of prosecut prosecutors consistently withholding exculpatory evidence from the accused. United American Patriot CEO David Kerfane explains that there, have never, there has never been one prosecutor ever held accountable, and because they're not being held accountable, there's no there's a carrot, but there's no stick. And until we start holding prosecutors accountable individually for their misconduct, it will be keep on going unabated. Uniform code of military justice in and in itself tends to be weighted against the defendant. It's lopsided. For instance, this practice was has been observed in the case of Navy SEAL Chief Edward Eddie Gallagher. Timothy Partore, Gallagher's attorney, noted, quote, the government's misconduct in suppressing exculpatory statements from two SEAL petty officers was fortuitously revealed through leaks to the media and through the government prosecutor, Captain Connor McMahon's reflexive, false, and quickly discredited denial, which raised serious concerns about what other exculpatory materials had been withheld. Furthermore, it was noted by Chief Gallagher's defense team that military prosecutors embedded malware in the emails sent to members of the media and to Chief Gallagher's attorneys. The presentation of exculpatory evidence, otherwise known as the Brady material, is the foundation of a fair and just trial. Military prosecutors who have engaged in willful and corrupt suppression of exculpatory evidence are doing a disservice to the very core principles of our country's founding. Furthermore, they do a disservice to the integrity of the United States Armed Forces. Sadly, military prosecutors that have engaged in the suppression of exculpatory evidence have not been held accountable, but rather incentivized to continue this corrupt practice. My amendment to the NDA would ensure that any prosecutor in judicial proceedings held within the Uniform Code of Military Justice that willfully and corruptly withhold exculpatory evidence from the accused is guilty of prosecutorial misconduct and shall be punished as court martial may direct. With this amendment, we may step one step closer to restoring integrity and fairness to the military justice system. My next amendment uh, is um, something that I, I'm co-sponsoring with Mr. Stanton, Stanton from Arizona. It's been a passion of mine. From 1945 to 1962, the United States government conducted ne nearly 200 atmospheric weapons development tests as part of our nation's Cold War strategy, security strategy. During era, and other hostile nations were engaged in nuclear weapons testing and proliferation. Sadly, these tests exposed thousands of innocent Americans to cancer-causing ionized radiation from nuclear fallout. When the injuries were discovered, Congress subsequently passed an apology on behalf of the nation and passed the Radiation Exposure Compensation Act, or RECA. In part of this, this administrative write-up, two areas of Congress of this area were excluded administratively. They were part of the act, but administratively when it was written, they were excluded. This is Clark County in Nevada and part of my county, Mojave County, in Arizona. Now, it was well intended the RECA, uh, but the error uh, created a problem. These people could not uh, uh, have the adjudication to apply for adjudication against the federal government under the RECA promises. 
what this amendment basically does is that it actually allows those two uh, subsections that were administratively left out to be part of the RECA settlement going forward. I think that's just, I think that is appropriate. It does not guarantee them. It just gives them the opportunity to apply for re regress. The next amendment I have is 492. Uh, in May of 2019, President Xi Jinping made a visit to the heart of China's critical minerals industrial complex. He stated during, uh, during his visit, quote, we are here at the starting point of the long march to remember the time when the Red Army began its journey. We are now embarking on a new long march and we must start all over again, end quote. His words came a week after Chinese state media proposed the idea of completely banning critical mineral exports to the United States. Currently, the United States relies on China for nearly 20 different critical minerals, which include several earth materials defined by the Department of Defense. This irrational over-reliance threatens our national security by imperiling our ability to make equipment and weapons integral to the mission success. Rare earths are used in numerous modern technologies, including missile guidance and control systems, lasers for energy, for enemy mine detection, satellite communications, radar, sonar and submarines, iPhones, electric vehicles, wind turbines, solar panels, computers, networks, and the list goes on and on. This administration has made a concerted effort to reduce our rare earth import vulnerability from China and thus secure our military supply chain for possible trade coercion. As a producer of nearly 80%, 80% of the world's rare earth materials, China wields considerable asymmetric leverage against countries like the United States that are customers of Chinese rare earth exports. In the past year of political disputes, China has leveraged this asymmetrical leverage in their benefit, to their benefit. In 2010, China sharply limited rare earth exports to Japan, a big consumer, while the two countries are sparring over disputed islands. This status quo is unsustainable. The United States cannot be a, a, a afford to be beholding to China for the long term, whether it be pharmaceuticals or rare, critical rare earths. Any interruption of these rare earth exports from China will dra dramatically impact defense manufacturing. My amendment would work towards un work toward Under Secretary of Defense for Acquisition and Sustainment Ellen Lord's efforts to eliminate America's dependence on Chinese rare earth exports and increase American national security. Now, hopefully the last one that I'll offer is Amendment 567. The COVID-19 pandemic has changed the face of public health and biodefense. It has demonstrated the persistent danger from emerging infectious diseases, which are now able to spread worldwide in a matter of weeks. During the second half of the 20th century, we relied more on preventive measures like mass vaccinations to suppress common infectious diseases because of long-term benefits of this approach. The current pandemic has shown that this approach needs to be supplemented with a rapid epidemic response capability, which would act as a firebreak to allow enough time for vaccine development and deployment. This is the role that passive immunity fills perfectly. That is why I introduced the following amendment in the spirit of the work that DARPA Pandemic Prevention Platform P3 has conducted in response to COVID-19. My amendment would direct the Secretary of Defense to designate a lead within the Department of Defense to implement and advance a program for the development of rapid and cost-effective medical countermeasures to pandemics. This initiative addresses a bipartisan issue. The development of rapid pandemic response tools is a vital national security issue and a public health issue. One of the vital provisions of the amendment is a challenge to American ingenuity to reduce the time frame of the rapid pandemic response from 60 days to 28 days. In the first 60 days of a pandemic, every day is crucial, and being able to deploy pandemic countermeasures as early as possible is vital to saving lives. These tools can be used both as therapy for infected patients and as a passive immunization method to prevent further infections and transmission. My amendment will ensure the development of rapid and cost-effective medical countermeasures that will reduce the economic impact of the pandemic and keep our future pandemics and keep America open for business. With that, I, I yield the right balance of my time. That's all. Um, that's, that's all. Sorry yeah, about that. Yeah, that's a, Mr. Keller. Thank you, Chairman McGovern and Ranking Member Cole, and also the distinguished members of the committee. For too long, our supply chain, including critical defense materials, has been overly reliant on resources located and produced within the People's Republic of China under the control of the Chinese Communist Party. One area of supply crucial to the United States is tungsten. 
Pennsylvania's 12th congressional district is home to Global Tungsten and Powders, the top employer in Bradford County, Pennsylvania, and a leading developer, manufacturer, and marketer of refractory metal powders such as tungsten. These powders are used in critical defense products like penetrators, artillery projectiles, and tank shells. The U.S. Geological Survey designated tungsten as a critical mineral. Additionally, the fiscal year 2019 National Defense Authorization Act prohibited the acquisition of certain tungsten products from China, Russia, North Korea, and Iran. At latest count, China controls over 80% of tungsten mining in the world and remains by far the world's leading producer of tungsten. As it does in other things, China uses its supply dominance to manipulate the global market. Given what has been exposed about China's intentions during COVID-19 and with China's growing military influence throughout the world, it is clear that we need to ensure domestic production of this critical material. That way, going forward, the United States and our allies will no longer have to rely on foreign sources, particularly China, for any of our tungsten supply. Prioritizing our domestic tungsten supply is not only possible, but more importantly, it is in America's national interest. The Department of Defense has concluded that, quote, domestic tungsten and metal capacity is enough to fully satisfy military requirements. So DOD and DOD prime contractors could shift a significant quantity of foreign sourced materials to domestic manufacturers if the Secretary of Defense prioritized domestic, domestic procurement of tungsten and tungsten powder. That is exactly what my amendment would do. It would direct the Secretary to prioritize the domestic procurement of this critical material. I urge the committee to trust the Department of Defense and allow us to debate this important amendment that will support American manufacturing and improve our national security capabilities. Uh, the amendment I have is number 627. Uh, again, I ask the, the uh, committee to consider this. I thank you for your time and the ability to be able to testify, and I yield back. Thank you very much. And let me just recognize um, uh, Mr. Perlmutter for uh, a uh, unanimous consent request. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to uh, offer a unanimous consent. Uh, I'd like to submit for the record a written testimony from Diana DeGette, uh, her amendment 659 on H.R. 2546. I could do that without objection. Without objection. Thank you very much. Well, I want to thank the panel. I thank you for your, your testimony. I don't have any questions. Mr. Cole? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I don't have any questions, but I just want to say I support Mr. Keller's amendment because I really like that cool political button collection in the background there. That was uh, yeah. a yeah. great background, Fred. I love it. Yeah. I, I, I like all the buttons I can't read. <laughs> <laughs> buttons I can't read because I have a problem with. <laughs> well, I, I will assure everybody it is a bipartisan collection that I've been collection, collecting for over 30 years. So I've got, I've got many. I go all the way back to 1896. Wow, all right. well, it's impressive. Thanks. All right. um, uh, Ms. Torres? Uh, no questions, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Mr. Woodall? No questions, Mr. Uh, Chairman. Dr. Burgess? No questions. Mr. Perlmutter? Uh, no questions. Uh, sympathetic with the remarks uh, by Mr. Graves and uh, Mr. Richmond, and I'll yield back. Uh, Ms. Uh, let's go. No, I just want to thank the testifiers. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Scanlon? No questions. Thank you. Mr. Morelli? No questions, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Shalala? No questions, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Matsui? No questions, Mr. Chairman. Again, I thank you for your patience, everybody, and uh, your thoughtfulness. And, um, uh, you can, you, you can be free to go. Thank you. I'm now calling up our next panel, um, Mr. Cole, Mr. Burgess, Ms. Shalala, Mr. Arrington, Mr. Starborough, and Mr. Estes. Thank you for providing your testimony today. Any written materials you submit uh, to rules documents at mail.house.gov before the conclusion of this hearing will, without objection, 
be entered into the record. I'm now uh, happy to recognize the distinguished gentleman from Oklahoma and the ranking member of the Rules Committee, Mr. Cole. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, my amendment incorporates the text of H.R. 6148, the TRICARE ECHO Improvement Act, which I introduced earlier this year as a bipartisan bill with my colleague, Congresswoman Elaine Loria. Uh, the TRICARE Extended Care Health Option Program, or ECHO as it's known, provides important medical services to military dependents with special needs children. It was created as an alternative to Medicaid's home and community-based services waivers because active duty families have difficulty accessing those waivers. Medicaid is a residency-based program, and these programs have waiting lists, which average 30 months. In my home state of Oklahoma, they actually average over six years. Many military families obviously are reassigned to a new base in a new state before their number, their number ever comes up. Although ECHO is meant to be an alternative, the Military Compensation and Retirement Modernization Commission concluded, and I quote, uh, ECHO benefits as currently implemented are not robust enough to replace state waiver programs, unquote. Mr. Chairman, our active duty uh, military families sacrificed immensely for our country. We shouldn't be asking them to sacrifice the appropriate medical care for their children uh, with disabilities as well. My amendment makes uh, several targeted reforms to ECHO. First, it increases the number of respite care hours, bringing it closer to the state average. Second, it makes coverage of vehicle and home adaptations uh, for special needs children comparable to what states offer. My amendment uh, is supported by numerous stakeholders in the health and military family community, including the TRICARE for Kids Coalition, the Children's Hospital Association, Military Officers Association of America, and the National Military Family Association. I would urge my uh, fellow members of the Rules Committee make the amendment in order for consideration by the full house thousands of military families with special needs children and members would be immensely grateful for your support thank you very much mr chairman oh thank you very much it sounds like a good amendment uh dr burgess thank you mr chairman i got a number of amendments uh, the first amendment is number 463. It's, it's, as many as mr gosar well, I'm going to rifle him. All right, just, all right go ahead. <laughs> but it's, uh, as always, it's impossible to uh, offer as much verbiage as Mr. Goble. Sorry. Um, the first one, Amendment 463, is uh, strikes Section 331 from the NDAA. Section 331 would prohibit the purchase of any product containing any chemical from the PFAS chemical group. So this amendment strikes section 331 entirely. Uh, we've dealt with this before in, in uh, other PFAS legislation, notably HR uh, 535. Um, th this section goes too far by including the entire PFAS chemical group without regard to specific identifiable risks in these products. According to the EPA, there are nearly 8,000 chemicals in the PFAS group. The FDA working with several other federal agencies continues to review research on these chemicals and their authorized uses. So this is a place where Congress should not arbitrarily dictate what products are safe, what products are not safe, but should let the regulators guided by science determine what chemical substances are not safe for consumer use, prohibiting the purchase of much needed equipment that is currently authorized for use, such as, uh, as, as varied as food packaging to medical devices, threatens to place undue burdens on our nation's military in cost and readiness. The next amendment, number 449, which strikes section 332, and section 332 changes the way the Comprehensive Environmental Response Compensation and Liability Act of 1980 applies to the Department of Defense cleanups. This is a so-called Superfund site. This amendment strikes section 332 entirely. Circle all requires all cleanups to the protection of human health and the environment and requires any remedial, any remedial actions to be relevant and appropriate under the circumstances for cleanup of the hazardous substance, pollutant, or contaminant. Section 332 of this bill disregards the various characteristics of site by site and prevents the Department of Defense from taking a more practical route 
for cleanup. And every dollar spent on remediating a site beyond what is necessary to mitigate risk is a dollar that is unavailable for use elsewhere. The next two amendments, uh, first one, amendment number 471, strikes section 1608 of the NDAA. Uh, section 1608 prohibits uh, the Department of Defense from entering into contracts with an entry entity operating in the L band of the electromagnetic spectrum. On April 19th of this year, Federal Communications Commission in a five to zero vote unanimously approved the application by Legato to modify use of its licensed spectrum to deploy low power terrestrial network in support of 5G Internet of Things services. This approval followed a four year review process that included tests by the National Advanced Spectrum and Communications Test Network, consultations with the Department of Defense, Department of Transportation, Department of Commerce, and the Federal Aviation Administration and the GPS device manufacturers and an evaluation of stakeholder input through the Federal Communications Commission's public notice and comment period. Despite this thorough process to placate concerns that the FCC placed the FCC did place significant restrictions on Legato, specifically restricting them to no more than 10 watts of power, mandating a 23 megahertz card rail, requiring six month deployment notices, 24 seven monitoring and a kill switch and responsibility by Legato to repair or replace any government device susceptible to harmful interference. However, Department of Defense asserts that deployment of a commercial terrestrial network will cause harmful interference in Department of Defense GPS capabilities. I just must say, if the capabilities supporting our armed forces are susceptible to a low power 10 watt operating 23 megahertz away, then I think we've got much bigger concerns for the integrity of said military networks. Section 1608 of the NDA is, was an amendment that was accepted uh, in the markup in committee prohibiting the Secretary of Defense from entering into contract with any entity operating a commercial terrestrial network in the L band. And this amendment was specific to target Legato. While the NDA can determine contract authority for the Secretary of Defense, the management of commercial spectrum licenses lies solely within the independent Federal Communications Commission. There's no reason to include such a targeted provision just because the Department of Defense is unhappy with the decision of an otherwise independent federal agency. Similarly, um, the next amendment number 505, which strikes section 1609, uh, that prohibits funds from being used to retrofit any GPS device to mitigate interference from commercial terrestrial operations of the L band. The background is all similar as to, to what I have already alluded. Um, Department. You, you, you shut your, you gotta unmute uh, yourself. Beg, beg your pardon. The Department of Defense asserts that deployment. Oh man. Is it good? Thank you, Robert. I don't know what I'll do when Mr. Woodall's no longer on the committee. Um, so Department of Defense asserts the deployment of commercial terrestrial network will cause harmful interference to the DOD GPS. Once again, as stated previously, if the capabilities of supporting are susceptible to this 10 watts of power and 23 megahertz away, then I think we've got bigger concerns. Section 1609, is an amendment that was accepted at the markup in committee prohibiting Secretary of Defense from using any funds to mitigate GPS interference from Legato networks. So the amendment is in fact unnecessary as Legato is required by the FCC approval to repair or replace any government device susceptible to harmful interference. Now both of these amendments uh, that strike section 1608 and 1609 from the underlying bill uh, it's my understanding that negotiations are ongoing and I'm grateful for that. Uh, look forward to a successful resolution of the differences and the jurisdictional concerns that have been, uh, that have been brought to everyone's attention. Um, next amendment is 527, 
the Energy Savings Performance Contract Report. Uh, this amendment requires Department of Defense to report to Congress on the Department's application of energy savings performance contracts for the past five years, specifically the total investment, the location of each energy contract, limitations on the expansion, the impact of energy savings performance contracts on military readiness, and any other information the Secretary of Defense deems necessary. These contracts will allow the Department of Defense to increase its energy and water efficiency with no upfront cost to the taxpayer. Energy savings performance contracts have been helpful in reducing energy and water costs for the federal government while also being environmentally friendly. Expanding should be a priority of this Congress, and I urge support of this amendment as well. NDA amendment number 533, micronuclear reactors. This amendment increases funding from 50 million to 100 million to the Department of Defense's Strategic Capabilities Office for Micronuclear Reactor Research. Micronuclear reactors are the small, powerful, mobile energy solutions that can help power remote operating bases. Attacks on convoys delivering food, gear, and fuel are one of the main causes of casualties in recent engagements in Iraq and Afghanistan. These micro reactors are an option to reduce the number of convoys needed to keep certain installations up and running. 50 million is authorized in the base bill. I believe more can be done to improve the safety and energy security of our armed forces by increasing this funding to $100 million. Amendments number 540 and 688. Uh, 540 establishes the Secretary of Energy and the Secretary of Defense as co-chairs of the Nuclear Weapons Council to provide cabinet level visibility and accountability of our nuclear deterrent and the Nuclear Weapons Council budget process. Amendment 688 provides for stronger integration of mission support personnel of the Department of Energy and the National Nuclear Security Administration. These are bipartisan amendments offered by Chairman Perone and Ranking Member Walden of the Energy and Commerce Committee to preserve civilian control over our nuclear weapons programs and strengthen cabinet level accountability for the work on nuclear weapons. For almost 75 years, civilian control of atomic energy for peaceful weapons, for peaceful and weapons purposes has been an important part of our national policy. Civilian scientists and engineers at Department of Energy and its predecessors built the knowledge and laboratory architecture that has made the nuclear deterrent to win the Cold War possible and made the great national laboratory system that today is producing many advances for the nation. Maintaining this civilian control over nuclear programs is essential for harnessing the full capabilities of Department of Energy's enterprise for the nuclear deterrent from world-class supercomputers to other advances by civilian scientists. Unfortunately, chronic budget disputes amongst uh, bureaucrats at Department of Defense and Department of Energy have led to periodic efforts by some to put more control within the Department of Defense. I believe this approach to be mistaken. Congress should not cede civilian control of Department of Energy's nuclear weapons programs to the Department of Defense. A better approach is to do what these amendments are designed to do. Number one, put the Secretary of Energy and the Secretary of Defense at the top of the Nuclear Weapons Council as co-chairs. This will elevate the much needed joint planning for the nuclear deterrent to cabinet level accountability and makes clear that all DOE and DOE's National Nuclear Security Administration personnel who derive all of their legal authority from the Secretary are in fact responsible to the secretary. In fact, the secretary was uh, uh, did testify at one of our energy hearings uh, as recently as this week and underscored the importance of that, uh, that very phenomenon. This will maintain the benefits of the NNSA structure and serves to ensure that the secretary has the conventional management tools available to other cabinet departments, including the Department of Defense, to be effectively held to account for the nuclear weapons responsibilities. So I do urge that both amendments be made in order. I would also like, time permitting, to speak against uh, Amendment 603, Representative Sherman's Russia Sanctions Amendment. Amendment 603 imposes sanctions to prohibit Americans from purchasing or trading in new Russian sovereign debt in response to Russian interference in the United States elections. This uh, requires the Office of the Director of National Intelligence 
to report on foreign interference in elections and requires the president to impose sanctions if such interference occurs. This amendment attempts to target Russia for electoral interference, but instead harms United States commercial and strategic interests. The language prohibits United States companies from making any new investment in Russia's energy sector, which would prevent some already contractually obligated partnerships. Russian companies would have legal grounds to jettison United States companies from projects, allowing Russian ent entities to capture the former United States partner's share of the project. And let's be honest, the European Union has no interest in matching these proposed sanctions, creating disadvantages between United States businesses and our foreign competitors. Trade relations are one of the few mechanisms that force Russia to adhere to international norms. We certainly should not eliminate this influence. So I do urge that Amendment 603 by Representative Sherman not be made in order. Uh, next, I would like to speak favorably for Representative Banks Amendment number 247, which would include HR 1605, the Education Savings Accounts for Military Families Act in the fiscal year 2000, uh, uh, fiscal year 2021 NDAA. I am a co-sponsor of 1605. This would give children of our nation's armed services uh, greater access to school choice. This legislation would create a new voucher program for military families to use toward education, private school, charter school, homeschool, tutors, and more. At least 35% of our nation's active military servicemen and women are dissatisfied with the education that their children receive. This amendment would give these families more choices that would lead to better outcomes. As a co-sponsor of 1605, I fully, fully support the inclusion of this amendment and urge that it be made in order and be reported on favorably by the Rules Committee. And Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Let me catch my breath. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I'm now, uh, I now want to yield to Ms. Shalala. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'm introducing this amendment on behalf of myself and Representative Bacon uh, of Nebraska. Uh, this amendment would ensure that gold star families of our fallen heroes are cared for by giving their spouses the lifelong benefits they deserve. When a gold star spouse is handed a folded flag, it arrives with a lifelong commitment from the American people. These families deserve unquestionable support and honor of their loved ones, sacrifice for our freedom and security. Presently, if a surviving spouse with dependent children remarries, they no longer have access to MWR exchange and commissary benefits in their own right. When Sergeant First Class A.C. Arakaga arrived from Cuba at the age of 14, he was welcomed by a deeply patriotic Miami community. He graduated from high school in 2001, married his wife, Siana, in 2006, and welcomed a beautiful and healthy son, Alston, in 2008. A.C. was tragically killed while on tour in Afghanistan in 2011, but Siana vowed to follow the plan the couple had for their family with the support of the military. While many people assume that families like ACs are well taken care of, the reality is that some may lose earned benefits if they choose to rebuild their lives. Commissaries which sell tax-free groceries at 20 to 35% the cost of civilian stores can cut nearly a third off your grocery bill. Similarly, exchanges offered barber shops, laundry and dry cleaning services, restaurants, gas stations, and convenience stores with tax-free shopping and discounted goods and services. This amendment would allow Sienna and countless other surviving spouses to raise their families and keep the benefits that they were promised. I urge that this bipartisan amendment be made in order so we can continue to honor the fallen service members by fully supporting their families. Mr. Chairman, this has a special meaning for me because my grandmother was a gold star mother twice over. Thank you very much. I yield back. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll now yield to Mr. Arrington. Mr. Chairman, I miss serving with you on the Ag Committee. Uh, 
And it's good to see you. Thank you for the opportunity. And to my friend Tom Cole, our ranking member, uh, thank you also for uh, the privilege of uh, appearing before you and, and uh, offering up this very important amendment. Um, just a little background, and, and I'll try to make this very short uh, to the point. I, I represent the largest B-1 bomber base in the nation. And uh, Mr. Cole thought we were just the food, fuel, and fiber capital of the country. We're, actually, we're also the freedom fiber capital of the country. There in the key city of Abilene, Texas, we have these airmen and women of the 7th Bomb Wing and the 307th Airlift Wing. And the bombers played a critical uh, component of our air dominance. And they, they're a, a, a major weapon in a, a defense arsenal. And they have been utilized as, as the tip of the spear in deterring uh, the threats in the Korean Peninsula. Uh, they've also uh, been engaged in the um, basically the eradication of ISIS uh, in, in conflict there in the Middle East. But they've been utilized. The good news is they've provided a great deal of advantage to the United States and in, in our homeland security and defending our interests around the globe. The, the downside is they've been uh, stressed and they've been flown in such a way and so extensively that uh, they've we've created some structural integrity concerns. Uh, 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 over the last couple of years, the Air Force has done a deeper dive, a fatigue test, where they were doing the analysis on where the problems were and how long it would take to address them and how much it would cost. And the bottom line is they're recommending, based on that analysis, that they retire 17 of the 62 uh, B-1 bombers of, of the entire B-1 bomber fleet. Um, and they're going to, and basically the message is they can fix some of these birds and get them flying again, but some of them, uh, would, it would be cost prohibitive and they'd like to redirect those monies elsewhere. And I'm very sympathetic and supportive of our, uh, our leaders at the Air Force, uh, leaders at the Pentagon and this administration, and that's their recommendation. And I, uh, I, I, I've looked at the what information I've received from them, and they they're probably right. Some of these planes need to be sidelined uh, for the safety of the airmen and uh, for the sake of taxpayer investment for the greatest. Uh, defense posture for our country. But um, whether it's 17 or 15 or what the threshold was and, you know, at, at, at over which we'd have to spend X, Y, or Z more or less under it, all this analysis, uh, there's not a whole lot of detail there. So here's kind of my Solomon Amendment, and it would, it, it would basically acknowledge and recognize that these Planes have been stressed, and some more than likely would be cost prohibitive to fix and fly. But that it would also uh, acknowledge that we, as members of Congress, uh, ought to have detailed information in our oversight capacity to determine if 17 is the right number, and it's not 15 or 12. Maybe it should be 20. Um, so the amendment would basically take that 17 and, and just cut it in half and say, Air Force, Defense, you can redirect those monies where you see fit. And then over the next year, uh, prior to the NDAA, you would then present members of Congress, past members, and, and others who want to participate, uh, the justification for why that number needs to be above that uh, eight or nine upwards to 17. Um, and uh, so that's that's this very simple, straightforward amendment. And um, I'm very proud to represent Dias and the airmen there. And I think this is a compromise and I think it's a responsible compromise. And I would ask my colleagues, uh, Mr. McGovern, Chairman McGovern, to give the greatest consideration to supporting this 
and then next year we can come back hopefully with better information and and get that number as precise as possible thank you thank you uh, mr Stauber. Maybe maybe we'll, uh, we'll go to Mr. Estes. Thank you, Chairman McGovern and uh, Ranking Member Cole, uh, for the opportunity to, teach, to speak about Amendment Number Two Forty Three to this legislation. Uh, I'd like to thank Vice Chair Hastings for being gracious enough to co-sponsor this amendment, along with Representatives Walorski, Davis, Langevin, Timmons, Clay, Hood, Larson, and Johnson. Uh, I'm bringing this amendment up before the NDAA because a similar provision was added in the Senate's version of the NDAA. And I think as most of us in this meeting can agree, uh, so often the provisions coming from the House are much better than provisions coming from the Senate uh, in regards to most issues. I want to tell you a true story, uh, a story about uh, patriotic citizens who supported this nation over the past 100 years, but uh, focused on one, one particular moment. You know, a constituent of mine, uh, we'll just call her Jill, immigrated to this country, worked hard, made a life for herself, and made a conscious decision to support the country by purchasing a savings bond issued by the U.S. Treasury with the promise of a modest return. Now, you might think this was yesterday or 10 years ago. However, Jill made this purchase 100 years ago in 1920. Like many patriotic citizens throughout the country, Jill forgot about the savings bond. Throughout the years, whether she stored it under a mattress or later in a safe deposit box, the savings bond gathered interest as it matured. Unfortunately, Jill passed away in 1950 without telling her heirs about her savings bond, many of, many of which were lost or degraded over the years. Uh, I tell you the story to illustrate the millions of Americans across the country who purchased savings bonds to support our government during major conflicts, such as World War I, World War II, and the effort to rebuild and invest in our nation's future after that. Unfortunately, the US Treasury Department is not taking any action to repay bond owners or their heirs many of who are unaware that the bonds have matured. It's discouraging that we allow Treasury to continue to hold approximately $27 billion from the American people, especially since returning those dollars does not increase our deficit. As Kansas State Treasurer, I had to pursue legal action to help unite Kansas citizens with the money that was given to the U.S. government in the form of savings bonds years ago. While I was partially successful in this effort, there's still something that the Congress can do right now to help right some of those previous wrongs that have been perpetuated over the last 50 plus years. Uh, my amendment would require Treasury to transfer all records and ownership of unclaimed mature savings bonds to the states to find the rightful owners and heirs of these bonds. Uh, this effort will unite millions of Americans with their own money as our economy recovers. It's expected that this amendment would return over $532 million to Arizona, $3 billion to California, $421 million to Colorado, $1.4 billion to Florida, $745 million to Georgia, $469 million to Maryland, $1.5 billion to New York, $312 million to Oklahoma, $840 million to Pennsylvania, and $2.1 billion to Texas. I understand that uh, some people have said that this amendment would cost $47 billion over 10 years, uh, but that's it's calculated falsely. Uh, my amendment specifically limits the applicable bonds that have been turned over that were matured before January 1, 2017. Uh, these unclaimed savings bonds have already been accounted for as a liability in Treasury's books and must be repaid. Uh, I'd like to specifically thank the Assistant State Treasurer of Massachusetts and State Treasurer of Pennsylvania for their support in, in working through this process. I'm proud that so many representatives from both sides of the aisle, including the esteemed uh, vice chair of this committee, have stood up to reunite their constituents with money that's rightfully theirs. I hope we can continue to work together to help reunite our constituents with their money. And I humbly ask that you make this amendment in order, and I'm happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you very much. And let me just, before we go to questions, just see if Mr. Stauber is uh, here and uh, see his. Oh, Mr. Starber. Okay. Well, anyway, uh, oh, wait a minute. Here he is, Mr. Starber. Needs to unmute. 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 
No, you gotta. Yeah, you. Okay. Mr. Chair, Mr. Okay. Mr. Chair, can you hear me? I, I can hear you. I can hear you, but I see your I see your ceiling fan. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Chair, can you hear me? Uh, yeah, we, I've, we got, can, uh, I've got yeah. issues. Can you hear me, though, Mr. Chair? Yeah, okay. we can Thank hear you. Okay, so, thank you. No, I, Say I, that I, again? Yeah, we can hear you right now, yes. Thank you, Chairman McGovern and Ranking Member Cole, for your patience and for giving me the opportunity to, to speak today on, on uh, my amendment to H.R. 6395, the William M. Thornberry National Defense Authoriz Authorization Act for 2021. Amendment number 169 would allow the Navy to solicit contracts from non-home port shipyards for maintenance work should the shipyards meet the Navy's requirements for ship repair work. Currently, the Navy has a tremendous maintenance backlog, but under current law, there are certain restrictions that limit where naval vessels can undertake maintenance repair. Unless these restrictions are lifted, the Navy's backlog will only increase exponentially over time. At the same time, there are fully qualified shipyards in the rest of the United States, including the Great Lakes, Gulf Coast, and Alaska, that can perform repair work for certain types of naval vessels. Although, although these vessels may not be home ported in these regions of the country, it should be within the Secretary's discretion to, to decide what types of vessels could be sent to such shipyards to help with the Navy's maintenance backlog. Last year, my amendment, which was adopted into the NDAA for 2020, requested the Navy create a report on the feasibility of doing maintenance work on naval vessels at shipyards other than shipyards in the vessel's home port. The report was produced this spring and within the report, the Navy concluded that the law could be modified to allow the Navy to use non-home port yards to meet surge capacity where the contract would be for more than 10 months and the yard has either an MSRA or an ABR with the Navy. We have done the proper examination. Now it is time to give the Navy the authority it needs to reduce its maintenance backlog and better address our military readiness. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I yield back. Well, thank you very much uh, for your testimony. Um, I have no questions. Uh, Mr. Cole, do you have any questions or comments? Uh, no, no questions, Mr. Chairman. It was a striking visual, though, for Mr. Stalver. So, uh. all right. All right. Uh, okay, we get to Ms. Torres. Uh, Mr. Woodall. No, oh, Mr. Uh, uh, Perlmutter. Dr. Burgess. No questions. All right, Ms. Lesko. I just want to say thanks to everybody. Mr. Stauber, you look like you're in a cabin or something. <laughs> and, um, and, and also uh, to Mr. Estes, I, I like your idea for the amendment. And I yield back. Mr. Raskin. No questions, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Scanlon. No questions, thank you. Mr. Morelli. No, I'm fine, Mr. Chairman, thank you. Ms. Shalala. Ms. Matsui. No questions, Mr. Chairman. All right, I want to thank you all for being here, and uh, and you you can you can uh, you can go. All right, thank you very much. So we have another panel here now, um, and I want to welcome our next panel, Mr. Gomert, Mr. Grothman, Mr. Perry, Mr. Norman, and Mr. And Mr. Crawford. Uh, so I want to thank you for the testimony today. Any written materials you submit to rules documents at mail.house.gov before the conclusion of this hearing will, will without objection, be entered into the record. Uh, and so having said all of that, um, I now recognize the distinguished gentleman from Texas, Mr. Gomert. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, members. I know you've been here for a long time, so I'm gonna be brief, believe it or not, on my amendments. but. Uh, let me tell you, our friend, the late great, and I mean that sincerely, Elijah Cummings, the Congressional Black Caucus, as well as uh, I have something in common. We all saw that Sergeant Derek Miller was 
have suffered a grave injustice at the hands of the UCMA, and uh, he was uh, unjustly prosecuted and convicted and sentenced around seven years in prison. Uh, I testified at both his, the hearings on, on this uh, with the um, parole board trying to get justice. Uh, we got some semblance. He's been out for over a year, and he's been working in my office, out of my office for the Congressional Justice for Warriors Caucus. And uh, he and I are both Christians, but I don't know that I could be as forgiving as he has. He has an amazing attitude, smart. And we have found a number of things that uh, would be a good start in um, fixing the UCMJ. And in fairness, uh, we had asked Secretary Esper to assist us in things that he could see, and his response reminded me a little bit of uh, uh, Sergeant Schultz in the old Hogan's Heroes uh, show, where he sees nothing, nothing wrong, everything's great. Uh, but when I was in the Army for four years, it kind of concerned me that the commanding general, or if you're in the Navy, the uh, commanding admiral, uh, personally selected the people to be on the jury. You had no peremptory strikes. Everybody there stayed there. Judges would not allow um, challenges for cause, even when there was real cause. The judge would instruct them that we're all part of this service, and you'll follow my order when I tell you not to be biased. Oh, oh, yes, sure. So anyway, um, I also want to thank uh, Professor Jeffrey Atticott, who was a lieutenant colonel in uh, Army JAG, and uh, Charles Stimson, former Navy JAG, so many others. But here, here are the uh, proposed amendments. First of all, number 168, um, it outlines the career track for military judges. We should not have a situation continue where uh, when a trial counsel becomes comes before a judge and or even argues that the judge is biased or unfair, that that judge then ends up being appointed to be the rater for that trial counsel. Uh, similarly, it sure shouldn't be that the commanding general or admiral who, who signed off ordering the trial, handpicking the jurors, and then he gets to rate the judge uh, as one of the judges rater for uh, to determine whether he continues on an upward slope uh, uh, for his career. So this would prevent uh, those kinds of uh, what I would consider conflicts of interest from occurring. Uh, it's a tweak to the law, but it would help make sure we got a little bit more justice and a little less injustice. Uh, 172 is an instruction that no soldier may brief another on a pending case because they're potential jury members. Uh, at one time, the uh, a member of the accused own unit could not be on the jury, which sometimes was a bit unfair, um, but that got changed. And so we don't need a situation where the commander who sent the charges up to the convening authority, a general or admiral, uh, he ends up briefing all, all the members of the soldiers, sailors, whatever, in his unit about a case making clear what he wants to happen. Uh, so that would prevent that from happening so that we could have a better shot at a fair, impartial jury. 176 outlines the modification to the military title system. Uh, CID has done a good job many times, but the way the title system works in the military uh, too often, and it, there's a lot of injustice that's arisen out of it, but uh, they'll swoop up a whole group, whether it's platoon, squad, whatever, and make them all suspects enter them into the titling system, and then that stays there for the rest of those service members' lives, even though they've been completely exonerated 
and they went on to uh, pursue the actual guilty party. All of those people, because of the unit they were in, end up having problems the rest of their lives, even though they served honorably and well and committed no offenses. So we really need a tweak to that. And then two others, uh, 192 uh, would eliminate the law currently that no military member, no matter how heinous the injustice he suffers or she suffers, you can't go to the Supreme Court. And this would change that by allowing uh, appeal of some cases, if the Supreme Court accepts them, to go all the way so that we could get some fixes to some things that have been very um, unjust. And then last requires a unanimous jury verdict. I run into a lot of people that had no idea that you could be convicted as a criminal, put in prison for life, and you had a fourth of the jury say, he's just not guilty, this isn't right. So this would uh, bring about what we have uh, for a civil right, and that is you got to have a unanimous verdict if you're going to take away somebody's liberty and put them in prison. So those in a nutshell are the amendments. Mr. Chairman, you and I have disagreed on many things, but I know you have been a valiant uh, fighter for civil rights over your career, and that's really what this is. And it would, I would submit it's even more important because these are the people that have volunteered to protect us, and we ought to protect them by giving them a better justice system. Thank you. Thank you very much for being here. Mr. Grothman. I don't see him, so we'll go to Mr. Perry. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and uh, and everybody there. Listen, first of all, I really appreciate the Rules Committee. I got to serve on rules when I was in the House of Representatives here in Pennsylvania. Of course, one of the great things, and I really appreciate it. I know you've had a long day. I think that every member appreciates as we get to talk about the things that are important to us in depth. I, I want to make it as quick as I can uh, for you. So I got a lot of information, but I'm going to go through it, through it quickly. Um, Amendment 377 is rejecting the People's Republic of China's claims concerning certain islands and territories in the East and South China Sea. This amendment, number 377, would be added to the end of subtitle G of Title uh, 12 of H.R. 6395, the William M. Thornberry National Defense Authorization, Authorization Act for fiscal year 2021. This amendment would make it the policy of this nation, the United States of America, to, reje to reject the People's Republic of China's claim over all disputed islands and territories in the East and South China Sea. Specifically, our nation would reject the PRC's claims over the Senkaku Islands, the East China Sea, as well as the Spratly Islands, Scarborough Shoal, and the Parcel, Paracel Islands. I understand that, the, that some wish to diminish this amendment to simply more or less mimic the administration's announcement on Monday. I want to be absolutely clear that I respect the administration's decision to align the U.S. position on the PRC's maritime claims in the South China Sea with the tribunal's decision. But quite honestly, that should have been done from the get-go. And given the current geopolitical realities in the South China Sea, it doesn't go far enough. The PRC doesn't respect or acknowledge international law and remain undeterred in their goal of regional hegemony. The fact that we now say our position will align with the tribunal's decisions is not going to change the reality of the situation. And I can sure assure everybody that China will continue to militarize Woody Island and other parts of the region and do, will do so with unmitigating contempt for our allies. The correct approach from our side, the United States Congress, is not for us to water down any amendment in this, in this uh, area, but to point that it has zero impact or to the point that it has zero impact. The current amendment, as I've offered, is not an opportunity for any of us to get positive press from China. I can assure you that. But I also will assure you that our adversaries in Beijing are not going to be cowed by an amendment that simply demonstrates our unwillingness to do anything to defend our interests and those of our allies in the face of adversity. Uh, any efforts to include a watered-down amendment signals to Beijing the limits of our resolve. 
Given everything China has wrought in the world, it's clearly that a strategy of appeasement will not suffice. We need to push back vigorously and we need to demonstrate that we are not about to let Beijing government dictate the future course of global affairs. They willingly violate the sovereignty of neighboring states, ensuring no other countries in the area can engage in hydrocarbon development or any other type of development that stands in the way of its specious and unlawful claims in the East and South China Seas. This amendment gets us to where we need to be. By renouncing China's so-called control over these islands, we are forcefully attacking their claims, which is something we, we clearly need to do. If we do not do this, the PRC will continue to behave like international maritime law does not exist and will certainly continue to behave like it doesn't apply to them. And at that point, what does this committee or any of us plan to do? So that's that, that's, uh, that amendment. Uh, amendment 400 formally designating Taiwan as a major non-NATO ally. This amendment, LOC 400, would be added to the end of subtitle F of Title 12 of H.R. 6395, the William M. Thornberry National Defense Authorization Act for fiscal year 2021. This amendment would formally designate Taiwan as a major non-NATO ally. Nearly 18 years ago, this Congress passed the Foreign Relations Authorization Act of FI 2003, which required that Taiwan be treated as though it were a designated a major non-NATO ally. It was the right move then, but it is wholly ad inadequate now. The People's Republic of China needs to understand that we hold our relationship with Taiwan in especially high regard. There cannot be a second class of country within our major uh, non-NATO allies. By voting for this amendment, China would see the depth of our resolve towards Taiwan. This amendment is emblematic of what we need to be doing now, pushing back against China's malicious attacks against international law and accept norms of behavior. If the coronavirus had originated in Taiwan instead, Taiwan instead of Wuhan, China, you can bet that there would have been no worldwide pandemic. There would have been no cover-up, no disinformation campaign and full cooperation with the world's leading scientific bodies and governing institutions. And that's because Taiwan represents what a responsible and decent global actor should look like. Cannot begin to understand why we could even hesitate to reward countries like Taiwan at the expense of a nation that must now be considered the greatest state level threat to the security of the United States. And I urge all my colleagues to support this amendment in recognition of the critically important ties between Taiwan and the United States. Two more to go, Mr. Chairman. LOC 412, Protecting the Academic Integrity Act. This amendment, LOC 412, would be added to the end of title uh, 17 of H.R. 6395, the William M. Thornberry National Defense Authorization Act of, for fiscal year 2021. This amendment, which, uh, which is H.R. 3921 in the House, would provide a needed transparency of foreign influence through gifts and contracts in U.S. universities and not a moment too soon. According to, February, to a February 2019 Senate testimony study or uh, um, a report, Deputy Secretary of Education, Dr. Mitchell Zayas, cited that while 3,700 degree-granting institutions in, in the U.S. are covered under the current reporting law, fewer than 3% have ever reported receiving foreign gifts or contracts. More than 70% of U.S. schools that receive more than $250,000 from the Chinese government for the establishment of Confucius Institutes since 2006 failed to properly report the gift. Following an investigation into low reporting results from institutes of higher education, the Department of Education found this past February that over six billion in foreign donations from adversarial countries went unreported. The Education Department's own legal counsel concluded that evidence suggests massive investments of foreign money have bred dependency and distorted the decision-making mission and values of too many institutions. The amendment I'm offering today puts a stop to all that in three key ways. First, it reduces the reporting threshold from 250,000 to 50,000, providing transparency into the sheer amount of foreign funding going into our universities. Second, it requires U.S. universities to report which department, agency, office, or division of a foreign government provided the gift or contract. This would bring greater transparency to potential intentions of these gifts and contracts. Finally, this amendment directs the GAO to study and publicly report on the reasons U.S. universities fail to comply with current law. This legislation will keep foreign interests from compromising 
the academic integrity of American colleges and universities while still respecting the importance of institutional autonomy and academic freedom. And I urge my colleagues, colleagues to support and vote yes on this amendment. Finally, LOC 653 directs the Secretary of Defense in consultation with relevant federal departments and agencies to prepare an, an assessment on the People's Liberation Army of the People's Republic of China 2035 modernization target. This amendment, LOC 653, would be added to the end of subtitle G of Title 12 of H.R. 6395, the William M. Thornberry National Defense Authorization Act for fiscal year 2021. The People's Liberation Army, the PLA, of the People's Republic of China is modernizing rapidly and hopes to fully modernize its armed forces and national defense by 2035. That is their stated goal. That raises numerous questions on how to best to confront China's rising threat as well as how our allies in the region should adapt. This, amendment's, this amendment directs the Secretary of Defense to prepare an assessment on how the PLA's modernization targets could impact the effectiveness of Taiwan's, Taiwan's self-defense capabilities. This report will also assess how, how sh uh, such modernization could impact U.S. interests, in including those articulated in the Taiwan Relations Act. The Taiwan Relations Act requires the United States to resist any resort, resort to force or other forms of coercion, coercion that could jeopardize the security or the social or economic system of the people of Taiwan. Following the completion of this assessment, the Secretary of Defense will provide the assessment in a classified written report to the Congress for correction, Congressional Defense Committee, as well as other committees of jurisdiction, including the House Foreign Affairs Committee. Such an amendment will hopefully be met by bipartisan support, and I look forward to its passage and urge support. And with that, Mr. Chairman and, and members of the committee, thank you for your, your diligence, dedication, and patience today. Thank you very much. Mr. Norman. Thank, <clears throat> thank you so much, Mr. Uh, Chairman and the ranking members and members of the committee. My amendment is 719 to House Rule 6395, the William Mike Thornberry National Defense Authorization Act for fiscal year 2021. In a nutshell, uh, what this involves is a $7.5 million um, pilot program that was voted on last year and agreed to by the majority. Uh, and we got a letter from the Navy uh, at the last minute saying, and this is to replace a turret, an old turret that the Navy was going to replace anyway. And some of the reason they responded to us and said that they, they were going to do the pilot program but not test the two new turrets, that would save money. And, and I'll read the letter, but bottom line, that's what it is. Money that was allocated previously, last year, uh, and the Navy is pretty much agreed to that the old turret is outdated. Uh, it's costly, and the new turrets have a lot of uh, advantages. That's why we voted last year to fund the pilot program to test the two out. So they wrote us and said they weren't going to do the uh, test program. Uh, I mean, they were going to do the spend the seven and a half million, but they're going to test the old one, which is a waste of, of money. Um, uh, you know, and, and the, the simply in its conception is to increase the lethality of the ex, ex, expeditionary sea bases to enable the self-defense. It's a small change that, as I mentioned, would save huge dollars, be a cost saver. And uh, again, the Navy was going to do it. And then at the last minute uh, said that uh, they were going to go ahead and go with the funding, but they're just going to test the same thing. That, in a nutshell, uh, is it. I hope you would rule that in order. Thank you very much, Mr. Crawford. Gotcha. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate it. Um, I'll be as quick as I can. I have four amendments to this NDA, all of which are uh, explosive ordnance disposal or EOD related. Uh, soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines. It's a joint service uh, community and allows these uh, EOD soldiers to be their best, e e and sailors, airmen, and Marines as well. As a former EOD soldier, I have a deep personal appreciation for congressional support of this small but critical community. EOD warriors are highly trained operators that do back-to-back -back deployments mm -hmm. and suffer one of the highest casualty rates in the military. 
Upon return home from deployment, DOD operators protect national security events uh, such as conventions, perform very important persons' technical security details along with the Secret Service, and support civil authorities by defusing IEDs and recover military ordinance to threaten their communities. Because of their small size, the service tend to overlook this low density, high demand asset. Thus, DOD forces consistently do not receive the necessary resources our congress, uh, from our congressional body. My first amendment, Crawford 279, continues acquisition reform. This amendment specifically improves uh, report requirements in the base NDAA to identify the specific issues with the current process so that Congress can rectify the situation next year. Briefly, the current acquisition and procurement processes used for EOD common tools and, and equipment are broken. This process requires each of the services to separately approve requirements and separately perform programming and budget ex execution actions to buy the very same common use equipment item. Compare this with military departments having joint program executive offices uh, that use one required document and have auditable joint funding to purchase and acquire jointly used equipment. The tactical EOD units are fed up with this and buy commercially available off-the-shelf equipment using overseas contingency operations funding rather than submitting this current process that takes roughly 15 years. Buying COTS by OCO funding may the, be the fastest method. However, this causes sustainment problems in theater for the Joint Force Commander. The logistics and maintenance system simply cannot support these non-standard equipment items such as different robotic systems, portable x-ray equipment to diagnose IEDs, and other life-saving equipment technology. My next amendment, Crawford 261, allows the Army an additional five years to ready itself for the Army EOD Corps as a basic branch, designates the EOD Commandant, Chief of EOD, an Army EOD qualified general officer as the responsible senior leader on ensuring processes on EOD soldier mobility training and their supported special operations forces. The services, with the exception of the Army, have assigned responsibility to senior leaders on ensuring that their EOD operators possess necessary mobility skills such as airborne, combat diving, fast roping, etc., to support special operations forces. The first five Army general purpose force units that deployed were EOD companies to support five joint special operations task forces. And fast forwarding to today, roughly 50% of force tracking number deploying EOD units support U.S. Special Operations Command units. EOD soldiers that lack requisite mobility skills hamper soft mission accomplishment. Last year, Congress allowed the Army until 30 September 2020 to fix identified problems. The Army will need more time to implement the EOD Commandant, Chief of EOD, Army EOD Qualified General Officer position, ensure the processes on EOD soldiers' mobility skills to support soft and fix several other identified problem areas. Crawford 267 provides Commander U.S. Special Operations Command authority on EOD as a special operations capability by adding EOD to the list of special operations activities designated in Section 167K of Title 10 USC. Currently, Section 167K contains nine activities, including direct action, counterterrorism, and even things like civil affairs. EOD has become a crucial part of special operations capability as our enemies have become more reliant on explosive devices. Congress should ensure that Commander U.S. SOCOM gains the authority so that EOD forces receive required commensurate resources. Uh, Crawford 745 edits the requirements for study of EOD outlined in Section 1702 and requires the federal government to consult with outside EOD support groups like the U.S. Bomb Technician Association, of which I'm a member, and EOD Warrior Foundation. We need to take a non-traditional approach to solve these non-traditional problems. These groups provide immense support to the bomb disposal community and can provide valuable insight to the government in this study. Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member, thank you and the Rules Committee for considering these amendments. Our EOD warriors need Congress's support, and I greatly appreciate these amendments being made in order. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I think Mr. Grothman is back. Okay. You might, you might want to unmute. Unmute. We can, we, yeah. There we are. Can you hear me? Yes, now we can. Yeah. All right. Great. I have three amendments. I don't mean to bother you with three amendments, but two are my colleagues' amendments. And because we all have good friends in the Congress, I must lead with my colleagues' amendments. The first one is Amendment 474, which is actually Representative Gallagher's amendment. If you've been reading your emails lately, you know Mike Gallagher has a newborn baby. Because he has a newborn baby, first of all, he cannot appear at this hearing. And secondly, we must be very friendly to his amendment. Um, 
the amendment concerns the family of medium tactical vehicles. Uh, in the past, Army officials have expressed concern about preserving skills and capabilities for our original equipment manufacturers and suppliers. By Department of Defense definition, the minimum sustaining rate is the production rate for each budget year that is necessary to keep production lines open while maintaining a base of responsive vendors and suppliers. The, the family of medium tactical vehicles, like many other vehicles, is made up of a fragile network of su suppliers. The president's budget and HR 6395 failed to meet the FMTV minimum sustaining rate to be produced affordably and ensure the survival of suppliers by $86 million. In this amendment, we're adding $50 million for the family of medium tactical vehicles to close the gap between the minimum sustaining rate, rate and the current authorized amount allowing, which will allow these trucks to be produced much more affordable, affordable. I think I should address why this did not make it in the original bill. The original bill, uh, the vote took place on the day in which uh, Congressman Gallagher's child was born. So we couldn't make it, and that's why we are bringing it up now. That's the first amendment, and I, I am also a co-sponsor of that amendment. Uh, some of the trucks under that amendment that I think are going to be built are built in Oshkosh, Wisconsin. I know members of HASC have almost all of them toured that facility, and you know how important that facility is. Um, the next bill that I'm going to deal with is Chewy Garcia's bill, which is related to these payday loan people. We passed a bill a while back putting a 36% cap on these vehicles. I'm sorry, a 36% cap on these payday loans to veterans uh, or to servicemen on, on uh, military bases. This bill extends the 36% interest rate cap to all consumer loans, especially veterans and Gold Star families but all loans. A variety of states have already capped loans at 36%, including Connecticut. Uh, by the way, I'm told this is uh, Amendment 530, if I got it wrong. Um, they have already opposed these caps and they're working very well. So there are certain alarmists who are gonna say, oh my goodness, if we cap interest rates at 36%, people aren't gonna be able to get a loan. That's not what's going on right now. Um, so we would like to um, have added to this bill the Veterans and Consumers Fair Credit Act, not only for Congressman Garcia, but for Congressman Grothman, who makes it a bipartisan bill. So that is something we, we, beg, uh, we beg that it be done for Representative Garcia. And now we have my own bill, my own amendment, uh, Amendment 565. Overall, I have sometimes been critical of spending in the defense budget. Um, there was an assessment done by the Office of the Secretary of Defense, which implied rather than 11 uh, aircraft carriers, we could make do with nine. Because I'm a very gentle person, my amendment only says that if the Navy wants to, they can reduce the number of aircraft carriers from 11 to 10. Uh, the bill as drafted would say that even the Army feels they don't need another aircraft carrier, they have to stick with 11. I'll admit partly my bias here comes from reading military history. And of course, you, you read about the, uh, the Battle of the Midway, uh, probably the most important American naval battle maybe in our history. And uh, it's now coming up on 75 years ago. And in the Battle of the Midway, I think in two days, maybe one day, uh, four Japanese aircraft carriers were sunken very quickly. And there's some people there for a little bit skeptical. Well, we do need aircraft carriers, uh, skeptical in an all out war, how long they were gonna last. I'm not an expert in, in the military. Uh, I am a little bit concerned about the huge number, not only uh, whether some of them would last long in an all out conflict, but the huge number of people who would die if we sunk an aircraft carrier, if our opponents sunk an aircraft carrier. So, uh, for that reason, I introduce Amendment 565, which does not require reduction in aircraft carriers, just allows if the Navy wants there to be a reduction, 
they can reduce not by two, as the internal assessment says, but just by one, just in case the Navy wants to. So those are the three amendments I'm throwing before your folks. Uh, if you so desire, because I care so much for my friends, um, I know you're taking up three here. You can send 565 back to me because I know how hard it is to get that sort of amendment through here. Um, but those are the three amendments I, I throw out to you, and I stand ready to answer whatever questions you want from my beautiful office in downtown Fond du Lac, Wisconsin. Well, thank you very much. Um, and I want to thank the entire panel. Um, Mr. Cole, any questions? No questions, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, Ms. Torres, any questions? No questions, Mr. Chairman. Right, Mr. Woodall. Hey, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Norman, are you, uh, are you still with us? Uh, yes, yes, I am. We've got a couple of amendments uh, today that are designed to get the DOD to do what we ask for the DOD uh, to do. Uh, we provide a whole lot of money in that direction, and sometimes they go off and do it their own way instead of the way that Congress uh, instructed it. Is that the way you would characterize your amendment that, that we voted in a bipartisan way last year to direct the DOD, but DOD has decided to do it differently than Congress directed? It is, Rob, and that's why I don't really understand it. I mean, we allocated the money. We had uh, two systems that were going to save the Navy money. We're new. Uh, I think the existing uh, territories are uh, 30 or 40 years old, and the Navy agrees it needs to be changed. But then to come back uh, at the last minute uh, to say that they're going to stay with the old system and will still spend that $7.5 million to test the system they're replacing makes no sense. So that's that's what's unbelievable. They did it on the last day of submission for amendments. Um, so that's why we're asking to, uh, you know, to to abide by what we passed last year and let's get this let's get this going. Yeah, well, Mr. Chairman, I hope we'll be able to to uh, take a hard look at the Norman uh, Amendment. Uh, we disagree on a lot of things as it relates uh, to the the NDAA bill, but once we have spoken with the congressional voice, uh, I think that we do both the institution uh, of uh, the Pentagon as an institution and the Congress as an institution a disservice uh, by allowing folks to go their own way uh, in the presence of congressional uh, direction. So I thank the gentleman for bringing the amendment, and I yield back. All right, thank you. Uh, okay, uh, Mr. Perlmutter, Dr. Burgess. Mr. Uh, Raskin. No questions, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Lesko. No questions. Uh, Ms. Scanlon. Mr. Morelli. Ms. Shalala. Ms. Matsui. No questions, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Does any other member of the committee wish to ask a question? Seeing none, I wish to thank our witnesses for their testimony. You are now excused. Are there any other members who wish to testify on Senate Amendment to H.R. 1957, H.R. 6395, H.R. 7027, or H.R. 7327? Seeing none, this closes the hearing portion of our meeting. Uh, without objection, the committee stands a recess subject to the call of the chair. I think it's going to be at least an hour, might be a little bit more, but you just you can plan at least we have an hour here and we will stay in close touch with mr cole and his team to make sure that uh everybody knows what's going on but that's kind of where we are mr and chairman yes mr morelli is it all right for us to turn the cameras off during the recess uh, hold let me uh, let me just double check i think mm -hmm. i think it is because, because we are recessing so i mean i won't log off but if we can turn the cameras off in the yeah, yeah. right Yes, video off is fine. Yeah, video off is fine. Good. Very good. Thank you, sir. All right, we'll see you soon. I think you ought to keep Morelli under constant supervision. Yeah, we <laughs> <laughs>
Hello, I'm Mary Gay Scanlon from Pennsylvania's 5th Congressional District, and I'm grateful for the opportunity to participate in the 2020 Black Maternal Health Stakeholder Summit to address the United States' urgent Black maternal health crisis. The United States maternal health mortality
come to order um, and uh, I welcome back everybody. Uh, this is later than I thought and um, I'm, I apologize for it, but we were waiting for CBO scores and other uh, technical uh, necessities before we could get here today. So again, thank you for coming back. But at this time, the chair will entertain a motion from the distinguished gentlewoman from, the, from Pennsylvania, Ms. Scanlon. Mr. Chairman, I move that the committee grant H.R. 6395, the William M. Mac Thornberry National Defense Authorization Act for fiscal year 2021, a structured rule. The rule provides one hour of debate equally divided and controlled by the chair and ranking member, ranking minority member of the Committee on Armed Services. The rules, rule waives all points of order against consideration of the bill. The rule provides that an amendment in the nature of a substitute consisting of the text of Rules Committee Print 116-57 shall be considered as adopted, and the bill as amended shall be considered as read. The rule waives all points of order against provisions in the bill as amended. Section 2 of the rule provides the following debate, each further amendment printed in the Rules Committee report not earlier considered as part of the amendments on block pursuant to Section 3 shall be considered only in the order printed in the report may be offered only by a member designated in, the, designated in the report, shall be considered as read, shall be debatable for the time specified in the report, equally divided and controlled by the proponent and an opponent, may be withdrawn by the proponent at any time before the question is put thereon, shall not be subject to amendment, and shall not be subject to a demand for division of the question. Section 3 of the rule provides that at any time after the debate, the chair of the Committee on Armed Services or his designee may offer amendments on block consisting of further amendments printed in the Rules Committee report not earlier disposed of. Amendments on block shall be considered as read, shall be debatable for 30 minutes, equally divided and controlled by the chair and ranking minority member of the Committee on Armed Services or their designees, shall not be subject to amendment and shall not be subject to a demand for division of the question. The rule waives all points of order against the further amendments printed in the Rules Committee report and amendments on block described in section three. The rule provides one motion to recommit with or without instructions. The rule provides consideration of H.R. 7027, the Child Care is Essential Act, under a closed rule. The rule provides one hour of debate equally divided among and controlled by the chair and ranking minority member of the Committee on Appropriations and the chair and ranking, member, ranking minority member of the Committee on Education and Labor. The rule waives all points of order against consideration of the bill. The rule provides that an amendment in the nature of a substitute consisting of the text of Rules Committee Print 116-58 shall be considered as adopted and the bill as amended shall be considered as read. The rule waives all points of order against provisions in the bill as amended. The rule provides that Clause 2E of Rule 21 shall not apply during consideration of the bill. The rule provides one motion to recommit with or without instruction. The rule also provides for consideration of H.R. 7327, the Child Care for Economic Recovery Act. The rule provides one hour of debate equally divided among and controlled by the chair and ranking minority member of the Committee on Appropriations and the chair and ranking minority member of the Committee on Ways and Means. The rule waives all points of order against consideration of the bill. The rule provides that the bill should be considered as read. The rule waives all points of order against provisions in the bill. The rule provides that Clause 2E of Rule 21 shall not apply during consideration of the bill. The rule provides one motion to recommit. The rule provides for consideration of the Senate amendments to H.R. 1957, the Great American Outdoors Act. The rule makes in order a single motion offered by the Chair of the Committee on Natural Resources or his designee that the House concur in the Senate amendments. The rule provides one hour of debate on the motion equally divided and controlled by the chair and ranking minority member of the Committee on Natural Resources. The rule waives all points of order against consideration of the motion and provides that it shall not be subject to a demand for division of the question. The rule provides that the Senate amendments and the motion shall be considered as read. Finally, the rule amends House Resolution 967 agreed to May 15, 2020, as amended by House Resolution 1017, I'm sorry, 1017, agreed to June 25th, 2020. In section four, by striking July 31st, 2020, and inserting September 21st, 2020. In section 11, by striking legislative day of July 31st, 2020, and inserting calendar day of September 20th, 2020. And in section 12, by striking July 31st, 2020, and inserting September 21st, 2020. Thank you, Brian. 
Thank you very much. Uh, you've heard the motion from the gentleman from Pennsylvania. Is there any amendment or discussion? Mr. Cole. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment to the rule. I move that uh, the committee provide an open rule for H.R. 7027 and H.R. 6395. Chairman, it's unfortunate that H.R. 7027 comes before us as another closed rule without a committee markup. Uh, the least we can do is give this legislation an open rule so that all members may be afforded the opportunity to offer their ideas on the House floor. Furthermore, Mr. Chairman, while we are proud of the bipartisan work of the Armed Services Committee, uh, uh, was unable to accomplish in drafting H.R. 6395, there's always an opportunity to do better and provide for more openness. By giving H.R. 6395 an open rule, we can give all members a chance to impact this important piece of legislation. Uh, you heard the um, uh, amendment from the gentleman from Oklahoma. Any discussion? Uh, hearing none, the vote is on the Cole Amendment. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed say no. 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 In the opinion of the chair, the no's have it. Mr. Chairman, on that, I request the roll call vote. A uh, roll call vote has been requested. Uh, Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Hastings. Mrs. Torres. <clears throat> no. Mrs. Torres, no. Mr. Perlmutter. No. Mr. Perlmutter, no. Mr. Raskin. Right. You, you, you got to say it. Chairman, <laughs> <laughs> you can see him as problem. Yeah. You, you got to unmute. I think we've got him, Mr. Chairman. Why don't we come back to Mr. Brown? Can't hear you, Jamie. <laughs> Miss Scanlon. No. Miss Scanlon. No. Mr. Morelli. No. Mr. Morelli. No. Layla. No. Miss Layla. No. Miss Matsui. No. Miss Matsui. No. Mr. Cole. Aye. Mr. Cole. Aye. Mr. Woodall. Aye. Mr. Woodall. Aye. Mr. Burgess. Mrs. Lesko. Aye. Mrs. Lesko. Aye. Mr. Chairman. No. Mr. Chairman. No. And how is Mr. Raskin recorded? Mr. Raskin is not recorded. Jamie, open the window and shout. Well, I'll write it on a piece of paper and hold it up. Where where do you go? You have to keep the vote open. Mr. Chairman, I think he was walking around his house trying to get help. <laughs> it was That's kind of fun watching him put on his tie too. <laughs> We just just want to do a couple of minutes here to see what we can get hooked up here. You hear me now? I'm on a new device. Yeah. We, 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 we can hear you. We can't see you. you can you activate your video? Let's see. Let's see. There you go. Hey. Yay. How is Mr. Raskin recorded? Mr. Raskin is not recorded. I would like to be recorded no. Mr. Raskin, no. Clerk report the total. Three yeas, eight nays. Amendment is not agreed to. Further amendments, Mr. Cole. Thank yes. You. Well, since my good friend from Maryland struggled so hard, <laughs> I, I, I want to provide at least one more opportunity to do the right thing. So, Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment to the rule. I move the committee uh, strike from the rule the appropriate sections providing for the consideration of HR 7027, and HR 7327, to make the necessary changes. Mr. Chairman, it's unfortunate that these two bills have come before us today after receiving no markup, despite the Democratic majority's uh, changes to the rule requiring such, and additionally providing for remote markup capability. The purpose of my amendment is to allow these two pieces of legislation to have the markup they deserve. It's not that these pieces of legislation are not important, 
that don't deserve full consideration. Frankly, they do. I think there's a lot of bipartisan support for uh, child care, um, uh, you know, additional resources. Uh, in fact, they're, you know, they're important for the reason, uh, for, or for this reason, and they deserve to be treated as such and should uh, receive a markup to ensure that we're creating this possible legislation capable of becoming law. Simply put, if the Appropriations Committee has the capability, which it does, and I'm very proud of the Appropriations Committee, uh, to complete a marathon markup sessions covering 12, 12 appropriations bills uh, over the last 10 days, and certainly this legislation has uh, been marked up before coming to this. For that reason, I urge the adoption of my motion for the committee of jurisdiction to mark up the bill before being sent to the floor as House rules dictate. Thank you. Thank you very much. You heard the uh, amendment from the gentleman from Oklahoma. Any discussion? Uh, hearing none, the vote is on the Cole Amendment. All those in favor say aye. 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 No. 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 Many of the chair, the no's have it. And Mr. Chairman, I heard a babble of voices, I think, that said aye. So I'm going to ask for a roll call. Just a <laughs> Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Hastings. Mrs. Torres. No, but um, may I say that it's very difficult to hear Mr. Cole? No, you, you need, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Mrs. Torres? No. Mr. Perlmutter? No. Mr. Perlmutter? No. Mr. Raskin? No. Mr. Raskin? No. Ms. Scanlon? No. Ms. Scanlon? No. Mr. Morelli? No. Mr. Morelli? No. Ms. Shalala? No. Ms. Shalala? No. Ms. Matsui? No. Ms. Matsui? No. Mr. Cole? I, but Mr. Chairman, I just have to add that I think it's often hard to hear me for the uh, majority. So, <laughs> and I'm a friend from California's problem. Are, are you sure you, you come through loud and clear to me? <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Cole? Aye. Mr. Woodall? Aye. Mr. Woodall? Aye. Mr. Burgess? Mrs. Lesko? Aye. Mrs. Lesko? Aye. Mr. Chairman? No. Mr. Chairman, no. Are you really sure you heard me, Mr. Chairman? Yeah. Clerk will report the total. Three yeas, eight yeas. Amendment is not agreed to. Further amendments? Mr. Woodall? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I have uh, looked through the rule, and I do not see uh, my amendment uh, included. And I I had anticipated that it would be. The Rules Committee of Wisdom last year included it. It's a, a bipartisan amendment uh, with Mr. Lowenthal and Mr. Cisneros uh, that uh, helps the DOD in its uh, money-saving uh, efforts. Uh, it's amendment number 314, uh, and uh, it passed in the House last year uh, by a voice uh, vote. So I, my point to a manufacturer in my district deals with uh, which kinds of uh, Air conditioners are considered by DOD contracts. Uh, we produce, uh, as they do in the Lowenthal and Cisneros districts, air conditioners that are so efficient, DOE has a tough time evaluating uh, them under their uh, normal. Would the, would, the, would, the would, the, would the gentleman yield? I'd be happy to yield. Could, could you check page 73, I'm told, uh, of the rule? I think this amendment may be there. Is this page 73? I will do this. I actually, I don't even need to check page 73, Mr. Chairman. You have spoken from on high, and I believe it to be true. Okay. Uh, so I will stipulate that page 73 has the good news that I'm looking for. And uh, I, if, if you want to still have the vote, we can. <laughs> they, uh, I, candidly, I have not fared so well this uh, session, Mr. Chairman, and I'd rather not give my colleagues a chance to change okay. their mind. Okay. <laughs> but, yeah, I would, uh, however, uh, uh, unless it's also on page 73, uh, like to offer uh, a, a motion to make an order amendment number 415 by Ms. Spanberger of, of Virginia. Uh, you will uh, uh, may know that's the uh, authorization of use of military force uh, amendment uh, that mm -hmm. doesn't repeal the 2001 AUMF, but simply says we're not going to allow any president to expand uh, on that 2001 AUMF. We're going to require that Congress speak to any new military action that happens uh, around the around the globe. 
this is a uh, bipartisan uh, bill uh, that has uh, has been introduced uh, to uh, uh, a great reception on on both sides of the of the hill and you know in the in the 10 years that I've been in congress I've never had a chance to vote uh, on an AUMF I believe uh, had we had language such as this that prevented AUMF from being expanded from its 2001 purpose to the purpose that presidents want to use it for today, I would have had an opportunity uh, to vote on those and Congress would have had an opportunity to speak. So I would, I would ask my colleagues uh, to, to uh, uh, let the House have that uh, debate and that uh, vote on whether or not the 2001 AUMF uh, is being uh, used as we intended at the time or whether it has long outgrown uh, uh, the boundaries that uh, we set for it uh, 19 years ago. Okay. Well, th I uh, thank the gentleman. Um, is there any discussion uh, on the amendment? Um, I just will. I just will say that um, uh, next week, I think it'll be next week. We're going to be dealing with the defense appropriation, uh, and maybe a couple of weeks on next week, and maybe the week after, we'll be dealing with the defense appropriations bill, and there will be. A number of uh, votes on AUMFs um, in in that vehicle, but let me also say we started something in the rules committee, which unfortunately got interrupted uh, with this COVID nineteen pandemic, um, which we need to try to figure a way to get back to, and that was uh, a discussion on, you know, um, uh, congressional powers, uh, and um, and I, I and again uh, AUMF um, and war powers is is obviously. Uh, Part of that discussion, but uh, but there will be votes on AUMFs um, uh, coming up in the defense appropriations bills, and again we're trying to. Um, Miss uh, Congresswoman Barbara Lee has uh, has withdrawn her amendment uh, because uh, she thinks that we ought to be uh, um, um, uh, she she wants there to be a, a debate in the AUMF. But she wants to have it in the proper context. Um, I'm not sure whether if Barbara Lee's amendment were to be voted on and passed, whether or not that would be considered by some on your side as a um, as a poison pill in terms of whether or not they would support the final passage of the defense authorization bill. But anyway, we're going to have these votes. I appreciate the gentleman's uh, concern about the debate. Um, I wish that, that we had that concern when I was in the minority. But we will do, we will have votes on on the AUMF and uh, and so I would urge at this point a no to that a no vote Mr. on that. Chairman, may I say something? Yeah. Thank you very much. First of all, I want to thank you for your leadership on this issue for many years. As as you know, you and I don't agree on every issue, but we very much uh, have both worked for many years to try and uh, uh, put some find some workable way uh, to deal with this issue. And I applaud you for your leadership here. I'm, I know um, I certainly uh, uh, trust what you have to say about what is coming ahead of us. I hope this particular uh, format is one that we can look at when that time comes. And I say that simply because I think it's one that has great bipartisan support. And it may not be the perfect answer. I think that's what we have debates to determine. I support this uh, particular measure that Mr. Woodall is uh, uh, trying to make uh, uh, an amendment on here, and I uh, hope we have the opportunity to vote on it because I think it actually is something to bring us both together, both sides together uh, on, on a really important institutional uh, issue. But I, I'd be remiss not to acknowledge your efforts for many years uh, in this area and tell you I appreciate it very much. I uh, hope we have the opportunity to, to work together on, on this issue going forward. And thank you for putting this front and center before the Congress, whether you were in the minority or in the majority, uh, and uh, doing it also uh, when and how you can uh, from the post that you currently occupy. So you're to be commended for that, and uh, hopefully, uh, again, we can continue this important discussion going forward. Thank, and you I, about. thank you, and I appreciate the gentleman's comments, and I appreciate the spirit in which Mr. Woodall offers the amendment. And I mean, I we all care deeply about this, and. Um, and as I mentioned in the defense bill, I mean, there there is already a UMF language that will be in the defense appropriations bill. Um, and I'm not sure we've developed yet a consensus on, on how to proceed, um, you know, um, uh, which we're going to have to do. Uh, but uh, this discussion is going to happen. Um, and it's, you know, and, and I and I think we need to figure out, uh, 
you know, a, a process forward that um, is not just an amendment, but a, you know, a, where, where the committees of jurisdiction actually report something out uh, uh, and uh, that, w that people have confidence that, you know, it is the, the right way to proceed. So, again, I, I am, I'm going to reluctantly oppose the, uh, uh, the, uh, the Woodall Amendment at this time, but um, I certainly appreciate the spirit and what it's offered, and we will continue to work on this. So, uh, any of the discussion? If not, the vote is on the Woodall Amendment. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. No. Can no. you pin you the chair that knows how it? Uh, um, uh, 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 do you don't want to roll call, or are we okay with it? The uh, Mr. Chairman, I don't want to see you uh, vote against something that I know you wish uh, you could uh, support. <laughs> An opportunity in the appropriation uh, bill to get a chance to do this uh, again. I, 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 I appreciate that. Uh, the amendment not agreed to. Uh, the further amendments, and I think somebody needs to uh, mute somewhere on the way. The, Mr. Chairman, I do have uh, one more uh, uh, amendment to the rule. Gentlemen, uh, where's the amendment? I, I did the math, and we've been operating under uh, uh, martial law now for about 128 uh, days, that same day consideration authority. And I understand why the House uh, needed to uh, do that on March 11th as we entered this time where we didn't know uh, how uh, much and how easily we would be able to gather. Uh, due to your leadership, uh, we now have a system in place, uh, just like the one that's being used here tonight, where committees can gather regularly uh, with uh, absolutely no obstacles uh, and get their work uh, done. Um, I know no uh, chairman likes to operate uh, under uh, uh, same-day uh, uh, authority, don't, don't like to use same-day authority, and, and candidly, I don't expect uh, abuses of that authority as we we entered these uh, final weeks, but as a good housekeeping uh, measure, we are all going to be gathered uh, for the next uh, uh, two weeks uh, together. We do have opportunities uh, to uh, uh, come together and, and report legislation. So I would move that we uh, add a section to the rule that would terminate the waiver of Clause 6A of Rule 13 um, that, uh, as you know, does require that two-thirds vote to consider a report from the committee on the same day that it is presented to the House. I, yeah, I appreciate the gentleman's amendment, but I, I would I would recommend a no vote. I, I, I think we need to have flexibility. Um, you know, we're, in, we're still in the middle of a pandemic. I don't know, you know, we're, we're trying to get an agreement with the Senate on, you know, on, I mean, we passed the HEROES Act a, a couple of uh, months ago. Uh, we're now hearing the Senate may do something. Uh, and, um, you know, people all over the country are hurting. And so we, we need to be able to have the ability to act immediately. And again, um, you know, uh, you know, I, I hope that, you know, if the chairman's fear is that it'll be abused, I hope that it is not. Uh, but I, um, and I'll work with him on it. But I, uh, I would, uh, I would just, out of an abundance of caution, urge a no vote because I do think these are extraordinary times, and we just we have to be able to have some flexibility to act uh, on a moment's notice if, if that's the if that's the case. So um, I, I, pre I would urge a no vote, but uh, you know, to, um, any other discussion? Uh, if not, the vote is on the Woodall Amendment. All those in favor say aye. Aye. No, no, no. 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 Continue the chair, the, the no's have it. I'll roll call, please, Mr. Chairman. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Hastings. Mrs. Torres. No. Mrs. Torres, no. Mr. Perlmutter. No. Mr. Perlmutter, no. Mr. Raskin. Mr. Raskin. No, just put the thumb up, Jamie. Just put the thumb up. <laughs> we, we, you, we, I think he's struggling, Mr. Chairman. We got to extend the internet. Hey, Jamie. Did, did you hear no? Oh, no. You know, you know. Mr. Askin, no. Ms. Scanlon, no. Ms. Scanlon, no. Mr. Morelli, no. Mr. Morelli, no. Ms. Shalala, no. Ms. Shalala, no. Ms. Matsui, no. Ms. Matsui, no. Mr. Cole, aye. Mr. Cole, aye. Mr. Woodall, 
Aye. Mr. Woodall? Aye. Mr. Burgess? Mrs. Lesko? Aye. Mrs. Lesko? Aye. Mr. Chairman? No. Mr. Chairman? No. Let me report the total. Three yeas, eight nays. The amendment is not agreed to. Are there further amendments? Ms. Lesko. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have an amendment to the rule to make an order and provide the necessary waivers for amendment number 58 to HR 6395 offered by Congressman Stanton and Gosar. This amendment mirrors Mr. Gosar's bipartisan legislation, HR 757, of which I am a co-sponsor. This amendment would allow residents in Mojave County, Arizona and Clark County, Nevada, to file claims under the Radiation Exposure Compensation Act. The United States government conducted nearly 200 atmospheric weapons development tests as part of Cold War security from 1945 to 1962. These tests exposed thousands of Americans to cancer-causing ionized radiation from nuclear fallout. When Congress passed the Radiation Exposure Compensation Act, there were major boundary flaws that prevented a large portion of Lower Mojave County from receiving justice. In 2003, according to the National Institutes of Health and National Cancer Institute, residents in Lower Mojave County had on average double the radiation exposure to the thyroid than other counties in Arizona that are covered under the act. This just isn't right. These residents deserve justice. Rural communities often don't have a voice in Washington, DC, and that's why we need a bipartisan push to ensure these residents who have serious health concerns receive the health care compensation owed to them by the United States government. For too long, residents in Lower Mojave County have been left behind, and it's time to change that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I urge you to make this amendment uh, in order, uh, number 58. And with that, I yield back. I thank the general lady for her amendment, and I'm certainly sympathetic. Um, I mean, I think the problem with this amendment, if I'm, I, I don't have my notes in front of me here, but I think. It was, it was subject to a pay go, pay go point of order. Um, and um, as tradition here, we don't waive points of order against individual amendments. However, I mean, I, we, I think all of us here would, you know, want to work with you and others who care about this issue to see whether how we can move something forward. Mm -hmm. um, so um, uh, again, I appreciate the, the sentiment here and, um, and uh, but uh, I, I don't think we can do it on this, but we should figure out a way forward. So, um, Mr. Chair, you know, who, yes, this said, um, yeah, I'd like to Ms. Lesko uh, work with you in the future on this. So uh, we, we had very similar circumstances around Rocky flats, both with the workers and with people uh, around the plant. And so I'm very sympathetic to this and I would uh, offer to work with you and Mr. Stanton and Mr. Gozar on this, uh, um, on a going forward basis. Uh, any, other, any other discussion? If not, you've heard the Lesko Amendment. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. 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 Be the chair, the no's have it. Do not need a roll call vote. Thank you. Any other amendments? Hearing none, uh, vote, the, now the question is on the motion of the gentleman from Pennsylvania. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. No. The opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm, I've seen so much struggle on the Democratic side tonight on these amendments. I mean, you were nearly with us a couple of times. I think Mr. Raskin's really with us a couple of times. So, and I'm going to ask for a roll call vote. I, I think you're mistaking my confusion for. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so the vote now is uh, is on the uh, motion, gentlewoman from Pennsylvania. Uh, clerk will call the roll. Mr. Hastings, Mrs. Torres, aye. 
Mrs. Torres, aye. Mr. Krollmutter, aye. Krollmutter, aye. Mr. Raskin, aye. Mr. Raskin, aye. Ms. Scanlon, aye. Ms. Scanlon, aye. Mr. Morelli, aye. Mr. Morelli, aye. Ms. Shalala, aye. Ms. Shalala, aye. Ms. Matsui, aye. Ms. Matsui, aye. Mr. Cole, no. Mr. Cole, no. Mr. Woodall, no. Mr. Woodall, no. Mr. Burgess, Mrs. Lesko, no. Mrs. Lesko, no. Mr. Chairman, aye. Mr. Chairman, aye. And clerk report the total. Eight yeas, three nays. And the motion is agreed to, and Mr. Perlmutter will carry it for the uh, Democrats. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Woodall will manage for the Republicans. And um, let me uh, let me again uh, apologize for the delay here today, um, but thank you all for your patience. I want to especially thank the rules staff for uh, the incredible work that they have done. Uh, and um, so uh, having said all of that, I wish you all a good weekend. And without objection, the committee is adjourned. See you later.